The American Constitution and the Slave, a speech by Frederick Douglass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. The American Constitution and the Slave. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I have witnessed with great pleasure the growing interest in the great question of slavery in this city, and in Scotland generally. Meetings with reference to that question have become more abundant of late than perhaps at any time since the abolition of slavery in the British West Indies. I read with deep interest the speeches made recently, at a meeting called to sympathize with and to assist that faithful champion of the cause of my enslaved fellow countrymen, Dr. Cheever. I have also read of another meeting in your city, having reference to the improvement and elevation of the people of Africa, having reference to the cultivation of cotton, and the opening up of commerce between this and that land. All these movements are in the right direction. I accept them and hail them as signs of the good time coming, when Ethiopia shall stretch out her hands to God, in deed and in truth. There have been, also, other meetings in your city since it was my privilege to last address you. I have read with much care a speech recently delivered in the City Hall. It is published in one of your most respectable journals. The minuteness and general shading of that report convince me that the orator was his own reporter. At any rate, there is but little evidence or few marks of its having been tampered with by any than one exceedingly friendly to the sentiments it contains. On some accounts I read that speech with regret, on others with much satisfaction. I was certainly pleased with the evidence it afforded that the orator has largely recovered his long-lost health, and much of his wonted eloquence and fire, but my chief ground of satisfaction is that its delivery, perhaps I should say its publication, for I would not have noticed the speech had it not been published, in just such a journal as that in which it was published furnishes occasion for bringing before the friends of my enslaved people one phase of the great struggle going on between liberty and slavery in the united states which i deem important and which i think before i get through my audience will agree with me is a very important phase of that struggle the north british mail honored me with a few pointed remarks in dissent from certain views held by me on another occasion in this city but as it rendered my speech on that occasion very fairly to the public, I did not feel at all called upon to reply to its strictures. The case is different now. I am brought face to face with two powers. I stand before you under the fire of both platform and press. Not to speak, under the circumstances, would subject me and would subject my cause to misconstruction. You might be led to suppose that I had no reasons for the ground that I occupied here when I spoke in another place before you. Let me invite your attention, I may say your indulgent attention, to this very interesting phase of the question of slavery in the United States. My assailant, as he had a perfect right to do, that is, if he felt that that was the best possible service he could do to the cause of American slavery, under advertisement to deliver an anti-slavery lecture, a lecture on the present aspect of the anti-slavery movement in America, treated the citizens of Glasgow to an anti-Douglas lecture. He seemed to feel that to discredit me was an important work, and therefore he came up to that work with all his wonted power and eloquence, proving himself to be just as powerful and skillful a debater, in all its arts, high and low, as long practice, as constant experience could well fit a man to be. I award the eloquent lecturer, as I am sure you do, all praise for his skill and ability, and fully acknowledge his many valuable services, in other days, to the anti-slavery cause both in England and America. We all remember how nobly he confronted the Borthwicks and the Breckenridges in other days, and vanquished them. These victories are safe, they are not to be forgotten. They belong to his past, and will render his name dear and glorious to after-coming generations. He then enjoyed the confidence of many of the most illustrious philanthropists that Scotland had ever raised up. He had at his back, at those times, the Wardlaws, the Kings, the Hughes, and the Robsons, 
men who were known the world over for their philanthropy, for their Christian benevolence. He was strong in those days, for he stood before the people of Scotland as the advocate of a great and glorious cause. He stood up for the dumb, for the downtrodden, for the outcasts of the earth, and not for a mere party, not for the mere sect whose mischievous and outrageous opinions he now consents to advocate in your hearing. When in Glasgow, a few weeks ago, I embraced the occasion to make a broad statement concerning the various plans proposed for the abolition of slavery in the United States, but I very frankly stated with what I agreed and from what I differed. But I did so, I trust, in a spirit of fair dealing, of candor, and not in a miserable, man-worshipping, and mutual admiration spirit, which can do justice only to the party with which it may happen to go for the moment. One word further. No difference of opinion, no temporary alienations, no personal assault shall ever lead me to forget that some who, in America, have often made me the subject of personal abuse, are, at the same time, in their own way, earnestly working for the abolition of slavery. They are men who thoroughly understand the principle that they who are not for us are against us, but who unfortunately have failed to learn that they who are not against us are on our part. In regard to the speaker to whom I am referring, and who, by the way, is, perhaps, the least vindictive of his party, I shall say that I cannot praise his speech, for it is needlessly, or was needlessly personal, calling me by name over, I think, fifty times, and dealing out blows upon me as if I had been savagely attacking him. In character and manliness that speech was not only deficient, I think, but most shamefully one-sided. And while it was remarkably plausible, and well calculated to catch the popular ear, which could not well discriminate between what was fact and what was fiction in regard to the subject then discussed, I do not hesitate to pronounce that speech false in statement, false in its assumptions, false in its inferences, false in its quotations even, and in its arguments, and false in all its leading conclusions. On very many accounts, he who stands before a British audience to denounce anything peculiarly American in connection with slavery has a very marked and decided advantage. It is not hard to believe the very worst of any country where a system like slavery has existed for centuries. This feeling towards America, and towards anything American, is very natural and very useful. I refer to it now not to condemn it, but to remind you that it is just possible that this feeling may be carried too great a length. It may be that this feeling may be too active, and lead the people of Great Britain to accept as true some things concerning America, which are utterly false, and to reject as false some other things which are entirely true. My assailant largely took advantage of this noble British feeling in denouncing the Constitution and Union of America. He knew how deep and intense was your hatred of slavery. He knew the strength of that feeling, and the noble uses to which it might have been directed. I know it also but I would despise myself if I could be guilty of taking advantage of such a sentiment and making it the means of propagating error, falsehood, and prejudice against any institution or against any class of men in the United States. I am willing that these words shall be regarded as marked words. I have often felt how easy it would be, if one were so disposed, to make false representations of things as they are in America, to disparage whatever of good might exist there, or shall exist there, and to exaggerate whatever is bad in that country. I intend to show that this very thing was done by the speaker to whom I have referred, that his speech was calculated to convey impressions and ideas totally, grossly, outrageously at variance with truth concerning the Constitution and Union of the American States. You will think this very strong language. I think so too and it becomes me to look well to myself in using such language, for if I fail to make out my case, I am sure there are parties, not a few who will see that fair play is done on the other side. But I have no fear at all of inability to justify what I have said, and if any friend of mine was led to doubt, from the confident manner in which I was assailed, I beg that such doubt may now be put aside until, at least, I have been heard." I will make good, I promise you, my entire characterization of that speech. 
reading speeches is not my forte, and you will bear with me until I get my harness on. I have fully examined my ground, and while I own myself nothing in comparison with my assailant in point of ability, I have no manner of doubt as to the rectitude of the position I occupy on the question. Now, what is that question? Much will be gained at the outset, if you fully and clearly understand the real question under discussion, the question and difference between us. Indeed, nothing can be understood till this is understood. Things are often confounded and treated as the same, for no better reason than that they seem alike or look alike, and this is done even when in their nature and character they are totally distinct, totally separate, and even opposed to each other. This jumbling up of things is a sort of dust-throwing which is often indulged in by small men who argue for victory rather than for truth. Thus, for instance, the American government and the American constitution are often spoke of in the speech to which I refer as being synonymous, as one and the same thing, whereas, in point of fact, they are entirely distinct from each other and totally different. In regard to the question of slavery, certainly they are different from each other. They are as distinct from each other as the compass is from the ship, as distinct from each other as the chart is from the course which a vessel may be sometimes steering. They are not one and the same thing. If the American government has been mean, sordid, mischievous, devilish, it is no proof whatever that the constitution of government has been the same. And yet, in the speech to which some of you listened, these sins of the government or administration of the government were charged directly upon the constitution and union of the states what then is the question i will state what it is not it is not whether slavery existed in the united states at the time of the adoption of the constitution it is not whether slaveholders took part in framing the constitution of the united states it is not whether these slaveholders in their hearts intended to secure certain advantages for slavery in the constitution of the united states it is not whether the american government has been wielded during seventy-two years on behalf of slavery it is not whether a pro-slavery interpretation has been put upon the constitution in american courts all these points may be true or they may be false they may be accepted or they may be rejected without at all affecting the question at issue between myself and the city hall the real question between the parties differing at this point in america may be fairly stated thus does the united states constitution guarantee to any class or description of people in that country the right to enslave or hold as property any other class or description of people in that country the second question is is the dissolution of the union between the slave states and the free states required by fidelity to the slaves or to the just demands of conscience? Or, in other words, is the refusal to exercise the elective franchise or to hold office in America the surest, wisest, and best mode of acting for the abolition of slavery in that country? To these questions, the Garrisonians in America answer yes. They hold that the Constitution is a slaveholding instrument, and will not cast a vote or hold office under it, and denounce all who do vote or hold office under it as pro-slavery men, though they may be in their hearts and in their actions, as far from being slaveholders as are the poles of the moral universe apart. I, on the other hand, deny that the Constitution guarantees the right to hold property in men, and believe that the way, the true way, to abolish slavery in America is to vote such men into power as will exert their moral and political influence for the abolition of slavery. This is the issue plainly stated, and you will judge between us. Before we examine into the disposition, tendency, and character of the Constitution of the United States, I think we had better ascertain what the Constitution itself is. Before looking at what it means, let us see what it is. For here, too, there has been endless dust-throwing on the part of those opposed to office. What is the Constitution? It is no vague, indefinite, floating, unsubstantial something, called according to any man's fancy, now a weasel and now a whale. But it is something substantial. It is a plainly written document, not in Hebrew nor in Greek, but in English, beginning with a preamble, 
fitted out with articles sections provisions and clauses defining the rights powers and duties to be secured claimed and exercised under its authority it is not even like the british constitution it is not made up of enactments of parliament decisions of courts and the established usages of the government the american constitution is a written instrument full and complete in itself no court no congress no legislature no combination in the country can add one word to it or take one word from it it is a thing in itself complete in itself has a character of its own and it is important that this should be kept in mind as i go on with the discussion it is a great national enactment done by the people and can only be altered amended or changed in any way shape or form by the people who enacted it i am careful to make this statement here in america it would not be necessary it would not be necessary here if my assailant had shown that he had as sincere and earnest a desire to set before you the simple truth as he has shown to vindicate his particular sect in america again it should be borne in mind that the mere text of that constitution the text and only the text and not any commentaries or creeds written upon the text is the constitution of the united states it should also be borne in mind that the intentions of those who frame the constitution be they good or bad be they for slavery or against slavery are to be respected so far and so far only as they have succeeded in getting these intentions expressed in the written instrument itself this is also important it will be the wildest of absurdities and would lead to the most endless confusions and mischiefs if instead of looking to the written instrument itself for its meaning it were attempted to make us go in search of what could be the secret motives and dishonest intentions of some of the men who might have taken part in writing or adopting it it was what they said that was adopted by the people not what they were ashamed or afraid to say or really omitted to say it was not what they tried nor what they concealed it was what they wrote down not what they kept back that the people adopted it was only what was declared upon its face that was adopted not their secret understandings if there were any such understandings bear in mind also and the fact is an important one that the framers of the constitution the men who wrote the constitution sat with closed doors in the city of philadelphia while they wrote it they sat with closed doors and this was done purposely that nothing but the result the pure result of their labor should be seen and that that result might stand alone and be judged of on its own merits and adopted on its own merits without any influence being exerted upon them by the debates it should be also borne in mind and the fact is still more important that the debates in the convention that framed the constitution of the united states and by means of which a pro-slavery interpretation is now attempted to be forced upon that instrument were not published until nearly thirty years after the constitution of the united states so that the men who adopted the constitution could not be supposed to understand the secret underhand intentions that might have controlled the actions of the convention in making it these debates were purposely kept out of view in order that the people might not adopt the secret motives the unexpressed intentions of anybody but simply the text of the paper itself these debates form no part of the original agreement and therefore are entitled to no respect or consideration in discussing what is the character of the constitution of the united states i repeat the paper itself and only the paper itself with its own plainly written purposes is the constitution of the united states and it must stand or fall flourish or fade on its own individual and self-declared purpose and object again where would be the advantage of a written constitution i pray you if after we have it written instead of looking to its plain common-sense reading we should go in search of its meaning to the secret intentions of the individuals who may have had something to do with writing the paper what will the people of america a hundred years hence care about the intentions of the men who framed the constitution of the united states these men were for a day for a generation but the constitution is for ages and a hundred years hence the very names of the men who took part in framing that instrument will perhaps be blotted out or forgotten 
whatever we may owe to the framers of the constitution we certainly owe this to ourselves and to mankind and to god that we maintain the truth of our own language and do not allow any villainy not even the villainy of slaveholding which as john wesley says is the sum of all villainies to clothe itself in the garb of virtuous language and to get itself passed off as a virtuous thing in consequence of that language we owe it to ourselves to compel the devil to wear his own garments particularly in law we owe it to ourselves to compel wicked legislators when they undertake a malignant purpose in innocent and benevolent language we owe it to ourselves that we circumvent their wicked designs to this extent that if they want to put it to a bad purpose we will put it to a good purpose common sense common justice and sound rules of interpretation all drive us to the words of the law for the meaning of the law the practice of the american government is dwelt upon with much fervor as conclusive as to the slaveholding character of the american constitution this is really the strong point and the only strong point made in the speech in the city hall but good as this argument is it is not conclusive a wise man has said that few people are found better than their laws but many have been found worse and the american people are no exception to this rule i think it will be found that they are much worse than their laws particularly their constitutional laws it is just possible the people's practice may be diametrically opposed to their own declared their own acknowledged laws and their own acknowledged principles our blessed saviour when upon earth found the traditions of men taking the place of the law and the prophets the jews asked him why his disciples ate with unwashed hands and he brought them to their senses by telling them that they had made void the law by their traditions moses on account of the hardness of the hearts of men allowed the jews to put away their wives but it was not so at the beginning the american people likewise have made void their law by their traditions they have trampled upon their own constitution stepped beyond the limits set for themselves and in their ever-abounding iniquity established a constitution of action outside of the fundamental law of the land while the one is good the other is evil while the one is for liberty the other is in favor of slavery the practice of the american government is one thing and the character of the constitution of the government is quite another and different thing after all mr chairman the fact that my opponent thought it necessary to go outside of the constitution to prove it pro-slavery whether that going out is to the practice of the government or to the secret intentions of the writers of the paper itself the fact that men do go out is very significant it is an admission that the thing they look for is not to be found where only it ought to be found if found at all and that is in the written constitution itself if it is not there it is nothing to the purpose if it is found anywhere else but i shall have more to say on this point hereafter the very eloquent lecturer at the city hall doubtless felt some embarrassment from the fact that he had literally to give the constitution a pro-slavery interpretation because on its very face it conveys an entirely opposite meaning he thus sums up what he calls the slaveholding provisions of the constitution and i quote his words article one section nine provides for the continuance of the african slave trade for twenty years after the adoption of the constitution article four section two provides for the recovery from other states of fugitive slaves article one section two gives the slave states a representation of three-fifths of all the slave population and article one section eight requires the president to use the military naval ordnance and militia resources of the entire country for the suppression of slave insurrections in the same manner as he would employ them to repel invasion now mr president and ladies and gentlemen any man reading this statement or hearing it made with such a show of exactness would unquestionably suppose that the speaker or writer had given the plain written text of the constitution itself i can hardly believe that that gentleman intended to make any such impression on his audience and yet what are we to make of it this circumstantial statement of the provisions of the constitution how can we regard it how can he be screened from the charge of having perpetrated a deliberate 
and point-blank misrepresentation. That individual has seen fit to place himself before the public as my opponent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if he had placed himself before the country as an enemy, I could not have desired him, even an enemy, to have placed himself in a position so false, and to have committed himself to statements so grossly at variance with the truth, as those statements I have just read from him. Why did he not read the Constitution to you? Why did he read that which was not the Constitution? For I contend he did read that which was not the Constitution. He pretended to be giving you chapter and verse, section and clause, paragraph and provision, and yet he did not give you a single clause or single paragraph of that Constitution. You can hardly believe it, but I will make good what I say, that though reading to you article upon article, as you supposed while listening to him, he did not read a word from the Constitution of the United States, not a word. You had better not applaud until you hear the other side, and what are the real words of the Constitution? Why did he not give you the plain words of the Constitution? He can read. He had the Constitution before him. He had their chapter and verse. The places where those things he alleged to be found in the Constitution were to be found. Why did he not read them? Oh, sir, I fear that that gentleman knows too well why he did not. I happen to know that there are no such words in the American Constitution as African slave trade, no such words as slave representation, no such words as fugitive slaves, no such words as slave insurrections anywhere to be found in that Constitution. You can hardly think a man would stand up before an audience of people in Glasgow and make a statement so circumstantial, with every mark of peculiarity, to point out to be in the Constitution what is not there. You shall see a slight difference in my manner of treating that subject, and that which my opponent has thought fit, for reasons satisfactory to himself, to pursue. What he withheld, that I will spread before you. What he suppressed, I will bring to light. And what he passed over in silence, I will proclaim. Here, then, are the several provisions of the Constitution to which reference has been made. I will read them word for word, just as they stand in the paper, in the Constitution itself. Article 1, Section 2, declares that representations and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states, which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. Article 1, Section 9. The migration or importation of any such persons, as any of the states now existing may think fit to admit, shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding ten dollars for each person. Article 4. No person held to service or labor in one state, under the laws thereof escaping to another shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim to the party, to whom such service or labor may be due. Article 1. Section 8. To provide for calling out the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Here, then, are the provisions of the Constitution, which the most extravagant defenders of slavery have ever claimed, to guarantee the right of property in man. These are the provisions which have been pressed into the service of the human fleshmongers of America. Let us look at them just as they stand, one by one. You will notice there is not a word said there about slave trade, not a word said there about slave insurrections, not a word there about three-fifths representations of slaves, not a word there which any man outside of America, and who had not been accustomed to claim these particular provisions of the Constitution, would ever suspect had the remotest reference to slavery. I deny utterly that these provisions of the Constitution guarantee, or were intended to guarantee, in any shape or form, the right of property in man in the United States. But let us grant, for the sake of argument, that the first of these provisions, referring to the basis of representation and taxation, does refer to slaves. We are not compelled to make this admission, for it might fairly apply, and indeed was intended to apply, 
to aliens and others living in the United States, but who were not naturalized. But giving the provision the very worst construction, that it applies to slaves, what does it amount to? I answer, and see you bear it in mind, for it shows the disposition of the Constitution to slavery. I take the very worst aspect, and admit all that is claimed or that can be admitted consistently with truth. And I answer that this very provision, supposing it refers to slaves, is in itself a downright disability imposed upon the slave system of America, one which deprives the slaveholding states of at least two-fifths of their natural basis of representation. A black man in a free state is worth just two-fifths more than a black man in a slave state as a basis of political power under the Constitution. Therefore, instead of encouraging slavery, the Constitution encourages freedom by holding out to every slaveholding state the inducement of an increase of two-fifths of political power by becoming a free state. So much for the three-fifths clause. Taking it at its worst, it still leans to freedom, not to slavery. For be it remembered that the Constitution nowhere forbids a black man to vote. No white, no black, no slaves, no slaveholder. Nowhere in the instrument are any of these words to be found. I come to the next, that which it is said guarantees the continuance of the African slave trade for twenty years. I will also take that for just what my opponent alleges it to have been, although the Constitution does not warrant any such conclusion. But, to be liberal, let us suppose it did, and what follows? Why this, that this part of the Constitution of the United States, expired by its own limitation no fewer than fifty-two years ago? My opponent is just fifty-two years too late, in seeking the dissolution of the Union on account of this clause, for it expired as far back as 1808. He might as well attempt to break down the British Parliament and break down the British Constitution, because, three hundred years ago, Queen Elizabeth granted to Sir John Hawkins the right to import Africans into the colonies of the West Indies. This ended some three hundred years ago, ours ended only fifty-two years ago, and I ask, is the Constitution of the United States to be condemned to everlasting infamy because of what was done fifty-two years ago? But there is still more to be said about this provision of the Constitution. At the time the Constitution was adopted, the slave trade was regarded as the jugular vein of slavery itself, and it was thought that slavery would die with the death of the slave trade. No less philanthropic, no less clear-sighted men than your own Wilberforce and Clarkson, suppose that the abolition of the slave trade would be the abolition of slavery. Their theory was, cut off the stream, and of course the pond or lake would dry up. Cut off the stream flowing out of Africa, and the slave trade in America and the colonies would perish. The fathers who framed the American Constitution supposed that in making provision for the abolition of the slave trade, they were making provision for the abolition of slavery itself and they incorporated this clause in the Constitution, not to perpetuate the traffic in human flesh, but to bring that unnatural traffic to an end. Outside of the Union, the slave trade could be carried on to an indefinite period, but the men who framed the Constitution, and who proposed its adoption, said to the slave states, If you purchase the privileges of this Union, you must consent that the humanity of this nation shall lay its hand upon this traffic, at least in twenty years after the adoption of the Constitution. So much for the African slave trade clause. Mark you, it does not say one word about the African slave trade. Secondly, if it does, it expired by its own limitation more than fifty years ago. Thirdly, the Constitution is anti-slavery, because it looked to the abolition of slavery rather than to its perpetuity. Fourthly, it showed that the intentions of the framers of the Constitution were good, not bad. If, and Mr. Douglas here looked in the direction of Mr. Robert Smith, President of the Scottish Temperance League, if you can't get a man to take the pledge that he will stop drinking liquor today, it is something if you will get him to promise to take it tomorrow. And if the men who made the American Constitution did not bring the African slave trade to an end instantly, it was something to succeed in bringing it to an end in twenty years. I now go to the slave insurrection clause, though, in truth, 
there is no such clause in the constitution but suppose that this clause in the constitution refers to the abolition or rather the suppression of slave insurrections suppose we admit that congress has a right to call out the army and navy to quell insurrections and to repel any efforts on the part of the slaves to gain their freedom to put down violence of any sort and slave violence in particular what follows i hold that the right to suppress an insurrection carries with it also the right to determine by what means the insurrection shall be suppressed and under an anti-slavery administration were your humble servant in the presidential chair of the united states which in all likelihood will never be the case and were an insurrection to break out in the southern states among the slave inhabitants what would i do in the circumstances i would suppress the insurrection and i would choose my own way of suppressing it i should have the right under the constitution to my own manner of doing it if i could make out as i believe i could that slavery is itself an insurrection that it is an insurrection by one party in the country against the just rights of another part of the people in the country a constant invitation to insurrection a constant source of danger as the executive officer of the united states it would be my duty not only to put down the insurrection but to put down the cause of the insurrection i would have no hesitation at all in supporting the constitution of the united states in consequence of its provisions the constitution should be obeyed should be rightly obeyed we should say to the slaves and we should say to their masters we see that a forced system of labor endangers the peace that we are sworn to protect and we now put it away and leave you to pay honest wages for honest work in a word with regard to putting down insurrection i would just write a proclamation and the proclamation would be based upon the old prophetic model of proclaiming liberty throughout all the land to the inhabitants thereof but there is one other provision called the fugitive slave provision it is called so by those who wish it to subserve the interests of slavery let us go back says the city hall to 1787 and enter liberty hall philadelphia where sat in convention the illustrious men very illustrious if they were the scamps and scoundrels he would make them out to be who framed the constitution with george washington in the chair on the twenty seventh of september mr butler and mr pinckney two delegates from the state of south carolina moved that the constitution should require fugitive slaves and servants to be delivered up like criminals and after a discussion on the subject the clause as it stands in the constitution was adopted after this the conventions held in the several states to ratify the constitution the same meaning was attached to the words for example mr madison afterwards president in recommending the constitution to his constituents told them that this clause would secure them their property in slaves i must ask you to look well to the statement upon its face it would seem to be a full and fair disclosure of the real transaction it professes to describe and yet i declare unto you knowing as i do the facts in the case that i am utterly amazed utterly amazed at the downright untruth which that very simple plain statement really conveys to you about the transaction i dislike to use this very strong language but you shall see that the case is quite as strong as the language employed under these fair seeming words now quoted i say there is downright untruth conveyed the man who could make such a statement may have all the craftiness of a lawyer but i think he will get very little credit for the candor of a christian what could more completely destroy all confidence than the making of such a statement as that the case which he describes is entirely different from the real case as transacted at the time mr butler and mr pinckney did indeed bring forward a proposition after the convention had framed the constitution a proposition for the return of fugitive slaves to their masters precisely as criminals are returned and what happened mr thompson oh i beg you pardon for calling his name tells you that after a debate it was withdrawn and the proposition as it stands in the constitution was adopted he does not tell you what was the nature of the debate not one word of it no it would not have suited his purpose to have done that it would have been against his side of the question to have done that 
I will tell you what was the purport of that debate. After debate and discussion the provision as it stands was adopted. The purport of the provisions as brought forward by Mr. Butler and Mr. Pinckney was this. No person called to servitude in any state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service and labor, but shall be delivered up on claim, and pass to whom such service or labor may be due. Very well, what happened? The proposition was met by a storm of opposition in the convention. Members rose up in all directions, saying that they had no more business to catch slaves for their masters than they had to catch horses for their owners, that they would not undertake any such thing, and the convention instructed a committee to alter that provision and the word servitude, so that it might apply not to slaves, but to freemen, to persons bound to serve and labor, and not to slaves. And thus far it seems that Mr. Madison, who was quoted so triumphantly, tells us in these very Madison papers that the word was struck out from the Constitution because it applied to slaves and not to freemen, and that the convention refused to have that word in the Constitution simply because they did not wish and would not have the idea that there could be property in men in that instrument. These are Madison's own words, so he can be quoted on both sides. But it may be asked, if the clause does not apply to slaves, to whom does it apply? It says, No person serving and laboring escaping to another state shall be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up to whom such service or labor may be due. To whom does it apply if not to slaves? I answer, that it applied at the time of its adoption to a very numerous class of persons in America, and I have the authority of no less a person than Daniel Webster, that it was intended to apply to a class of men, a class of persons known in America as redemptioners. There was quite a number of them at that day, who had been taken to America, precisely as coolies had been taken to the West Indies. They entered into a contract to serve and labor so long for so much money, and the children born to them in that condition were also held as bound to service and labor. It also applies to indentured apprentices and to persons taking upon themselves an obligation to serve and labor. The Constitution says that the party shall be delivered up to whom such service and labor may be due. Why, sir, do? In the first place, this very clause of that provision makes it utterly impossible that it can apply to slaves. There is nothing due from the slave to his master in the way of service or labor. He is unable to show a contract. The thing implies an arrangement, an understanding, by which, for an equivalent, I will do for you so much if you will do for me, or have done for me so much. The Constitution says he will be delivered up to whom any service or labor shall be due. Due! A slave owes nothing to any master, he can owe nothing to any master. In the eye of the law he is a chattel personal, to all intents, purposes, and constructions whatever. Talk of a horse owing something to his master, or a sheep, or a wheelbarrow, perfectly ridiculous. The idea that a slave can owe anything. I tell you what I would do if I were a judge. I could do it perfectly consistently with the character of the Constitution. I have a proneness to liken myself to great people, to persons high in authority. But if I were a judge, and a slave was brought before me under this provision to the Constitution, and the master should insist upon sending him back to slavery, I would inquire how the slave was bound to serve and labor for him. I would point him to this same Constitution, and tell him that I read in that Constitution the great words of your own Magna Carta, No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the process of law. And I ought to know by what contract, how this man contracted an obligation, or took upon himself to serve and labor for you. And if he could not show that, I should dismiss the case and restore the man to his liberty. And I would do quite right, according to the Constitution. I admit nothing in favor of slavery when liberty is at stake. When I am called upon to argue on behalf of liberty, I will range throughout the world. I am at perfect liberty by forms of law and by rules of hermeneutics 
to range through the whole universe of God in proof of an innocent purpose, in proof of a good thing. But if you want to prove a bad thing, if you want to accomplish a bad and violent purpose, you must show it is so named in the bond. This is a sound legal rule. Shakespeare noticed it as an existing rule of law in his Merchant of Venice. A pound of flesh, but not one drop of blood. The law was made for the protection of labor, not for the destruction of liberty, and it is to be presumed on the side of the oppressed. The speaker at the city hall laid down some rules of legal interpretation. These rules send us to the history of the law for its meaning. I have no objection to this course in ordinary cases of doubt, but where human liberty and justice are at stake, the case falls under an entirely different class of rules. There must be something more than history, something more than tradition, to lead me to believe that law is intended to uphold and maintain wrong. The Supreme Court of the United States lays down this rule, and it meets the case exactly. Where rights are infringed, where the fundamental principles of the law are overthrown, where the general system of the law is departed from, the legislative intention must be expressed with irresistible clearness. The same court says that the language of the law must be construed strictly in favor of justice and liberty. And another rule says, where the law is ambiguous and susceptible of two meanings, the one making it accomplish an innocent purpose, and the other making it accomplish a wicked purpose, we must in every case adopt that meaning which makes it accomplish an innocent purpose. These are just the rules we like to have applied to us as individuals to begin with. We like to be assumed to be honest and upright in our purpose until we are proved to be otherwise, and the law is to be taken precisely in the same way. We are to assume it is fair, right, just, and true, till proved with irresistible power to be on the side of wrong. Now, sir, a case like this occurred in Rhode Island some time ago, the people there made a law that no negro should be allowed to walk out after nine o'clock at night without a lantern. They were afraid the negro might be mistaken for somebody. The negroes got lanterns and walked out after nine at night, but they forgot to put candles in them. They were arrested and brought before a court of law. They had been found after nine at night. It had been proved against them that they were out with lanterns to be sure, but without a candle. It may please your honor, it was argued for the prosecution, of what value is a lantern without a candle? The plain intention of the law was that these people should not be out without a lantern and a candle. But the judge said this was a law against the natural rights of man, against natural liberty, and that this law should be construed strictly. These men had complied with the plain reading of the law, and they must be dismissed. The judge in that case did perfectly right. The legislature had to pass another law that no negro should go out after nine without a lantern and a candle in it. The negroes got candles, but forgot to light them. They were arrested again, again tried, and with a similar result. There was then another law passed that the negroes should not walk out after nine at night without lanterns, with candles in them, and the candles lighted. And if I had been a negro at that time in Rhode Island, I would have got a dark lantern and walked out. Laws to sustain a wrong of any kind must be expressed with irresistible clearness. For law, be it remembered, is not an arbitrary rule or arbitrary mandate, and it has purpose of its own. Blackstone defines it as a rule of the supreme power of the state, but he does not stop there. He adds, commanding that which is right and forbidding that which is wrong. That is law. It would not be a law if it commanded that which was wrong, and forbade that which was right in itself. It is necessary it should be on behalf of right. There is another law of legal interpretation, which is, that the law is to be understood in the light of the object sought for by the law, or sought in the law, that is, that the details of the law shall conform to the purpose declared, to be sought to be attained by it. What are the objects sought for in the Constitution of the American States? We, the people of these United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, 
provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The objects here set forth are six in number. Union is one, not slavery. Union is named as one of the objects for which the Constitution was framed, and it is one that is very excellent. It is quite incompatible with slavery. Defense is another. Welfare is another. Tranquility is another. Justice and liberty are the others. Slavery is not among them. The objects are union, defense, welfare, tranquility, justice, and liberty. Now, if the two last, to say nothing of the defense, if the two last purposes declared were reduced to practice, slavery would go reeling to its grave as if smitten with a bolt from heaven. But let the American people be true to their own constitution, true to the purposes set forth in that constitution, and we will have no need of a dissolution of the Union. We will have a dissolution of slavery all over that country. But it has been said that Negroes are not included in the benefits sought under this declaration of purposes. Whatever slaveholders may say, I think it comes with ill grace from abolitionists to say the Negroes in America are not included in this declaration of purposes. The Negroes are not included. Who says this? The Constitution does not say they are not included, and how dare any other person, speaking for the Constitution, say so? The Constitution says, we the people. The language is, we the people, not we the white people not we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, not we of English extraction, not we of French or of Scotch extraction, but we the people, not we the horses, sheep, and swine, and wheelbarrows, but we the human inhabitants. And unless you deny that Negroes are people, they are included within the purposes of this government. They were there, and if the people are included, Negroes are included. They have a right, in the name of the Constitution of the United States, to demand their liberty. This, I undertake to say, is the conclusion of the whole matter. That the constitutionality of slavery can be made out only by discrediting the plain, common-sense reading of the Constitution itself, by discrediting and casting away as worthless the most beneficent rules of legal interpretation by ruling the negro outside of these beneficent rules, by claiming everything for slavery, by denying everything for freedom, by assuming that the Constitution does not mean what it says, and that it says what it does not mean, by disregarding the written Constitution and interpreting it in the light of a secret understanding. It is by this mean, contemptible, underhand way of working out the pro-slavery character of the Constitution that the thing is accomplished and in no other way. The first utterance of the instrument itself is gloriously on the side of liberty, and diametrically opposed to the thing called slavery in the United States. The Constitution declares that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It secures to every man the right of trial by jury. It also declares that the writ of habeas corpus shall never be suppressed, that great and noble writ, that writ by which England was made free soil, that writ which set Somerset free in 1772, that writ which made that land in which I stand tonight, and where you stand, the land of liberty and the home of the oppressed of all nations, the land of which Coran said when he spoke of it, that he spoke, in the spirit of the British law, which makes liberty commensurate with, and inseparable from, British soil, which proclaims even to the stranger and sojourner, the moment he sets his foot upon British earth, that the ground on which he treads is holy, and consecrated by the genius of universal emancipation. It was in consequence of this writ, a writ which forms a part of the Constitution of the United States, that England herself is free from manhunters today. For in 1772 slaves were hunted here in England, just as they are in America. And the British Constitution was supposed to favor the arrest, the imprisonment, and recapture of fugitive slaves. But Lord Mansfield, in the case of Somerset, decided that no slave could breathe in England. We have the same writ, and let the people in Britain and the United States stand as true to liberty, 
as the Constitution is true to liberty, and we shall have no need of a dissolution of the Union. But to all this it is said that the practice of the American people is against my view. I admit it. They have given the Constitution a slaveholding interpretation. I admit it. And I go with him, who goes farthest in denouncing these wrongs, these outrages on my people. But to be consistent with this logic, where does it lead? Because the practice of the American people has been wrong, shall we therefore denounce the Constitution? The same logic would land the man of the City Hall, precisely where the same logic has landed some of his friends in America, in the dark, benighted regions of infidelity itself. The Constitution is pro-slavery, because men have interpreted it to be pro-slavery, and practice upon it as if it were pro-slavery. The very same thing, sir, might be said of the Bible itself, for in the United States, men have interpreted the Bible against liberty. They have declared that Paul's epistle to Philemon is a full proof for the enactment of that hell-black fugitive slave bill which has desolated my people for the last ten years in that country. They have declared that the Bible sanctions slavery. What do we do in such a case? What do you do when you are told by the slaveholders of America that the Bible sanctions slavery? Do you throw your Bible into the fire? Do you sing out, no union with the Bible? Do you declare that a thing is bad because it has been misused, abused, and made a bad use of? Do you throw it away on that account? No! You press it to your bosom all the more closely. You read it all the more diligently. You prove from its pages that it is on the side of liberty, and not on the side of slavery. So let us do so with the Constitution of the United States. But this logic would carry the orator of the City Hall a step or two further. It would lead him to break down the British Constitution. I believe he is not only a Protestant, but he is the dissenter. And if he is opposed to the American Constitution because certain evils exist therein, could he well oppose all the other constitutions? But I must beg pardon for detaining you so long. I must bring my remarks speedily to a close. Let me make a statement. It was said to you that the southern states had increased from five up to fifteen. What is the fact with reference to this matter? Why, my friends, the slave states in America have increased just from twelve up to fifteen. But the other statement was not told you. It is this, the free states have increased from one up to eighteen. That fact was not told. No, I suppose it was expected I would come back and tell you all the truth. It takes two men to tell the truth anyway. The dissolution of the Union, remember, that was clamored for that night, would not give the northern states one single advantage over slavery, that it does not now possess. Within the Union we have a firm basis of opposition to slavery. It is opposed to all the great objects of the Constitution. The dissolution of the Union is not only an unwise but a cowardly proposition. Dissolve the Union? For what? Tear down the house in an instant because a few states have been blown off the roof? There are 350,000 slaveholders in America and 26 millions of free white people. Must these 26 millions of people break up their government, dissolve their union, burn up their constitution, for what? To get rid of the responsibility of holding slaves? But can they get rid of responsibility by that? Alas, no. The recreant husband may desert the family hearth, may leave his starving children, and you may place oceans, islands, and continents between him and his. But the responsibility, the gnawing of a guilty conscience must follow him wherever he goes. If a man were on board of a pirate ship, and in company with others had robbed and plundered, his whole duty would not be performed simply by taking to the longboat and singing out, no union with pirates. His duty would be to restore the stolen property. The American people in the northern states have helped to enslave the black people. Their duty will not have been done till they give back their plundered rights. They cannot get rid of their responsibility by dissolving the Union. They must put down the evil, abolish the wrong. The abolition of slavery, not the dissolution of the Union, is the only way in which they can get rid of the responsibility. No union with slaveholding, 
is an excellent sentiment as showing hostility to slavery but what is union with slavery is it living under the same sky walking on the same earth riding on the same railway taking dinner on board of the same steamboat with the slaveholder no i can be in all these relations to the slaveholder but yet heaven high above him as wide from him as the poles of the moral universe no union with slaveholding is a much better phrase than that adopted by those who insist that they in america are the only friends of the slave who wish to destroy the union reference was made in the city hall to my having held other views and different views from those i now entertain an old speech of mine delivered some fourteen years ago in london was rendered with skill and effect i don't know what it was brought up for perhaps it was brought forward to show that i am not infallible not like his reverence of rome if that was the object i can relieve the friends of that gentleman entirely by telling them that i never made any pretensions to infallibility although i cannot accuse myself of being remarkably unstable i cannot pretend that i have never altered my opinion both in respect to men and things indeed i have been very much modified both in feeling and opinion within the last fourteen years and he would be a queer man who would have lived fourteen years without having his opinions and feelings considerably modified by experience in that length of time when i escaped from slavery twenty-two years ago the world was all new to me and if i had been in a hogshead with the bung in i could not have been much more ignorant of many things than i was then i came out running all i knew was that i had two elbows and a good appetite and that i was a human being a sort of nondescript creature still struggling for life the first i met were the garrisonian abolitionists of massachusetts they had their views opinions platform and eloquence and were earnestly laboring for the abolition of slavery they were my friends the friends of my people and nothing was more natural than i should receive as gospel all they told me when i was a child i spake as a child i understood as a child i thought as a child but when i became a man that is after i went over to great britain and came back again i undertook the herculean task without a day's schooling to edit and publish a paper to unite myself to the literary profession i could hardly spell two words correctly still i thought i could join as we say and when i had to write three or four columns a week it became necessary to re-examine some of the opinions i had formed in my baby days and when i came to examine for myself my opinions were greatly modified and i had the temerity to state to the parties from whom i received them my change of opinions and from that day to this whether in the east or in the west in and out of america in ireland scotland or england i have been pursued and persecuted by that class of persons on account of my change of opinions but i am quite well satisfied very well satisfied with my position now what do i propose what do you propose what do we sensible folks propose for we are sensible the slaveholders have ruled the american government for the last fifty years let the anti-slavery party rule the nation for the next fifty years and by the way the thing is on the verge of being accomplished the slaveholders above all things else dread the rule of the anti-slavery party that are now coming into power to dissolve the union would be to do just what the slaveholders would like to have done slavery is essentially a dark system all it wants is to be excluded and shut out from the light if only it can be boxed in where there is not a single breath to fall upon it nor a single word to assail it then it can grope in its own congenial darkness oppressing human hearts and crushing human happiness but it dreads the influence of truth it dreads the influence of congress it knows full well that when the moral sentiment of the nation shall demand the abolition of slavery there is nothing in the constitution of the united states to prevent that abolition well now what do we want we want this whereas slavery has ruled the land now must liberty whereas pro-slavery men have sat in the supreme court of the united states and given the constitution a pro-slavery interpretation against its plain reading 
let us by our votes put men into that supreme court who will decide and who will concede that that constitution is not pro-slavery what do you do when you want to reform or change do you break up your government by no means you say reform the government and that is just what the abolitionists who wish for liberty in the united states propose they propose that the intelligence the humanity the christian principle the true manliness which they feel in their hearts shall flow out from their hearts through their fingers into the ballot box and into that ballot box it shall go for such men as shall represent the christian principle and christian intelligence in the united states and that congress shall crystallize those sentiments into law and that law shall be in favor of freedom and that is the way we hope to accomplish the abolition of slavery since these questions are put here it is a bounden duty to listen to arguments of this sort and i know that the intelligent men and women here will be glad to have this full expose of the whole question i thank you very sincerely for the patient attention you have given me end of the american constitution and the slave by frederick douglas Frederick Nietzsche's Apollo or Dionysus from Frederick Nietzsche, The Dionysian Spirit of the Age by Alfred Richard Orridge, 1873-1934 Published in 1906 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org apollo or dionysus aphorisms the existence of the world can be justified only as an ascetic phenomenon spirit is that life which itself cutteth into life the secret of a joyful life is to live dangerously life is whatever must surpass itself two things are wanted by the true man danger and play how is freedom measured by the resistance which has to be overcome by the effort which it costs to retain superiority throw not away the hero in thy soul ye are permitted to have enemies who must be hated not enemies whom ye can despise become what thou art tragedy the dream world of a dionysian ecstasy everything that suffereth wanteth to live in order to become ripe and gay and longing men must require strength otherwise they never attain it a good war halloweth every cause apollo or dionysus whoever wishes to understand greek culture said nietzsche must first penetrate the mystery of dionysus the statement is equally true if we substitute for greek culture nietzsche himself the secret of nietzsche is the secret of dionysus it was through the gateway of greek tragic art that nietzsche found his way into his own world and all his originality and daring as well as his excesses and contradictions become intelligible when once this tragic view is seized in his study of greek art nietzsche was struck by a fact which had puzzled many thinkers before him why did the greeks the blithest and best constituted race the world has ever seen need such a tragic art as theirs for they were not emotionally asleep nor was it as a medicinal purgation of soul that they suffered tragedy on the contrary they were a highly impressionable profoundly ascetic people and the evidence shows them deeply moved yet greatly rejoicing in the tragic drama yet what need had they of tragedy it is plain from the form of the question that nietzsche's conception of art was not the ordinary conception the art of a people was not to be accounted for by their whims and fancies it was to be determined by need what does not spring from necessity is not art unless the people need art as they need bread how can their art be great 
but to satisfy what imperious need did the greeks create tragedy nietzsche found the solution of the problem in the myth of apollo and dionysus and the antithesis he there discovered he afterwards employed in art literature philosophy morality and life itself mythology he saw was no less than the spiritual history of a people the records of its moods its periods of spiritual doubt despair and triumph in the story of the coming of dionysus into greece of the resistance of apollo and of the final reconciliation nietzsche saw the outlines of spiritual movements mythically veiled the phases of the myth corresponding to historic phases of the greek mind the coming of dionysus was a popular movement of ideas the resistance of apollo was a popular movement of conservatism the reconciliation was a compromise regarded in this way the myth becomes history of the most intimate nature and records the history of the greek soul during several centuries all the more interesting is the story to us on account of the essential similarity between ancient greece and modern europe the issues involved in the struggle of apollo and dionysus are the same now as then in truth as nietzsche discovered the way to the modern world is through the portals of the ancient wisdom the spiritual condition of greece during the period immediately preceding the dionysian awakening was comparable to the spiritual condition of europe during the eighteenth century greece was a pollen in the sense that europe was religious the long-established apollon cult was fast becoming a convention now that the titans the elemental forces of wild nature were vanquished and the gods had no more enemies olympus the bright and splendid olympus began visibly to fade great zeus himself was nodding on his throne religion morality art life itself were losing their hold on men and greece was threatened with the fate of india then it was that there came into greece from the north the home of spiritual impulse a new power in the form of dionysus that its leader was a thracian that he brought with him the secret of wine music and ecstasy that he was instantly welcomed by women and that the movement so inaugurated began rapidly to spread over greece all this is clear enough even in the secular story but the spiritual issues were infinitely greater for dionysus and the dionysian spirit were everywhere in open and direct antagonism with everything apollon the whole structure of the greek mind under apollon influence was threatened at every point by the attacks of the dionysians its modes of thought its religion its morality its art its philosophy its very existence were challenged in comparison with all that greece had so far been the dionysian movement was revolutionary irreligious immoral barbaric and anarchic the reception of such a movement by the apollon greeks may easily be conceived by modern europeans however they might secretly feel the attraction of the splendid virility of the new movement they could not but pause before accepting doctrines which flew in the face of accepted established customs it was true that the established customs were stale that olympus was fading that greece was dying but the admission of dionysus with his train of ecstatic women wild men and still wilder doctrines seemed a remedy worse than the disease placed once more in a position of necessity apollo girded himself for the fight and the conservative forces for a while succeeded in repelling the dionysian invaders thus by a curious reaction the very element that threatened to destroy served in fact to strengthen and renew but such an effect did not pass unnoticed among the greeks it would be absurd to suppose that many individual greeks were clearly aware of the problems they were facing spiritual movements are conscious in the minds of only a few but they have their home in the mind of the race 
the question that now presented itself was this remembering olympus at war with titans olympus at rest and dying of rest and olympus renewing its youth in war with dionysus was it possible was it really true that olympus needed an enemy that conflict was indispensable to olympus sworn deadly enemy of apollo as dionysus might be could apollo really live without him might not dionysus the eternal foe be also the eternal saviour of apollo the question was afterwards put by nietzsche in myriads of forms the whole of his work may be said indeed to be no less than the raising of this terrible interrogation mark he divined and stated the problem for modern europe as it had been stated for ancient greece he asked europe the question which greece had already asked herself and which greece had magnificently answered for the answer of greece is recorded in her tragic mysteries in greek drama the answer of the greek mind to the momentous question is a splendid affirmative not apollo alone not dionysus alone but apollo and dionysus what will be europe's reply before however considering any further the meaning of greek tragedy it is advisable to glance briefly at the issues involved in the eternal antagonism while in their human aspects apollo and dionysus may stand respectively for law and liberty duty and love custom and change science and intuition art and inspiration in their larger aspects they are symbols of oppositions that penetrate the very stuff of consciousness and life they are its warp and woof thus apollo stands for form as against dionysus for life for matter as against energy for the human as against the superhuman apollo is always on the side of the formed the definite the restrained the rational but dionysus is the power that destroys forms that leads the definite into the infinite the unrestrained the tumultuous and passionate in perhaps their profoundest antithesis dionysus is pure energy which blake a thorough dionysian said was eternal delight while apollo is pure form seeking ever to veil and blind pure energy life as it thus appears to the eye of the imaginative mind is the spectacle of the eternal play and conflict of two mutually opposing principles dionysius ever escaping from the forms that apollo is ever creating for him and it is just this unceasing conflict that is the essence of life itself life is conflict dionysus without apollo would be unmanifest pure energy apollo without dionysus would be dead inert each is necessary to the other but in active opposition for as stage by stage the play proceeds apollo must build continually more beautiful more enduring forms which dionysus in turn must continually surmount and transcend the drama of life is thus a perpetual movement towards a climax that never comes apollo never will imprison dionysus forever dionysius never will escape forever from apollo only as in the early stages of life dionysius begins by speaking in the language of apollo apollo will in the later phases learn more and more to speak in the language of dionysus life itself will become dionysian as the eternal conflict proceeds in the greek drama nietzsche as has been said found at once the problem and its solution for what could life have meant to the spectators of the plays of aeschylus and sophocles what but the tragedy of the eternal strife the recognition of the essential tragedy of life itself the spectacle of a never-ending world drama in which the gods played 
for the tragic greeks life was the dionysian will to renew at war with the apollon will to preserve life was intelligible only as an ascetic spectacle there was no finality no purpose no end no goal only the gods played ceaselessly and the business of man was to assist at the spectacle and in the play as a joyous spectator actor he could enter into the strife consciously aiding the unfolding of the eternal drama of which he himself was both dionysus and apollo for as the world drama is in truth the drama of mind so the interior nature of the individual is the stage on which it is played the perception of this truth by the greeks was the signal of the reconciliation of apollo and dionysus as at delphi the home of apollo the priests of dionysus were formally admitted with their train of ceremony and festival so in the life of the race and in the minds of the greeks themselves the reconciliation took place henceforth greek culture was the child of both dionysus and apollo and in the tragic mysteries was revealed to the spectator an image of the life of the world on the stage he beheld dionysus and the dionysified struggling against the apollon powers of fate and death the greek needed to behold that struggle he needed to be constantly reassured that life was of this nature profoundly as he might and must sympathize with the sufferings of apollo he could not but sympathize even more deeply with the agonies of dionysus yet in the end he could not be mortally distressed for he felt that fierce and terrible as the conflict was real and moving as the pains of the tragedy must needs be it was the game the play the celestial life of gods that he was witnessing to rise to the height where he might joyfully behold the game without ceasing for an instant to feel the pain and sorrow of it all to rejoice with dionysus victorious and yet to mourn with apollo slain to assist in his own life the great drama by welcoming all that promised struggle finally to will with all his soul the increasing triumph of dionysus that life and joy might be all in all such was the meaning of tragedy among the greeks when nietzsche had reached this conclusion he turned to the closer examination of his own europe in the music of tristan and isolde he heard or thought he heard the old dionysian strains he believed that europe was about to enter through wagner into a repetition of the spiritual history of the greeks dionysus he thought had come to europe and if the events in greece were to be repeated in europe we were already on the threshold of the new era with dionysus at our gates in the spirit of joy freedom excess the spirit of pure energy the old cry of life desiring to renew itself how could a chosen disciple of dionysus be silent nietzsche threw himself into the struggle even as he believed dionysus the spirit of life itself had already done for was not dionysus the spirit of the years to come yearning to mix himself with life later he regretted having mistaken wagner for a genuine dionysian and reflected that the dionysian swans of his enthusiasm were no more than geese but he never doubted that the history of the greeks was about to be repeated failing wagner he himself would be the dionysian initiator he would transform europe and deliver men's minds from the dull oppression of apollo he began from that time the enormous labor of turning the dionysian criticism on the whole fabric of european civilization if he is so largely negative in his effects the cause is not to be sought so much in him as in the times positive doctrines he had in abundance later in life he deplored the negations into which he had been led but the work of undermining the foundations of modern thought occupied too large a part of a comparatively brief life 
hence we see in his work more of the struggle and less of the triumph of dionysus even in this it is greek history repeated for dionysus also was defeated at first end of frederick nietzsche's apollo or dionysus from frederick nietzsche the dionysian spirit of the age by alfred richard orridge eighteen seventy three to nineteen thirty four published in nineteen hundred and six armistice by encyclopedia britannica this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by piotr natter armistice from latin arma arms and sistere to stop a suspension of hostilities by mutual agreement between two nations at war or their respective forces an armistice may be either general or particular in the first case there is a complete cessation of hostile operations in every part of the dominions of the belligerent powers in the second there is merely a temporary truce between two contending armies or between a besieged fortress and the force besieging it such a temporary truce when for a very limited period and for a special purpose e g the collection of the wounded and the burial of the dead is termed a suspension of arms a general armistice cannot be concluded by the commanders-in-chief unless special authority has been previously delegated to them by their respective governments otherwise any arrangement entered into by them requires subsequent ratification by the supreme powers of the states a partial truce may be concluded by the officers of the respective powers without any special authority from their governments wherever from the nature and extent of the commands they exercise their duties could not be efficiently discharged without their possession of such a power the conduct of belligerent parties during an armistice is usually regulated in modern warfare by express agreement between the parties but where this is not the case the following general conditions may be laid down one each party may do within the limits prescribed by the truce whatever he could have done in time of peace for example he can raise troops collect stores receive reinforcements and fortify places that are not actually in a state of siege two neither party can take advantage of the armistice to do what he could not have done had military operations continued thus he cannot throw provisions or reinforcements into a besieged town and neither besiegers nor besieged are at liberty to repair their fortifications or erect new works three all things contained in places the possession of which was contested must remain in the state in which they were before the armistice began any infringement by either party of the conditions of the truce entitles the other to recommence hostile operations without previous intimation End of Armistice by Encyclopedia Britannica Bogdan Chmielnicki by Encyclopedia Britannica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Natter. Bogdan Chmielnicki, circa 1593 to 1657. Hetman of the Cossacks, son of Michael Chmielnicki, was born at Subatov, near Shigrin, in the Ukraine an estate given to the elder Chmielnicki for his lifelong services to the polish crown bogdan after learning to read and write a rare accomplishment in those days entered the cossack ranks was dangerously wounded and taken prisoner in his first battle against the turks and found leisure during his two years captivity at constantinople to acquire the rudiments of turkish and french on returning to the ukraine he settled down quietly on his paternal estate and in all probability history would have never known his name if the intolerable persecution of a neighbouring polish squire who stole his hayricks and flogged his infant son to death had not converted the thrifty and acquisitive cossack husbandman into one of the most striking and sinister figures of modern times failing to get redress nearer home he determined to seek for justice at warsaw whither he had been summoned with other cossack delegates to assist vladislaus the fourth 
in his long projected war against the Turks. The king, perceiving him to be a man of some education and intelligence, appointed him Pisash, or secretary, of the registered Cossacks, and he subsequently served under Konietzpolski in the Ukraine campaign of 1646. His hopes of distinction were, however, cut short by a decree of the Polish Diet which, in order to vex the king, refused to sanction the continuance of the war. Khmelnytsky, now doubly hateful to the Poles as being both a royalist and a Cossack, was again maltreated and chicaned, and only escaped from jail by bribing his jailers. Thirsting for vengeance, he fled to the Cossack settlements on the lower Dnieper, and thence sent messages to the Khan of Crimea, urging a simultaneous invasion of Poland by the Tartars and the Cossacks, 1647. On the 11th of April, 1648, at an assembly of the Zaporozhians, he openly declared his intention of proceeding against the Poles, and was elected Ataman by acclamation. At Zeltania Vodui, Yellow Waters, in the Ukraine, he annihilated, on the 19th of May, a detached Polish army corps after three days' desperate fighting, and on the 26th routed the main Polish army under the Grand Hetman Stephen Pototsky at Krutabalka, Hart Plank, near the river Korsun. The immediate consequence of these victories was the outbreak of a serf's fury. Throughout the Ukraine, the Polish gentry were hunted down, flayed, and burned alive, blinded, and sawn asunder. Every manor house was reduced to ashes. Every Uniat and Catholic priest was hung up before his own altar, along with a Jew and a hog. The panic-stricken inhabitants fled to the nearest strongholds, and soon the rebels were swarming all over the palatinates of Volhynia and Podolia. But the Ataman was as crafty as he was cruel. Disagreeably awakened to the insecurity of his position by the refusal of the Tsar and the Sultan to accept him as a vassal, he feigned to resume negotiations with the Poles in order to gain time, dismissed the Polish commissioners in the summer of 1648 with impossible conditions, and on the 23rd of September, after a contest of three days, utterly routed the Polish chivalry, 40,000 strong, at Pildava, where the Cossacks are said to have reaped an immense booty after the fight was over. All Poland now lay at his feet, and the road to the defenceless capital was open before him, but he wasted the precious months in vain before the fortress of Zamość, and was then persuaded by the new king of Poland, John Casimir, to consent to a suspension of hostilities. In June 1649, arrayed in cloth of gold and mounted on a white charger, Chmielnicki made his triumphal entry into Kiev, where he was hailed as the Maccabius of the Orthodox faith and permitted the committal of unspeakable atrocities on the Jews and Roman Catholics. At the ensuing peace congress at Pereyaslavl, he demanded terms so extravagant that the Polish commissioners dared not listen to them. In 1649, therefore, the war was resumed. A bloody battle ensued near Zborów, on the banks of the Stripa, when only the personal valor of the Polish king, the superiority of the Polish artillery, and the defection of Chmielnicki's allies, the Tartars, enabled the royal forces to hold their own. Peace was then patched up by the Compact of Zborów, August 21, 1649, whereby Chmielnicki was virtually recognized as a semi-independent prince. For the next eighteen months he was the absolute master of the Ukraine, which he divided into sixteen provinces, made his native place Shigrin the Cossack capital, and entered into direct relations with foreign powers. Poland and Muscovy competed for his alliance, and in his more exalted moods he meditated an orthodox crusade against the Turk at the head of the northern Slavs. But he was no statesman, and his difficulties proved overwhelming instinct told him that his old ally the khan of the crimea was unreliable and that the czar of muscovy was his natural protector yet he could not make up his mind to abandon the one or turn to the other his attempt to carve a principality for his son out of moldavia which poland regarded as her vassal led to the outbreak in sixteen fifty one of a third war between the subject and suzerain which speedily assumed the dignity and the dimensions of a crusade. Chmielnicki was now regarded not merely as a Cossack rebel, but as an arch-enemy of Catholicism in Eastern Europe, and the Pope granted a plenary absolution to all who took up arms against him. But Bogdan himself was not without ecclesiastical sanction. The Archbishop of Corinth girded him with a sword which had lain upon the Holy Sepulchre, 
and the Metropolitan of Kiev absolved him from all his sins, without the usual preliminary of confession, before he rode forth to battle. But fortune, so long his friend, now deserted him, and at Berestechko, July 1, 1651, the Cossack Ataman was defeated for the first time. But even now his power was far from broken. In 1652 he openly interfered in the affairs of Transylvania and Wallachia, and assumed the high-sounding title of guardian of the Ottoman port. In 1653 Poland made a supreme effort, the Diet voted 17 million gulden in subsidies, and John Casimir led an army of 60,000 men into the Ukraine and defeated the arch-rebel at Zranta, whereupon Khmelnytsky took the oath of allegiance to the Tsar, Compact of Pereyaslav, February 19, 1654, and all hope of an independent Cossack state was at an end. He died on the 7th of August, 1657. With all his native ability, Khmelnytsky was but an eminent savage. He was the creature of every passing mood or whim, incapable of cool and steady judgment or of the slightest self-control, an incalculable weathercock, blindly obsequious to every blast of passion. He could destroy, but he could not create, and other people benefited by his exploits. End of Bogdan Khmelnytsky by Encyclopædia Britannica Bumping into the Bolshevist, Part 1, by Maud Radford Warren, Saturday Evening Post, September 18, 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bumping into the Bolshevist, by Maud Radford Warren, Saturday Evening Post, September 18, 1920. It's too flippant, the title of the article, to consort with the experiences and the natural human bitterness of a free American who arrived in Baku a few hours after the Bolshevist had taken it and who couldn't get away. Within this hour I have been released after having been interred fifty-odd days. I'm free again, but my mind is prisoner to almost the last picture I saw in Baku. I was walking along Politsotskia, the street on which I lived, and also the street that held the prison behind the Czechsvokia. At the corner I came across a middle-aged woman leaning against a wall and weeping, while a Frenchman, evidently a stranger, was trying to comfort her. You could see that the woman had put on her prettiest clothes, had arranged her hair with special care. Over her arm was a basket with a white napkin covering it. I prepared what he liked best to eat, she said over and over in French. I thought perhaps they would let me see him, and now, and now, perhaps I was baking the cake for him when... Pitiful Cases I hurried on, and half a block farther along, I met an old Jewish woman quietly crying, the slow, hard, terrible tears of old age. Then I heard the most despairing screaming, and as I passed the wide doorway of the Czechoslovakia, I saw a girl of perhaps eighteen, deathly white, her big eyes strained and wide, her hair hanging. She was supported by an old man who was probably her father, and by a Bolshevik soldier whose face showed his sympathy. Such misery as those poor people exuded, and such anguished interest as there was on the part of the spectators. As I heard later, the three women had gone to see their men, the old woman to see her son, and the younger women their husbands. The girl had been married only a fortnight to a young man who had been accused, by another girl, of talking against communism. For all I know, he had been plotting against Bolshevism. He may have been a real traitor to their cause. In any case, the three women had carried dinner to their men, and had just been told that they had been shot the night before. It all seemed too much to bear. I was passing on with my head down to shut out the misery, when a Bolshevik soldier put his hand on my shoulder and shoved me along, saying something in Russian. Long patience isn't one of my qualities. Before I realized what I was doing, I had taken out my little American flag and was saying, Don't you dare touch me! 
I'm an American subject. The Bolshevik could talk English. You American, he said. You can stay and watch if you like. I don't want to watch, I said. I am walking at my usual pace to the house where I live. I only want to be let alone. A Russian woman was walking just behind me, and she said in French, Madame, you are very fortunate to be able to speak as fearlessly as that. Evidently you are going away from here. Give a thought to those of us who have no other country to go to than this. I could think of a dozen picturesque incidents to follow this, but I abandoned them all in favor of a paragraph of warning addressed to the radicals in the United States, whom the Bolsheviks tell me they expect to influence. I have seen the Bolsheviks make their first invasion into territory other than Russian. I have seen them take the little republic of Azerbaijan, with its five million people that stretches westward from the Caspian Sea. I have seen them make it into a Soviet republic. To do them justice, they have accomplished their revolution with no general bloodshed. There have been executions of counter-revolutionists. There has been a good deal of organized looting under the name of requisitioning. But the average man has not been in danger of losing his life. He has, however, lost his liberty. The best that the Bolsheviks can offer their people is not so good as what our own working people are getting under our old-fashioned democracy. What the working man wants is more money, fewer working hours, and an equality which will assure him that no one else is going to have more money or more power than he has. If, owing to the defects of our old friend, human nature, Christian ideals have not brought this utopia to the working man, far less will be the ideals of Bolshevism. Equality? Under Bolshevism, there has been the same distinction of higher and lower, of powerful and powerless, that there are in any other society. The streets of Baku are full of automobiles in which some men drive while others walk. There are commissioners who sit in well-furnished offices and drink champagne, while outside stand other Bolsheviks waiting to do their bidding with dry throats. Calling them all workmen or communists does not alter the facts of distinction in rank and importance. Masters and servants you find as surely as under the Romanovs. Bolshevik inequalities. More leisure? The common man, who used to work eight hours a day, and who thought that the Soviet regime would reduce the time to six hours, now finds that he must work ten or twelve. His Saturday half-holiday and his Sunday may be broken into by a demand to do state reconstruction work, road building, house erection, anything the Soviet needs. More money? The Bolshevik newspapers of Baku stated that the lowest wages were to be 6,000 rubles a month, and the highest 10, soldiers to receive a certain amount of rations, and workmen to get bread at a reduced rate, and perhaps to receive rations also. The workman's wife may buy black bread at two or three rubles a pound, if she will stand in line for it from two to eight hours. In one of the rooms where I stayed in Baku, I used to see the people beginning to form in line at two in the morning, and at nine, when I got up, the line was still there. White bread cost a hundred and fifty rubles a pound, rice a hundred rubles, Raisins, 200, butter, 500, meat, 180, tea, 3,000, sugar, 1,000. Cotton stockings are 3,000 rubles a pair, and shoes, 12 to 16,000 rubles. Some Bolsheviks can buy at such prices, and some cannot. Though in Baku they have nationalized the land and the oil wells and the bank, and have done away with the bourgeois, to say nothing of the aristocracy, there are many workmen and soldiers who are already asking themselves if Bolshevism has really done anything for them. Others are thoroughly disillusioned, know that they are not only not so well off as they were, but are living under a tyranny, yet they dare not raise their voices. I am convinced that if I could take a group of our most discontented workmen or our most ardent radicals, 
and set them down in Baku as Soviet subjects. If I could show them both the best and the worst of Bolshevism, they would have to decide that they could do better for themselves and their children under United States democracy, common laws, and trade unions than under any Soviet government. Let me tell you how I came into this gallery of the Bolsheviks. I like to revert to my days of freedom, for though I am at this moment some miles from the Bolshevik frontier, I assure you I still suffer from the depression of the prisoner. My being caught in Baku is due to the scruples of my friends, the British in Baghdad. They wanted me to go home by way of the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean, and the Red Sea. As there were no sailings till June, that meant three weeks of torture. I said I wanted to go through Persia. They said they thought the Bolsheviks might swoop down on Baku at any time. I reminded them that the Volga was still frozen, and added that I would prefer the Bolsheviks to a sunstroke. They hesitated for days, and then said that I must wire to the American minister at Tehran for permission to go. A jest that was no joke. It took ten days to hear from him, and another four to manage the transportation arrangements. Fourteen wasted days, and the Bolshevists beat me to Baku by twelve hours. I like to think of the last lap of that journey to what I supposed was the Republic of Azerbaijan. I like to remember the delightful hospitality of General and Mrs. Champagne at Kazbin, with the children coming in for a story, idle pleasant talk of the state of Persia and the world generally. I like to remember the drive to Resht with Willemy, the Indian driver, yelling loud curses whenever we met Persians driving donkeys or camels or four-horse shabanas. I asked him once what he said, and he returned slowly. I say, Why you wait till road is most narrow and then take up all room and road? I think you worthy of your very bad mother. On we went, away up and away down, past Aga Baba, past Minjil, where the wind always blows from noon till night, and where the willow trees are all thrown in their efforts to withstand hurricanes. Of a sudden the face of the country changed. The opalescent hills became green belts of woods. The houses were no longer low and flat, but two-story with long, sloping roofs. We had come into that belt of country, lower than the Caspian Sea, where it rains a great deal and rice fields abound. Rest at last, where a delightful young captain gave me tea and another promise to wrap up my Persian rugs. Mark those rugs, please. They play a great part in my emotions among the Bolsheviks. I had chosen them with care. Well, they were wrapped, and I stayed the night at the house of Mr. Butters, the manager of the bank and the vice council, a delightful host. I motored next day to Inzeli, got on board the boat, and met a nice young English captain who had been acting as courier between Constantinople and Persia. He remarked that he was making his last trip to Constantinople, after which he would go on leave. Poor lad! At this moment he is in Bailoff prison. We had talked only a few minutes when the boat began to roll, and I went below and behaved as I always do on the sea until about noon the next day, when the captain told me we were well in sight of Baku. I tottered on deck and fell in love with Baku. It lies in shape a horseshoe, cream-colored against a hill, with dark, slim, cone-shaped oil derricks on each side. Down along the shore runs a handsome boulevard. I noticed that a lot of people appeared to be standing on the boulevard and staring at us. I also noticed that all the ships in the harbor were decorated with strings of flags. I wondered if it were some feast day. Presently the police boat came alongside, and its officials exchanged a few words with the master of the ship. Immediately a sailor hurried past the captain and me, carrying a length of red bunting. I suppose it represented some quarantine regulation. But by way of a jest, I remarked, That's the Bolshevist flag. They're going to haul down the Azerbaijan flag and put this one up. 
That's exactly what the sailor did. The captain turned a little pale and remarked hesitatingly that he had to get a handkerchief. The captain of the ship would seem to have had charge of his handkerchiefs, for it was to him that he went. Presently he came back, biting his lips. "'What you said is no joke,' he remarked. "'The Bolshevists took Baku last night. "'I wish you hadn't come. "'Promise me you'll go back to Inzeli if you get the chance.' "'He was a dear lad to be thinking of me. "'Hadn't you better run downstairs and destroy your passport?' I suggested. "'It probably confesses that you were a member of Dinikin's volunteer army.' How it feels to be arrested. The captain called on his maker and fled down the stairs. I watched the police officials giving information to the ship's officials, while one sailor patriotically caught up his red silk handkerchief and distributed the pieces to his comrades for badges. It took about two minutes to turn that boat into a vehicle for Bolshevism. The captain returned just as the police officials began to approach us. "'You haven't kept a diary, I suppose,' I said to him, "'knowing that youths of twenty-three will keep diaries.' "'Once more he called upon his maker and fled downstairs, "'while I cried something about luggage after him. "'The police officials came to me and said, first in Russian and then in German, "'Why did that British officer hurry below?' "'To put my luggage with his,' I said. "'We only met on the boat.' but it is perhaps simpler to have all our possessions together. They then arrested me. I never was arrested before, not knowing how to drive a car, but this arrest was made in style. I was taken down to the second-class salon, where I found the captain already under guard in one corner of the room and his three soldiers in another. We had four or five guards placed over us. The guards wore huge gray fur caps, a sort of nondescript grayish khaki uniform. Each carried a gun ready for action and a knife in his belt. In the background was a crowd of spectators, mainly people in from the docks to stare at us. Among them was the ship's stewardess, who had never come near me during my seasickness. She now made strange vocal sounds, indicating streaming eyes, said Nix vigorously and Bolshevik good. Her intention of kindness was so clear that I forgave her for her previous neglect. The captain quickly offered cigarettes to the guard. Poor lad, from all I heard later about the English prisoners, he must have suffered for that tobacco. Presently it occurred to someone that our imprisonment was not being taken seriously enough. The spectators were driven away, and the sheep and the goats were separated. That is, the captain and his men were taken off to another cubbyhole, and I was left in the salon with one guard. He was a dark-eyed boy with a shallow, likable face, and he glared at me quite sternly. I am afraid I annoyed him at first by smiling at him, but after a time he smiled back. "'You Bolshevik?' I asked him. He rose, glanced carefully out of the door and the portholes to see that he was unobserved. Then he shook his head from side to side and spat contemptuously. He had evidently come forward to swim with the tide and act as a volunteer policeman. Time passed. The captain called out to me that the ship officials had gone to the commissar to find out what was to be done with us, the impression prevailing that the British would go to jail while I would be given the freedom of the town. The captain arranged for a Tartar to escort me to a hotel in case I were allowed my liberty. After an hour or two a message came, saying that the British must remain on the ship for the present but that the American lady was free to go where she pleased. Very well, I agreed. I'll go to Tiflis. Take me to the train. They shrugged and explained that the train was not running 
and that madame would find herself very well pleased to remain in baku for a day or two i had already taken addresses from the british that i might write to their people i bade them a regretful good-bye and then preceded by three persians carrying my rugs my luggage and my tartar guide i got off the boat and on the pier and then to a very cobbly street i was not afraid but i will confess that i was a little lonely as i walked through groups of staring people wearing red ribbons who addressed to me questions i could not understand i kept saying americanski until i saw that interested them too much for i began to head a procession following to see what was going to become of an americanski bolshevist hospitality in baku aside from the little ripple of excitement i created as coming off the only boat that had arrived that day i could not see that baku looked as if anything unusual had taken place i had been told that ever since nineteen o six baku had been distinguished by street fighting and massacres and i should have thought that a real revolution would have been ushered in with some sort of uproar not at all the streets looked about as they do when a big strike is on at home that is there was a sunday or holiday feeling because of the many people loitering in the streets and here and there these loiterers were gathered into groups discussing the situation in a more or less guarded fashion one lad of eighteen with a rifle and a big rosette was marching along with a girl of fifteen or sixteen on his arm she also adorned with a knot of red ribbon i had an uneasy feeling that some of these boy soldiers were quite too young you couldn't tell what they might fancy as a target i could see no signs of looting or of race hatred i went to hotel after hotel and nowhere was i accepted the bolsheviks had already requisitioned them it's not so simple to be a stranger and ignorant of the language in a country just taken over by the bolsheviks at last i learned that some american relief work was being done in baku i went to the house which was being used as headquarters a house owned by armenians mr and mrs gregory tominians a german received me pleasantly but at first hesitated to do anything for me saying that the house was not his i then reminded him that he had two offices and asked if i could sleep in one using my own bed he consented then mrs tomanians asked me to dinner for that day and succeeding days for three days since all shops were shut the only meals i had were her dinners and if she had known that i was breakfastless and supperless i could have had those meals with her too mrs tomanians said that as long as she had anything left she would share it with anyone represented the united states in any way i have heard many sharp things about armenians but of the four persons in baku who helped me most three belong to that race therefore it is only human that i should hold a brief for them the fourth was an english woman after the tomanians's house was taken away from them she and her husband let me sleep in the closet that they and their two children had been using as a dressing room while the four of them occupied one small bedroom one never forgets a kindness i hope but the kindness shown a prisoner magnifies in the soul the plans of linen and company but to go back to my arrival at the tomiansis house i began to see why my tartar guide had been so attentive he realized that i would furnish a nice bit of graft for him he not only charged me an appalling price for the porters but he said i must pay thirty five hundred rubles customs on my rugs the mere fact that i had already paid in Nzeli was of no avail then i really began to feel like a prisoner i had not free action or free speech i couldn't resent anything that might be done to me in baku there was a great deal of humor in the remark that i was an american lady free as i paid over the rubles i also saw the humor in the fact that they had told me in persia that i simply couldn't get my luggage through without being robbed and i had thought to be safe by lying on the rugs a brief bit of history now about the republic of azerbaijan 
The inhabitants came originally from Central Asia. The majority of them are Muslims, of Tartar and Turkish blood. The country was once independent, then it belonged to Persia, and something like a hundred years ago, Russia annexed it. Feeling between Christians and Muslims has always been acute, and even within the last year and a half, there have been two bad massacres. Under Kerensky, an attempt was made to form Transcaucasia into a republic. But in 1918, the National Council of Azerbaijan declared its independence. Khan Kowitsky was made president of a council of ministers. Ministries were established of foreign affairs, home affairs, war, finance, ways of communication, justice, education, health, post and telegraph, agriculture, state property, state control, and labor. The country was menaced by anarchy, and the only troops were Armenian military detachments, whom the Tartars would not trust. The Azerbaijans, who had already made peace with Turkey, asked Turkey to send them a military force to help them put the country in order. They arrived in mid-June and stayed till mid-September, clearing up the country. In November, the Azerbaijan government sent a note to President Wilson asking that the United States should be the first of the powers to recognize the little republic. About this time, an American, French, and British detachment arrived from Inzeli with orders to the Turks to surrender Baku according to the terms of the armistice. There was no intention of interfering with the internal affairs of the country, and the republic continued to be recognized. Poor little Azerbaijan and its dream of a republic. Never so long as grass grows and water runs will Russia give up the notion of controlling her. And the reason is oil. For a thousand years Baku has been noted for its oil wells. The very name Azerbaijan means mines of fire. There are people in the Caucasus whose families for century have drawn wealth from Baku oil. At the time that the Bolsheviks entered, oil was not being pumped because there wasn't a container left in which another quart of it could be deposited. Russia proper was starving for oil. Factories and engines couldn't run because there was no fuel. Lenin and company never for a moment forgot Baku. In every important firm there was a Bolshevik working under instructions and waiting for the day when the Bolshevik army should enter. Americans who know Baku tell me that the workmen there have always been very radical and have for years had organizations that could easily enough be turned into Bolshevik institutions. There are certain people in Baku who will tell you that the revolution came as a great surprise. It did to the bourgeois and to the people who could not speak Russian, but the government feared it. For example, the president, Konkowiski, was able to make his escape to Tiflis a day or two before the Bolsheviks entered from the north, and so did several of the ministers. An English Bolshevik, a newspaper man, told me that he had been up all night for several nights waiting for something to happen. The night it did happen, he met an old Tartar woman, also strolling the streets, waiting for the millennium. Praise to Allah, she said. Now I will go and pull down the hair of the woman I work for, and tomorrow I shall be eating white bread. About the hair pulling I do not know, but I'll wager she got no white bread, for every shop was shut. Something like the 25th of April, so I am told by both Tartar and Armenian informants, a small fishing smack came down the Caspian, intending to land in Baku. In the storm and darkness it was driven into port several miles below, occupied by Azerbaijan Tartar soldiers. They found that the boat was occupied by 33 Russians, whose looks they did not like. They arrested these men, but the two leaders escaped at the risk of their lives, stole back on the ship, and managed to get the little lifeboat off and make their way to Baku. In a hiding place in the lifeboat were minute instructions from Lenin for the taking and the administration of Baku. Raising the Red Flag How true this tale is I don't know, but I am sure that on the night of the 27th, 
an armored train came down from Petrovac. With about 250 soldiers, the advance guard of the Bolshevik 11th Army, at the first station outside Baku, there was a very little firing. In Baku, there was a little resistance in front of the parliament building on the part of two or three soldiers who were killed and who killed a couple of Bolsheviks, and that was all. The city surrendered to this handful of men. Such of the Azerbaijan army as was in the city was got under control. A revolutionary committee was formed, some of its members being composed of the ministers of the Azerbaijan cabinet. The Tartars were told that they would have great power and that Azerbaijan would be the same as before, an independent republic, the only difference being that it would be Soviet. Instead of the heads of departments being called ministers, they would be called commissars, just like that. Very simple. The common people were told that elections would be immediately held for councils of soldiers, workmen, and peasants, that the bourgeois would be eliminated, that the oil fields, banks, and lands, and big businesses would be nationalized, and that everyone would share and share alike. Two newspapers were established for the purposes of propaganda, the communist and the young communist. News sheets were posted on the big buildings and posters, pretty clever some of them, were put up in prominent places, showing the horrors of Dinikin's army and all imperialist. Well-to-do people hid their best rugs in their jewelry, wore their poorest clothes, and stayed off the streets. Red flags waved everywhere and Baku blossomed with rosettes and the red Bolshevik star, the points which stand for brotherhood, freedom, equality, love, and truth. What impressed me at first was the bloodlessness of the revolution and the few men with which it was accomplished. I arrived on Wednesday, the 28th of April. By Saturday, I am sure all the troops in the place were on view, not only because it was Labor Day, but also because in the afternoon was held the funeral of the two Bolsheviks who had been shot in front of the Parliament House. I don't think there could have been more than eight, or at the most, ten thousand. They looked tired, for they had been marching down from Rostov. But they were in good condition, not very tidy, perhaps, but sturdy, well-disciplined fellows. Many of them came in without rifles. When I was leaning out of my window, estimating numbers in a platoon of, say, a hundred, perhaps fifteen or twenty, would be without arms. My window commanded in the distance the railway station, so I don't think I missed much. Life under Soviet rule On Thursday I counted the entrance of something like four thousand men, twenty-seven machine guns, and about sixty supply wagons. I have never seen sorrier-looking horses than the racks of bones that drew those wagons. The cavalry horses were in much better condition. They all came in looking for pickings from Baku, and they were not disappointed. One of the first things they did was to begin to load the oil for transport into Russia. A Britisher who used to be a manager for an oil company in Baku and whose Tartar workmen would not let him be arrested, told me that there were about 300 million poods of oil in Baku when the Bolsheviks came. A pood is 36 pounds. The Bolsheviks have been shipping it out at the rate of 12,000 poods a day. They also sent out flour to Astrakhan, and they and the soldiers who came after them proceeded to live upon the country. They paid for most of what they requisitioned, but at the same time, prices began to soar. That won't do, said the Bolsheviks. We must have plenty of food, and the prices must remain low. So they fixed prices, with the result that the shopkeepers said they were out of everything, and began to hoard and to sell privately to those who would pay what they asked. For the first few days, however, all went smoothly on the surface. There was no ceiling that we could see. I heard from several sources that a Russian woman who had been robbed of her diamonds and silver one afternoon had them returned to her next morning. We were told that all departments were working serenely, 
that the Tartars and Russians were getting on beautifully, and also that the Turkish committee in town was working hand in hand with the others. Russians, Tartars, and Turks, we were told, had the right proportion of representation on the committees. True, all the Polish mission were in jail. All the British officers and soldiers and sailors, and some British politicals, numbering about forty-five, all the French politicals and a couple of civilians, seven in all, some Georgians and Armenians, and, as we learned later, a good many Russians and Tartars. During the first two or three days, little attention was paid to the needs of the prisoners. They had almost no food, no tobacco, no water for washing, no razors. But soon they were allowed to buy food from outside. Vendors came in to them twice a week, and twice a day they were allowed to go into the courtyard for exercise. Their quarters were crowded and uncomfortable, and the British were not allowed to receive visitors. The Russians, we were told, would have been willing to allow the British and French to stay in their own quarters on parole, but the Turks wanted them kept in jail for exchange for the Turkish prisoners the British and French had taken. As to the foreigners who were not locked up, a handful of Americans, Hollanders, Swiss, and British, thirty-odd French and many Georgians and Persians, we soon saw that they were not going to be allowed to leave immediately. We were told first that the trains were not running, then that they were running only to Elizabeth Paul, and then that the Bolsheviks were fighting with the Georgians and that our lives would be endangered if we tried to leave. We must wait two or three days. Personally, I would rather have risked the bullets. I know what frontline experience is, and I prefer it to what I had in Baku, but I was not consulted as to my movements. It all looked better than it was because the Bolsheviks were not killing people in the streets and robbing frankly, as they had done in the beginning all over Russia. The good side of their program was insisted on. Education for everybody, food and work for everybody, special care for the children. There were people I talked to in Baku who actually believed that Utopia had arrived. There were other people who were skeptical from the outset people who had something to lose. The simple householder began to have his faith shaken by the way the Bolsheviks requisitioned rooms and goods. Two American automobiles were taken the very first day. Two more were unloaded from the train, which, by their make, I think belonged to Mr. John Caldwell, the American minister at Tehran. He used to talk of those cars as much as I did about my rugs. Two carloads of American medical supplies vanished into space. I myself saw tons and tons of American cotton piled on a ship in the harbor. But to the simple householder, what brought it all home was this. A commanding ring would come at the door, and the women folk would shudder or scream, because perhaps the man of the family was to be arrested. Someone would go to the door, and the Bolshevik official, armed with a requisition order, and accompanied by several friends, would enter and demand to look at the house or apartment. He would have to be told how many residents were in the place, but I never observed that the number of residents had anything to do with the number of rooms he took. He merely selected what he thought he'd like, and the family was permitted to have the rest. End of Part 1 of Bumping into the Bolshevist by Maud Radford Warren Read by Mary in Arkansas Bumping into the Bolshevist Part 2 by Maud Radford Warren Saturday Evening Post September 18, 1920 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bumping into the Bolshevist, Part 2 Eight Moves in Seven Weeks At first soldiers were quartered in houses, but later it was thought wiser to put them all in barracks. We heard that the Tartars had killed some of them, 
also that they were better controlled in barracks. Their coming and going made little difference to us. They seemed to tramp about and play the mandolin and sing all night. But sleep isn't companion to many people in Baku, it seems. Householders go to bed at two or three or four, servants get up at five-thirty, and they all yell in loud, clear yells, undeterred by the emotions of people who fain would sleep. Even after the soldiers were put in barracks, so many Russian official men and women kept arriving from Moscow and the north, and so many committees demanded offices, that more and more rooms were constantly being requisitioned. In seven weeks I had to move eight times. Sometimes I would be in a place where there was a Bolshevik officer important enough to keep us undisturbed for a week or two. But sooner or later I always had to go, because a Bolshevik wanted either the whole place or the little corner in which I slept. At that I mostly slept in an angle of the dining room, or else in a closet or a corridor, and if I hadn't carried my own bed along, I should have had to sleep on the floor. But I was only a temporary sojourner. I was not one of the unhappy people who had to watch my things being taken in the name of the state. The last time I moved, I was boarding with a Russian woman who, in her flat of six rooms and a closet and a kitchen, was sheltering fifteen of us. At three o'clock one afternoon, a committee of members from the Testovica came walking in the back way without knocking. I heard them coming in time to hide my typewriter. The Bolsheviks liked typewriters. They stared at the lofty rooms, and then the leader said, Yes, we like this building very much. We are going to take the whole place. You may leave these two leather sofas and this chair. You must be out by eleven o'clock tomorrow morning. Anything that is left after that hour, we shall consider as our property. Let any woman imagine what that moving meant. Six sets of people, numbering from ten to fifteen in each, were to move by the next morning, and with only one staircase down which to move. As time went on, the requisitioning became bolder. I believe that very often the requisition orders were fakes, proffered by some Bolshevik who wanted to acquire better rooms than he had, and perhaps a little personal property. At one time I lived opposite an apartment that was vacant. First one Bolshevik officer appeared with a simple tent bed in one of the three front rooms. But before a fortnight had passed, those three bare rooms were crowded with beautiful furniture and filled with officers lolling on couches. Sometimes short-haired young women came in and lolled also. That was the only vaudeville I had. That apartment and its air of opulence and pleasure and youth and ruthlessness. I often used to see choice pieces of furniture transferred by Bolshevik soldiers from one spot to another. Astute and thrifty Bolsheviks, I believed, made quite a lot of money stealing and selling in Baku. It was hard on the Azerbaijan people, all that tyranny. Executions in Baku One day, late in April, I was dining with an Armenian family. The husband had been an engineer in the employ of the English. As we sat at table, a crowd of Bolshevists came to search his house. It was the third time it had been searched in a week, first by an Armenian committee, then a Russian, and at the moment by a Tartar. The committee looked for arms and for shoes, but found none. Then the husband was arrested. "'We're going to kill your papa,' said one Tartar by way of a jest to a ten-year-old child. "'Madam,' said the infant, turning to me, "'it is only what we expect from the Tartars. "'Not so bad for a child under fire, so to speak.' When the father was let off, the mother began to collect papers she feared might be incriminating, and the ten-year-old began to tap the panels to find a good hiding place. I can't begin to describe the suppressed suffering in the face of the mother as she looked at her six children and sorted papers and tried to think what she had better burn and what save. This was only one of the families to which such things were happening. 
Meanwhile, the political balance had shifted considerably in Baku. The Turks and Tartars who had been told that they would have power found that, as more and more Bolshevik soldiers poured in, their power was restricted. One little concrete instance I saw. There were some 200 automobile tires belonging to the English that the Turkish committee thought they'd like and took. The Russian committee demanded them and went after them in an armored car. That same day I saw several different groups of Tartars under heavy guard being marched off to prison. Then we heard that the Czechoslovakia, mostly composed of Russians and Jews, were drunk with power and were not working hand in hand with a revolutionary committee. Always when the Bolsheviks take over a bit of territory, they put in first a revolutionary committee and a Czechoslovakia. The revolutionary committee is composed of men from Moscow or some other organized Bolshevik spot and whatever local people the Bolsheviks can count on. Its function is to rule the new territory until the councils can be elected of workmen, soldiers, and peasants who will then take over the civil government. But side by side with this committee is supposed to work the Czechoslovakia, the committee for the purpose of quelling counter-revolution speculation and such crimes. In short, it is a police and spy system with more power than any other police system in the world. Far from working hand in hand with a revolutionary committee, it does just as it pleases. The Czechoslovakia in Baku was composed almost entirely of men and women from Moscow and Astrakhan. I know of one girl on it, age 17. Think of a child of 17 having a vote for the life or death of a prisoner. From the very beginning, this committee busied itself with arrest and courts martial, and early in May it began its sentences of death. I remember one Friday dining with some Armenians and being told a story of a friend of theirs, a Madame Zeman, whose husband was in prison. She had not been allowed to see him, but she had taken his dinner each day to the prison, and it had been accepted. Two days before, the dinner had been refused, and she had been told that he was not in prison. She had been directed to the two other prisons, and had at last been told that he was dead. It appeared that twenty-one prisoners had been taken out at two in the morning and shot. Three days after this incident, there appeared in the Bolshevik Communist an account of the execution of twenty-one men. Upon this the workmen, Russians and Tartars both, raised a great protest. They said they did not want any executions, that they wanted the world to understand that Bolshevism was not a brutal force. They were not alone in their reluctance. Two members of the Czechoslovakia had been removed for objecting to the sentence of death. A few days after that, the paper had a detailed account of the anti-Bolshevik history of the men that had been executed, stating that each of them was either a Russian officer who had been instrumental in executing Bolsheviks, or else a man who had speculated in the food of the people. About this time I saw eleven Tartars being carried off to jail under very heavy guard. One of these was a dark, vivid man who walked with his head up and his hands in his pocket. He was Glyakus, a Crimean Tartar, late governor-general of the city of Baku. I had a chill as I looked at him, for he went like a brave man who knew he was meeting death. A very few days later his execution and a statement of the charge against him were announced in the paper. Two years before a Bolshevik under arrest had been dragged away by the anti-Bolsheviks and killed. If Glyakus had not connived at this, he had looked through his fingers when it was done. For that he had to die. I am told that he was practically dead when they shot him. When he went into the court-martial, he said, I know you are going to have me shot, and so I am going to tell you what I think of you. He spoke his mind. They beat him terribly, I am told, as they took him to the place of execution. I know that his wife went four times to see Naramanov to beg for his body. She did not receive it. We heard that the bodies of those executed in that group were thrown into the Caspian. 
The Tartars muttered over this execution. Just afterwards an announcement appeared in the paper to the effect that it was decided that for the peace of the Soviet, thereafter no announcement would be made of executions. Russians whom I know, Armenians, Georgians, and Tartars, told me that night after night executions took place, that they would go to the prisons to take food to their friends, only to be told that their friends were not there. To be not there meant to be nowhere in this world. Bitter comment was made that the prisons were so overcrowded that shooting the old prisoners was the only method of making room for the fresh arrest. A Tartar Uprising About this time, toward mid-May, we got rumors of the state of matters at Elizabeth Pole. I have just been talking to an Englishman who has escaped from that city and have learned the facts from him. There were two parties among the Tartars of the city, one pro-ally, Menshevist, who followed Khan Kohiski, the other anti-ally. Those Elizabeth Pole Tartars were not especially friendly to the Baku Tartars, but they preferred Tartars to Christians, and they were incensed at having Bolsheviks and Christians in power in their city, and were also enraged at the rumors that seeped in of the execution of Tartars in Baku. They determined to rise against the Bolsheviks. Perhaps their rising was not well enough organized. Perhaps some firebrands began too soon. In any case, the Tartars did not have enough arms, ammunition, and men to win out, and they occupied a very poor position. They and their houses were in the center of the town, and on both sides were heights. The Russians got 5,000 German colonists and a few thousand Armenians to side with them. They put these men on one side to bombard the Tartars, and they themselves bombarded from the other. For six days the fight went on. By that time ten thousand Tartars were killed. Men, women, and children, and their homes were wiped flat. Some four thousand Russians, Armenians, and Germans were killed. Those are the most moderate figures that have been given to me, yet they may be exaggerated. What cannot be exaggerated is the bitterness of the Tartars. They believe, and most of us who know the history here believe with them, that if the Armenians and Germans had combined with them, they could have taken Elizabeth Pole, and after that Baku, and driven the Bolsheviks out of Azerbaijan. They say that they will make the Armenians pay for this some day. I do not know whether they will leave the German colonists out of the reckoning or not. They fought as hard on the other side as did the Armenians. When the rumors of all this reached Baku, the city fairly seethed with excitement. Every day as we sat on the boulevard or walked through the streets, we saw Tartars under arrest being taken to prison. We heard the Tartar workmen in this and that spot had risen. One morning I went into a little Tartar shop where I used to buy sugar, if no Bolsheviks were there. If Bolsheviks were present, I bought nuts, which the Tartars were selling at the regulation price. Sugar was worth its weight in silver almost. The Tartar and I were by this time quite good friends, had expressed our views about having Bolsheviks ruling us, and had found other points in common. At the moment a Bolshevik was in the shop writing a letter. The Tartar was attentive to him in a blankly polite way. He made a gesture to wait. The Bolshevik seemed determined that he would sit me out, and not wanting to rouse his suspicions, I walked round the block and did not return until I saw him leave. When I re-entered, the Tartar said, Khanum, there will be a Tartar uprising here. I cannot tell you when, perhaps three days, perhaps seven, but it will come. When it does, you will not be safe in a Russian house or an Armenian house or anywhere but in a Tartar house. Come here and I will keep you safe. Come in every morning and every night and I will let you know in time. We really believed that a Tartar rising was certain, and those of us who wanted to get away looked on it as a sort of hope. The Bolsheviks feared it too, as the arrests showed. They used more force than before. One night, for example, a barrage was set across the streets, 
and every man was asked to show his papers and passports. But if they used more force, they also began to smooth down the Tartars with a velvet glove. For example, military law was relaxed, to the extent of allowing people to stay on the streets till twelve instead of nine. Further, the shopkeepers were permitted openly to charge what prices they liked. Tartars were given more power in the commissars, and they were told that no more Tartars would be executed. At the same time, doubtless to be on the safe side, two Tartar regiments were sent to fight the Poles. Their arms were taken away from them, and when they protested, they were told that they would be given others at the front. I am also informed that the Tartar artillery were summoned for a grand view by the commanding general. They were put through all their field day motions, and they and their guns brought up at last in Liberty Square, the largest open place in Baku. They were patted and praised, and then they were told to leave their equipment behind them and go away. During all this time the Chesfokia arrogated to itself more and more power, and the real influence of the Revolutionary Committee became increasingly restricted. The Commissar for Foreign Affairs, a Tartar named Hilsenov, acted as temporary head of the Revolutionary Committee until early in May Dr. Narimanov came down from Moscow. Narimanov is a Baku Tartar, a schoolmaster, a scholar, and from all I hear, an honest man, and one much beloved by all those who know him. In college he was always the leader of his classes by virtue of his personality, and that though he was poor and not a Christian. I saw him enter Baku and saw the tremendous reception he received as he rode down Telegraph Street, a dark, weary, sick-looking man. On that morning one would have said his power in Baku was supreme, and yet today he has nothing like so much real power as the Astrakhan sailor who is at the head of the Czechoslovakia. Another powerful institution which deserves mention here is the Propaganda Bureau. There is one for the civil population and one for the army. There are not only the two newspapers I mentioned and the news and picture posters for the people at large, but there is also a newspaper intended for the soldiers called Red War. For two years now, experts have been working on the propaganda machinery. Every time a new Soviet is established, the Propaganda Bureau springs up, along with the Revolutionary Committee and the Czechoslovakia, and presently some experts come down from Moscow to help or guide. It is due to the weapon of propaganda that Baku was taken with practically no bloodshed. The propagandists are only a little less powerful than the members of the Czechoslovakia. In all these bodies and in all the commissar, Jews are to be found in important positions. The reason is that educated Russians, members of the late bourgeois, are keeping out of sight and hoping that they are out of the mind of the Bolshevist. Most of the soldiers and workmen are incapable of leadership, so the Jews are having their day. Let them, both Russians and Tartars have said to me, our turn against them will come later on. Lovely world just now. The Czechoslovakia have the most power in Azerbaijan and in all of Bolshevik Russia, not only because they are the police force and the life and death force, but because they are the real communist. It is the communist who really count wherever they are. The army merely does the fighting. Every high officer has a sort of spy commissar over him. This is well known, recognized by both parties to the bargain. One time at a dinner party at the Tomaniances, a colonel and his spy were both guests. It is practically impossible for a high officer to get a chance at graft. He is so closely watched by his trusted spy. The Bolshevists remember what the old Russian officers used to do with them, and they are taking no chances. Indeed, many of their present officers were formerly with Denikin's forces. I saw something of a Bolshevik colonel who was a guest of the large-hearted Tomanians. He told me that he had been in training for the army practically since his eighth year. Then you were in the old army? I asked. 
He shrugged his shoulders and answered the question I did not ask. Swept by the Red Sea Madam, I have a wife and children. I have not seen them for six years. I did not want them to starve, nor to starve myself. This is the first home I have lived in for six years, the first decent food I have had for a long time. My pay, it is nothing. But my wife and children are coming here next month. We shall be together again. At another time I was talking to a Bolshevik doctor and questioning him as to some of the Bolshevik Soviet administration theories. His answer seemed very vague, and I suppose my amused look told him what I thought, for he laughed and said, Madam, how can you expect me to know all this? I have only been a Bolshevik for a month. You were taken prisoner then? I was a prisoner for just one day. I was with Ninikin's army, was taken, and was locked up. They found out that I was a doctor. What, you are a doctor, they said? Yes, I said. From now on, they said, you are also a Bolshevik. Go there. And so I went where they said, and, as you see, I am a Bolshevik. And sincere? I asked. He shrugged his shoulders with a whimsical smile. I suppose he was about as sincere as some of my Armenian and Russian acquaintances, who put up red flags. He went with the tide. If you are a Bolshevik, you are sure of a certain amount of food, and if you are not, you are in danger of starving. I should think that perhaps ten or twelve percent of the people who are now calling themselves Bolsheviks are communist. The workmen are more sincerely so than the soldiers. This is what we think, a soldier said to me. We think that the Red Army is the only real army in the world. It is not fighting a trade war for class against class, for capitalists of one country against capitalists of another. It is fighting for the good of just one nation. We didn't like the old Russia and the old army, and we are getting a new country and a new government and a new army. I cannot tell you whether or not this Soviet government will last, but whatever comes out of it will be better than what we had. Never again can our officers treat us as they used to. We don't like fighting this long time, not at all. While we are fighting, perhaps some other soldier or workman is robbing our homes. But we soldiers consider it our duty to fight on till one thing is accomplished. And what is that, till all the world turns Soviet? No, madam. Our leaders may hope for that, but that is not what the soldiers intend. We intend to fight until the frontiers of Russia are exactly what they were in 1914. Until we have all the Caucasus, all Russia again, then we are going home. The workmen to whom I talked had a good deal to say about communism and equality, about the elimination of the bourgeois and the brotherhood of man. Among them I found the same sort of thing that I imagine prevails in the higher committees, a combination of idealists and grafters, each bent on their own aims. Those two have never in the world's history managed to work in unity. The idealists are outnumbered and outmaneuvered. As to the peasants, if there was one in Azerbaijan, I couldn't find him. From what men who came from the north told me, the peasants in Russia are not responding to the demands of the Soviet. Results of Bolshevik Rule I am told by Bolshevists that the peasants are short-sighted. The government says to them, Raise wheat for us. You may have a pound of bread a day for yourself and each of your children. Give the rest to us. We shall let you have cloth and boots. The cloth and boots are not forthcoming, and the simple peasant does not see that this is because there are no cloth and boots in Russia. He says to himself, Why should I work hard and give away so much and get nothing back? I will raise only the amount necessary to support my family. I will wait. The longer one waits in Bolshevik Russia, the worst living conditions tend to become. I have a friend in Baku, 
an English woman married to an Armenian, who has recently spent a year and a half in the Volga, which has been Bolshevik for a couple of years. She was allowed a pound of bread a day each for the members of her family, and later half a pound, a pound of meat a week each, and about the same amount of rice. Tea was 3,000 rubles a pound. Butter and milk were not to be had. Eight of them slept in two rooms on the floor. The Bolsheviks took away their beds, saying it was time for them to suffer a little hardship. When my friend wanted a brush or a packet of needles, she had to stand in line two or three hours for a permit to buy it, and then stand in line again for th two or three hours to get into the shop for it. No account is taken of the hardships which diminish the working capacity of a person. In Baku, when I left, things had not yet come to that pass. True, one could not buy drugs without a doctor's prescription. True, again, many of the shops had closed. A good many things that I needed I could not have because they weren't in stock. But what is the state now in the Volga will certainly be the state sometime in Azerbaijan, especially if the Bolsheviks should take Georgia. At present, Georgia is the one place where the Bolsheviks can trade freely. If other countries conclude commercial treaties with Russia, there will be no commercial reason why Georgia should not be taken. But if Russia is commercially blockaded, then an independent Georgia will be necessary for the life of Azerbaijan and perhaps of all Russia. While this history was slowly working itself out, we foreigners not in jail sat hoping against hope that we would be allowed to go out of Azerbaijan and into Georgia in the course of a few days. We knew the Bolsheviks had let the members of the Italian mission through, and we saw no reason why we shouldn't go. The excuse given us for postponing our departure was that fighting was going on with Georgia, and we might get hurt. I suppose another reason was that we had too much information that might have been useful to Georgia, such as that there were something like 50,000 Bolshevik soldiers in Azerbaijan, and that all sorts of recruiting was going on, and that the Tartar population was discontented. We did all we could, which was mostly to wait. A businessman from Holland, who also acted as Dutch consul, constituted himself the representative of the foreigners in Baku, sent telegrams to Colonel Haskell, Allied High Commissioner for Armenia and the head of the relief work in the Caucasus, and also telegraphed to our American consul and to the Georgian Minister for Foreign Affairs, asking for a train to be sent for us and that negotiations should be entered into to get us away. He also, from the first day or two of the occupation, spent his own money to buy food for the English and French prisoners. He expects to get it back, but that does not alter the fact that he had and carried out this idea of service. Another good citizen was a French woman, Mademoiselle Therese, who was a sort of assistant to the proprietor of the Hotel de Europe. When this hotel was requisitioned, she asked to stay on and do the housekeeping. This was granted. In addition, she took to herself the work of getting the meals for the seven French prisoners. I have seen her daily standing in front of the prison, waiting her turn to get in. They paid for the food, but she got it for them cheaply, and it was good. A brave little person, faithful and cheery. While Mr. Manison was taking charge of our affairs at the Baku end, Colonel John Haskell, High Commissioner for Armenia, was doing all that could be done from the Tiflis end, proposing to take away not only the Americans, but all the foreigners on a special train to be sent to the Georgian border, the Bolsheviks guaranteeing our safety to the edge of their territory. Being a man not only of force but also of resource, Colonel Haskell was not content merely to send telegrams through the usual channels. He and his assistant, Captain Kine, even tried to get messages through the front by means of soldier messengers and doubtless bakshish. I am told that when Narimanov received Colonel Haskell's most detailed telegram, he tore it across and said he had no time or inclination for dealing with imperialists. I wonder if we were ever called imperialists before. 
dreary weeks of waiting. Mr. Manison took charge of our affairs till the end of May, when Narimanov informed him that he could look after the Dutch interest only. Another American, whose home is in Batum, Mr. Van L., worked hard to try to figure out ways of departure and to get us all permits. The Americans consisted of two men who had been connected with the oil fields, Mr. S., the assistant, in the relief work, Captain C., born in New York but over here on a Canadian passport, Mr. Van L., and myself. The three first mentioned were not in such a hurry, apparently, to leave, as Mr. Van L., Captain C., and I were. Day after day we sat on the boulevard and listened to rumors, while Mr. Van L. reported what progress we had been able to make in getting away. From the moment we were sure that what would affect our plans was the relations of Azerbaijan and Georgia, we watched eagerly for news of the peace, or at least of the armistice. Our suspense and unhappiness aren't history, and do not matter, so I won't trouble you with an account of our ups and downs. Suffice to say that three different times we were told that there was an armistice, and that we could probably go in two or three days. Twice we were told that peace negotiations were broken off, and that war was on again. All the time the wildest rumors sifted in and out. The Georgians had marched as far as Elizabeth Paul. The English were coming to help the Georgians and were as far as Tiflis. The British were leaving Baghdad and getting out of Persia. The Tartars had poisoned the water supply in Baku. The Poles had taken Moscow. Mustafa Kemal was a hundred versts away and was coming to join the Tartars and pitch out the Bolsheviks. We heard so often the first peace terms that Georgia proposed that perhaps there is something in them. That Azerbaijan should compensate the families of the 800 Georgians that had been killed and wounded in the recent fighting that Azerbaijan should hand over a gift of a million poods of oil, with more later, that Azerbaijan should yield to Georgia the disputed territory, and that the Bolsheviks should withdraw from Azerbaijan all their troops except two regiments. It was probably because of that last requirement that the first series of negotiations were broken off and the Bolshevik delegates came home. But they met again with the Georgian delegates, and we were told that it was because Lenin sent word that he would not let Azerbaijan have another soldier, and that the Azerbaijan Soviet must finish its job by itself. I said I would not trouble you with our miseries in Baku, but those dreary weeks taught me an acute sympathy with prisoners. I had felt full sympathy with refugees from northern France and Belgium who had been treated far worse by the Germans than the Bolsheviks treated us but I don't believe I have been quite sorry enough for criminals. It is a terrible thing not to be free, no matter what one's criminal record is. If I ever get back the twenty pounds I lost while in Baku and feel like a real human being again, I'm going to interest myself in fresh air and exercise grounds and amusements for prisoners. I was pretty nearly a jailbird myself. I used to think of them every day as I sat on the boulevard and looked over in the direction of my loft, where the English were kept, and Nargen, where the Russian political prisoners were kept, especially the officers of Dinikin's army, who had not signed up for work when the Bolsheviks entered Baku. Constantinople at last. So many sights we saw there on the boulevard, the first English sailors taken off a ship and led to jail armored cars rushing by, squads of Tartar prisoners after the Tartar discontent. Three ships swung about to command the town, lying end to end with their guns pointed on us. Sometimes for a change I would walk up to Liberty Square and watch the new soldiers drilling, and awkward enough they were. The new ones wore whatever clothes they had, but the regulars were all put into the thousands of uniforms which the Azerbaijan army had brought from the Italians and which the Bolsheviks had requisitioned. The soldiers were very much pleased with these new clothes. They said it was the first time they had ever had anything together. Generally, they got a jacket in January, 
and trousers in June, warm clothes when it was summertime, and a cotton shirt in December. It was just as well they had new clothes to be contented with, because they had not been paid for some time, and they were not allowed to drink. Wherever we walked down the streets, we saw military sights. Not only the cavalrymen jingling by, and everywhere squads of soldiers marching and singing, but courtyards full of horses or machine guns or supply wagons or automobiles. The Bolsheviks certainly managed to accumulate property in the name of the state. The place I liked best was a little green square opposite the house of the Tamanianses, where the mothers and nurses used to come, and where there were marigolds and asters, such as I know in a garden at home, and where birds sang louder almost than the Bolsheviks singing. I wasn't always alone there. People who could speak English or French or German used to drop in to talk with me. There was a servant I met on one of the first days after my arrival in Baku. Then she was jubilant and said that now commissars would come every week to see that her mistress was treating her well. Now she would get back a little of her own. She was equally jubilant a week or two later when the Bolsheviks ordered that 80% increase should be given to workmen and that this pay should date back from the autumn. But a day or two before I left, she confessed her disappointment. What is the use of more wages, she said, when the prices have jumped up so far beyond the increase of wages? What we hoped for has not happened. As the poet says, this is the old woe of the world. But in this garden, usually no one told me his troubles, and I could watch the children and think of the younglings at home that I love and wonder why people ever dare to take for granted safety and food and shelter and the right to spend money if you have it. I think I used to have thoughts like this during the war, but after the armistice I forgot them. I used to watch the Bolsheviks making their Soviet. So long as human nature remains what it is, the average man will never go to the lengths of agreeing to communism. I used to hear it discussed in this garden, along with other dreams. It is the only place I care to remember in Baku. If ever anything seems like bad luck to me again, I'll remember that boulevard with its scant shade and the blue blazing sea with the battleships trained on it, and the scores of interred people sitting around waiting for news, and Mr. Van L., his face full of gloom as he thought of his sick, brave little wife in Batum, and the armored cars rushing by, and the freshly arrested prisoners being taken to jail. That will make any temporary ill luck seem agreeable pastime. It's behind us now. Of a sudden, peace was signed, and we were able to use the permits which had been delayed on this and that pretext. Mr. Van L., Captain C., and I got away, along with a Georgian, Mr. and Mrs. Tomianitz, and a Russian woman married to an American. At the border they took away my beautiful rugs, despite the fact that I had proof that they were not bought in Baku. They also, I discovered, stole a small box full of amber beads, turquoises, and other more or less precious souvenirs. I am afraid my fellow countrymen were so engaged in saying, I told you so, about those rugs, that they did not have energy left to sympathize with my loss. I suppose the receipt I got is waste paper. I abandoned good clothes to be able to take those rugs, and if I mourn them, what must be the state of Russian people, who have lost everything to the Bolshevists? Property, friends, home, country for the Bolsheviks are not likely to evacuate Azerbaijan for some time to come. Peace with Georgia concluded. They are resting for the next move, which is to take Georgia wholesale and without bloodshed, as they took Baku. They are treading just now the ways of peace. They have released all the prisoners except the British, whom they have taken to a large and comfortable house outside Baku, belonging to the noble family. They have sent to Georgia 97 representatives and a group of propagandists, 
but every Bolshevist in Georgia is in himself a center for propaganda. Two days after the representatives arrived, Konkowski, the former president of Azerbaijan, was murdered. The American consul is moving to Batum, and British officials have told me that they believe it is only a question of weeks before Georgia becomes Soviet. The only danger in Baku is the Tartar rising, which is sure to come. Meantime, against it and the rest of Russia, they have excellent artillery and sufficient soldiers. Wrangel's army, I am told by people who have recently seen it and him, is competent, but it is small. Wrangel's agricultural expert, Aladdin, who struck me when I met him a dozen years ago, as a keen politician and an honest patriot, has evolved the plan of giving the land outright to the peasants. A good stroke which the Bolshevists, according to their theory of communism, could not use. My own opinion, after two months spent under the Bolshevist, is that the Soviet may prevail over most of Russia, until the people as a whole modify it into some workable scheme of democracy. Meanwhile, as I sympathize with the homeless Russians, I exult over the blessed United States, safe across some thousands of miles of sea and land, parked right there, with a real flag waving over it, and on it a sane population that won't stand for any length of time any real nonsense. With all its faults, our government is better than any other. I began this article on the edge of Georgia, in sight of the Bolshevist. I am ending it in Constantinople. Just half an hour ago, I was leaning on the rail, looking across at the Golden Horn and Stamboul, with its aspiring minarets, and looking down on little rowboats in which people had come out to welcome their friends. Suddenly a deep voice called, Where's the American lady? Someone telephoned us that there was an American on board. There was a khaki suit with a red triangle on the sleeve. There was a smiling young American YMCA man come out, as the YMCA here does, to welcome American sailors and merchant marine men and gathering in also anyone from home. He acted as if he had known me all my life and invited me to lean on him. I did, completely, glad to be taken care of after so many dreary weeks of looking after myself. What joy to hear him consigning further the boatman who had risen a hundred percent on the bargain he had made, and the lad had only been in Constantinople four days himself. He seemed to divine what would be good for me, took me up to the Sailors' Club, the YMCA has just started, led me through cream-colored walls and deep chintz-covered chairs, and passed tanned sailors to a cool seat by a green window. He ordered strawberries, the last of the season, and cherry pie and ice cream, and he set me down in front of the flag. I saluted it. It waves in several places over Constantinople, and no matter who's looking, I am going to salute it every time I pass under it. Thank God for the flag. End of Part 2 and End of Article Bumping into the Bolshevists by Maud Radford Warren Read by Mary in Arkansas The College Glee Club by Robert Alden Sanborn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The College Glee Club Two doors were not sufficient. They came through upon the stage like paste squeezed out of a tube. They spread, divided into clots, shifted, blocked each other, and suddenly appeared in the dignified array of two lines of youth in evening dress, lines slightly elliptical, with one focus, the leader, at the right end, toward which every face was turned. One or two, belated, hurried into places fussily. How absurdly boys bear the importance of conventional dress! Their breasts strain and bulge the crackling linen boards, 
their muscles swell and wrinkle the broadcloth. Others are loose, small, and inadequate inside the immaculate rigidity. They are growing before your eyes like the germinating seeds in the cinema picture, and one imprisons the laugh before it breaks. For if they guessed that their appearance caused your laughter, they would feel confused and hurt. But, and this is a protective contradiction peculiar to youth, if they did not guess, they would think that you were laughing with them, and laugh themselves. They know that they are funny because they feel funny. They do not know that they look funny. They are colossal, and the thin ice of conventionality is skimming their youth. Their singing was art in its primitive beginning, that is, it began in fun amongst themselves. It was art as pictured by a child, laughed at by its creator before displayed to the apprising eyes of experience, dabbed with meaningless blots and scratches of self-conscious vanity. Some of the voices were sweet, but there were as many more that laughed at the good ones by coming in a trifle too late, or too soon, or by shading the key. So youth kept its balance, ever sincere to itself, first, and that is right. There is something that youth respects and thus keeps in the procession. It respects leadership. Every face in the line was profiled obediently toward the leader, who, from the right end, nodded the tempo. So the lasting impression was of a frieze of stiff pink profiles and flat white shirt fronts, all as devotionally fixed as the heads in a Robia. Youth afraid to do the wrong thing is youth in flux, youth in action. The sheath of the chrysalis cracks from the struggle within. One amongst them, the third mandolin player, was almost out. Else why did he, without ceasing, wear that secret smile? I watched the smile tremble up from within and over the lips, while the brow, bent seriously over the instrument, lifted and the eyes looked out on life. So might a chicken smile foolishly over the fragments of its shell. End of The College Glee Club Francis Hodgson Burnett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in December 2021. Burnett, Mrs. Frances Hodgson, novelist, born in Manchester, England, 24th November 1849. She lived in Manchester until 1864, acquiring that familiarity with the Lancashire character and dialect which is so noticeable in her works of later years. Her parents suffered financial reverses in 1865. Her father died, and the family came to the United States. They settled in Knoxville, Tennessee, and afterwards moved to Newmarket, Tennessee. Mrs. Hodgson took a farm where her two sons and three daughters could work and earn their bread. Frances began to write short stories, the first of which was published in a Philadelphia magazine in 1867. She persevered and soon had a market for her work, Peterson's Magazine and Godey's Ladies' Book publishing many of her stories before she became famous. In 1872 she contributed to Scribner's Magazine a story in dialect, Surely Tim's Trouble, which scored an immediate success. Miss Hodgson became the wife of Dr. Lewin M. Burnett of Knoxville in 1873. They made a long tour in Europe, and, returning in 1875, made their home in Washington, D.C., where they now reside. Her famous story, That Lesso Lowry's, created a sensation as it was published serially in Scribner's magazine. It was issued in book form, New York 1877, and it found a wide sale, both in the United States and in Europe, running through many editions. On the stage, the dramatized story was received with equal favor. In 1878 and 1879, she republished some of her earlier stories, which had appeared in various magazines. 
Among those are Kathleen Mavernine, Lindsay's Luck, Miss Crespigny, Pretty Polly Pemberton, and Theo. These stories had appeared in a Philadelphia magazine, and had been published in book form, without her permission, by a house in that city, a proceeding which caused a controversy in public. Her plots were pilfered by dramatists, and all the evidence of popularity was showed upon her. Her later novels, Hayworth's, New York, 1879, Louisiana, New York, 1881, A Fair Barbarian, New York, 1882, and Through One Administration, New York, 1883, have confirmed her reputation. But her greatest success, on the whole, has been won by her Little Lord Fauntleroy, which first appeared as a serial in St. Nicholas in 1886. It was subsequently published in book form and was dramatized, appearing on the English and American stages with great success. Mrs. Burnett is very fond of society, but her health is too delicate to enable her to give time to both society and literary work. She has been a sufferer from nervous prostration, and since 1885 has not been a voluminous writer. She has published Sarah Crew, New York, 1888, Editha's Burglar, Boston, 1888, and Little St. Elizabeth, and other stories, New York, 1890. Mrs. Burnett is the mother of two sons, one of whom died at an early age. Despite her long residence abroad, she calls herself thoroughly American. End of Frances Hodgson Burnett United States, ex rail Mayo versus Satan and his staff. United States District Court, W.D., Pennsylvania, December 3, 1971. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. United States, X Rail, Mayo versus Satan and his staff. Memorandum Order, Weber, District Judge. Plaintiff alleging jurisdiction under 18 U.S.C. Section 241, 28 U.S.C. Section 1343, and 42 U.S.C. Section 1983 prays for leave to file a complaint for violation of his civil rights in forma pauperis he alleges that satan has on numerous occasions caused plaintiff misery and unwarranted threats against the will of plaintiff that satan has placed deliberate obstacles in his path and has caused plaintiff's downfall plaintiff alleges that by reason of these acts satan has deprived him of his constitutional rights we feel that the application to file and proceed in forma pauperis must be denied even if plaintiff's complaint reveals a prima facie recital of the infringement of the civil rights of a citizen of the united states the court has serious doubts that the complaint reveals a cause of action upon which relief can be granted by the court we question whether plaintiff may obtain personal jurisdiction over the defendant in this judicial district the complaint contains no allegation of residence in this district while the official reports disclose no case where this defendant has appeared as defendant there is an unofficial account of a trial in new hampshire where this defendant filed an action of mortgage foreclosure as plaintiff the defendant in that action was represented by the preeminent advocate of that day and raised the defense that the plaintiff was a foreign prince with no standing to sue in an american court this defense was overcome by overwhelming evidence to the contrary whether or not this would raise an estoppel in the present case we are unable to determine at this time 
if such action were to be allowed we would also face the question of whether it may be maintained as a class action it appears to meet the requirements of fed r of civ p 23 that the class is so numerous that joinder of all members is impracticable there are questions of law and fact common to the class and the claims of the representative party is typical of the claims of the class we cannot now determine if the representative party will fairly protect the interests of the class we note that the plaintiff has failed to include with his complaint the required form of instructions for the united states marshal for directions as to service of process for the foregoing reasons we must exercise our discretion to refuse the prayer of the plaintiff to proceed in forma pauperis. it is ordered that the complaint be given a miscellaneous docket number and leave to proceed in forma pauperis be denied the end of united states ex real mayo versus satan and his staff international peace by theodore roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. International Peace Address of Ex-President Roosevelt before the Nobel Peace Prize Committee at Christiana, Norway, May 5, 1910. It is with peculiar pleasure that I stand here today to express the deep appreciation I feel of the high honor conferred upon me by the presentation of the Nobel Peace Prize. The gold medal which formed part of the prize I shall always keep, and I shall hand it on to my children as a precious heirloom. The sum of money provided as part of the prize, by the wise generosity of the illustrious founder of this world-famous prize system, I did not, under the peculiar circumstances of the case, feel at liberty to keep. I think it eminently just and proper that in most cases, the recipient of the prize should keep for his own use the prize in its entirety. But in this case, while I did not act officially as President of the United States, it was nevertheless only because I was President that I was enabled to act at all. And I felt that the money must be considered as having been given me in trust for the United States. I therefore used it as a nucleus for a foundation to bring forward the cause of industrial peace, as being well within the general purpose of your committee. For in our complex industrial civilization of today, the peace of righteousness and justice, the only kind of peace worth having, is at least as necessary in the industrial world as it is among nations. There is at least as much need to curb the cruel greed and arrogance of part of the world of capital, to curb the cruel greed and violence of part of the world of labor, as to check a cruel and unhealthy militarism in international relationships. We must ever bear in mind that the great end in view is righteousness, justice as between man and man nation and nation the chance to lead our lives on a somewhat higher level with broader spirit of brotherly good will one for another peace is generally good in itself but it is never the highest good unless it comes as the handmaid of righteousness and it becomes a very evil thing if it serves merely as a mask for cowardice and sloth or as an instrument to further the ends of despotism or anarchy we despise and abhor the bully the brawler the oppressor whether in private or public life but we despise no less the coward and the voluptuary no man is worth calling a man who will not fight rather than submit to infamy or see those that are near to him suffer wrong no nation deserves to exist if it permits itself to lose the stern and virile virtues and this without regard to whether the losses do to the growth of a heartless and all-absorbing commercialism, to prolonged indulgence in luxury and soft, effortless ease, or to a deification of a warped and twisted sentimentality. Moreover, and above all, let us remember that words count only when they give expression to deeds, or are to be translated into them. 
the leaders of the red terror prattled of peace while they steeped their hands in the blood of the innocent and many a tyrant has called it peace when he has scourged honest protest into silence our words must be judged by our deeds and in striving for a lofty ideal we must use practical methods and if we cannot attain all in one leap we must advance toward it step by step reasonably content so long as we do actually make some progress in the right direction now having freely admitted the limitations to our work and the qualifications to be borne in mind i feel that i have the right to have my words taken seriously when i point out where in my judgment great advance can be made in the cause of international peace i speak as a practical man and whatever i now advocate i actually tried to do when i was for the time being the head of a great nation and keenly jealous of its honor and interest i ask other nations to do only what i should be glad to see my own nation do the advance can be made along several lines first of all there can be treaties of arbitration there are of course states so backward that a civilized community ought not to enter into an arbitration treaty with them at least until we have gone much further than at present in securing some kind of international police action but all really civilized communities should have effective arbitration treaties among themselves i believe that these treaties can cover almost all questions liable to arise between such nations if they are drawn with the explicit agreement that each contracting party will respect the other's territory and its absolute sovereignty within that territory and the equally explicit agreement that aside from the very rare cases where the nation's honor is vitally concerned all other possible subjects of controversy will be submitted to arbitration such a treaty would ensure peace unless one party deliberately violated it of course as yet there is no adequate safeguard against such deliberate violation but the establishment of a sufficient number of these treaties would go a long way toward creating a world opinion which would finally find expression in the provision of methods to forbid or punish any such violation secondly there is the further development of the hague tribunal of the work of the conferences and courts at the hague it has been well said that the first hague conference framed a magna carta for the nations it set before us an ideal which has already to some extent been realized and toward the full realization of which we can all steadily strive the second conference made further progress the third should do yet more meanwhile the american government has more than once tentatively suggested methods for completing the court of arbitral justice constituted at the second hague conference and for rendering it effective it is earnestly to be hoped that the various governments of europe working with those of america and asia shall set themselves seriously to the task of devising some method which shall accomplish this result if i may venture the suggestion it will be well for the statesmen of the world in planning for the erection of this world court to study what has been done in the united states by the supreme court i cannot help thinking that the constitution of the united states notably in the establishment of the supreme court and in the methods adopted for securing peace and good relations among and between the different states offer certain valuable analogies to what should be striven for in order to secure through the hague courts and conferences a species of world federation for international peace and justice there are of course fundamental differences between what the united states constitution does and what we should even attempt at this time to secure at the hague but the methods adopted in the american constitution to prevent hostilities between the states and to secure the supremacy of the federal court in certain classes of cases are well worth the study of those who seek at the hague to obtain the same results on a world scale in the third place something should be done as soon as possible to check the growth of armaments especially naval armaments by international agreement no one power could or should act by itself for it is eminently undesirable from the standpoint of the peace of righteousness that a power which really does believe in peace should place itself at the mercy of some rival which may at bottom have no such belief and no intention of acting on it but granted sincerity of purpose the great powers of the world should find no insurmountable difficulty in reaching an agreement which would put an end to the present costly and growing extravagance of expenditure on naval armaments 
an agreement merely to limit the size of ships would have been very useful a few years ago and would still be of use but the agreement should go much further finally it would be a masterstroke if those great powers honestly bent on peace would form a league of peace not only to keep the peace among themselves but to prevent by force if necessary its being broken by others the supreme difficulty in connection with developing the piecework of the hague arises from the lack of any executive power of any police power to enforce the decrees of the court in any community of any size the authority of the courts rests upon actual or potential force on the existence of a police or on the knowledge that the able-bodied men of the country are both ready and willing to see that the decrees of judicial and legislative bodies are put into effect in new and wild communities where there is violence an honest man must protect himself and until other means of securing his safety are devised it is both foolish and wicked to persuade him to surrender his arms while the men who are dangerous to the community retain theirs he should not renounce the right to protect himself by his own efforts until the community is so organized that it can effectively relieve the individual of the duty of putting down violence so it is with nations each nation must keep well prepared to defend itself until the establishment of some form of international police power competent and willing to prevent violence as between nations as things are now such power to command peace throughout the world could best be assured by some combination between those great nations which sincerely desire peace and have no thought themselves of committing aggressions the combination might at first be only to secure peace within certain definite limits and certain definite conditions but the ruler or statesman who should bring about such a combination would have earned his place in history for all time and his title to the gratitude of all mankind end of international peace by theodore roosevelt letters on landscape painting letter number three by asher durand 1796 to 1886 from the crayon january 31st 1855 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org letter number three if a truly fine picture could be produced with the same certainty as an ordinary steam engine specific directions might be given with a uniform result and it would appear that thousands of landscapes are produced on precisely similar grounds with even fewer claims to attributes of fine art although there are certain principles which constantly guide the hand of the true artist which can be defined classified and clearly understood and therefore communicable yet the whole history of art from the beginning does not present a single instance where a thorough and scientific knowledge of these principles has of itself been able to produce a truly great artist for the simple reason that such knowledge can never create the feeling which overrules all principles and gives the impress of true greatness i caution you therefore against reliance on any theoretical or technical directions which i or any one else may give in the course of your studies further than as means which you are to employ subject to your own feeling it has not been my intention in these letters to show you how to paint so much as what to paint to point out the distant object and erect an occasional guideboard on what seems to me the best path leading to it the means and modes of travel are already to be had at every roadside and better than i can furnish all that i might say on the various colors and mediums tools or what not necessary for your purpose including dissertations on design composition effect color and execution 
would only be a repetition of what has already been written and published throughout the land and which you can readily procure of the color man and the bookseller after all whatever valuable instructions they furnish their practical value must depend on your experience all that i would advise is this let materials be few and simple at first as you advance you will add what your feeling calls for much useful information may be obtained on all the subjects above mentioned and you may be enlightened in the elements of picturesqueness and other externals with which alone too many artists critics and connoisseurs are contented but those who can appreciate the higher attributes which make a picture a noble work of art will tell you that all the above named requisites may be very imperfectly employed and yet the picture may be truly fine and even great they will tell you that the difference consists in that which distinguishes the versifier from the poet and this is all it is essential to know that is a fine picture which at once takes possession of you draws you into it you traverse it breathe its atmosphere feel its sunshine and you repose in its shade without thinking of its design or execution effect or color these are after considerations there is poetry in such a landscape however humble it will be great in proportion as it declares the glory of god by a representation of his works and not of the works of man i appeal with due respect from the judgment of those who have yielded their noblest energies to the fascinations of the picturesque giving preference to scenes in which man supplants his creator whether in the gorgeous city of domes and palaces or in the mouldering ruins that testify of his ever-fading glory beautiful indeed and not without their moral but do they not belong more to the service of the tourist and historian than to that of the true landscape artist without further multiplying words you will perceive the purport of these observations there can be no dissent from the maxim that a knowledge of integral parts is essential for the construction of a whole that the alphabet must be understood before learning to spell and the meaning of words before being able to read not to admit this would be absurd yet many a young artist goes to work in the face of an equal absurdity filling a canvas just as an idle boy might fill a sheet of paper with unmeaning scrawls occasionally hitting the form of a letter and perhaps even a word so that the whole mass at a little distance may have the semblance of writing and so after he has wasted sufficient materials to have served by well-directed study to effect the attainment of the knowledge he lacks he feels this deficiency and goes back or more correctly speaking takes the first step forward and begins with his letters you have learned these letters and how to spell in the practice of drawing and you have found out the meaning of many words but there are yet many more with phrases and whole sentences to learn and this i myself feel in more than one sense while writing to you before you can write and entirely express your thoughts proceed then choosing the more simple foreground objects a fragment of rock or trunk of a tree choose them when distinctly marked by strong light and shade and thereby more readily comprehended do not first attempt foliage or banks of mingled earth and grass they are more difficult of imitation which as far as practicable should be your purpose paint and repaint 
until you are sure the work represents the model not that it merely resembles it this purpose that is the study of foreground objects is worthy whole years of labor the process will improve your judgment and develop your skill and perception thought and ingenuity will be in constant exercise thus you will not merely have observed in the rock the lines angles and texture and in the tree trunk the scoring or plainness of surface which respectively characterizes them but you will have acquired knowledge and skill applicable alike to every portion of the picture in producing such an imitation you will have learned to represent shape with solidity projection depression and relief nearness and distance the cooperation of color with form light and shade and above all you will have developed and strengthened your perception of the natural causes of all these results in the tree trunk for example and also in the rock though less simple and not as suitable for the present illustration you see the application of perspective and a demonstration of the law which governs the expression of space when the light strikes on the trunk of an oak on the side directly at right angles with your vision the scoring lines nearest the eye and towards the shadowed sides are strongest and sharpest graduating in distinctiveness from the center outward and each division of the bark diminishes proportionately light and color conform to these changes being most pure or positive in the nearest portions the lesson on the shape or rotundity of this object is not the only one you have the principle of that gradation in light and dark and color which begins at the foreground and extends to the horizon thus every truthful study of near and simple objects will qualify you for the more difficult and complex it is only thus you can learn to read the great book of nature to comprehend it and eventually transcribe from its pages and attach to the transcript your own commentaries there is the letter and the spirit in the true scripture of art the former being tributary to the latter but never overruling it all the technicalities above named are but the language and the rhetoric which expresses and enforces the doctrine not to be unworthily employed to embellish falsehood or ascribe meaning to vacuity as i have not proposed to teach you processes neither have i aimed at methodical arrangement or direction further than so much as appears indispensable to a right beginning i desire you to pursue the road pointed out with all consistent freedom from restraint adding only such restrictive and experimental advice as shall incidentally appear to me advantageous to you if you should have a predilection for color you will be most likely in your early stage of practice to give it undue importance to an extent that may impede your progress that is sacrifice higher qualities to its fascination i know no better safeguard to this liability than to remind you that a fine engraving gives all the greatest essentials of a fine picture and often a higher suggestiveness than the original it represents and so often a mere outline because the imagination fills in the rest according to our own ideas of truth in its completeness but for the present i would especially direct attention to the light and dark which make up the effect of the engraving being far more complete than the outline in short it lacks nothing but color which though mighty in its power is nothing more than the eloquence of nature employed for the fullest enforcement of her truth the great ideas are antecedent waste not your time therefore on broad sketches in color such only can be useful to the mature artist as suggestive rather than representative 
you had better look at all objects more with reference to light and dark than color but do not infer from this that i would depreciate the value of color for it is of inestimable value it is however a sort of humorsome sprite or good demon often whimsical and difficult of control at times exceedingly mischievous spoiling many a good picture as if with mere malicious intent but when experience shall have acquainted you with its tricks and its virtues you will understand better the worth of its service study then the light and dark of objects in connection with color keeping in mind as far as practicable the distinction i have indicated and as i have recommended first the practice of outline with the pencil so i would also enjoin the study of light and shade with pencil sepia or even charcoal any material you can best manage for this end i would not debar you in the meantime the luxury of painting but let your time be divided between the two nor will this course be lacking in interest and pleasure the same may be said in relation to confinement to foreground studies for a period as above advised for in the advanced state of practice in which i find myself and at an age when early attractions might be supposed to lose some portion of their freshness i feel no abatement in the interest of these pursuits and no amount of toil and fatigue can overbalance the benefits either in consideration of utility or enjoyment yours truly a b durand end of letter number three from letters on landscape painting by asher durand from the crayon january thirty first eighteen fifty five read for librivox by sue anderson Martinique by Encyclopedia Britannica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Martinique, an island of the West Indies, belonging to the chain of the Lesser Antilles and constituting a French colony between the British islands of Dominica and St. Lucia, 25 miles south of the one and 20 miles north of the other, about 14 degrees 40 minutes north, 61 degrees west. Its length is 40 miles, its greatest width 21 miles, and the area comprises 380 square miles. A cluster of volcanic mountains in the north, a similar group in the south, and a line of lower heights between them form the backbone of the island. Its deep ravines and precipitous escarpments are reduced in appearance to gentle undulations by the drapery of the forests. The massif of Mount Pele in the north is the culminating point of the island, 4,430 feet. That of Carbet is a little inferior, 3,963 feet, but the mountains in the south are much lower. Mont Pele is notorious for an appalling eruption in May 1902. Of the numerous streams which traverse the few miles of country between the watershed and the sea, the longest radiating from Mount Carbet, about 75 are of considerable size, and in the rainy season become deep and often destructive torrents. On the northwest and north the coast is elevated and bold, and similarly on the south, where a lateral range, branching from the backbone of the island, forms the blunt peninsula bounding the low-shored western bay of Fort de France on the south. Another peninsula, called Caravelle, projects from the middle part of the east coast, and south of the coast is low and fretted, with many islets and caves lying off it. Coral reefs occur especially in this locality. Plains, most numerous and extensive in the south, occupy about one-third of the total area of the island. The mean annual temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit in the coast region, the monthly mean for June being 83 degrees, and that for January, 77 degrees. Of the annual rainfall of 87 inches, August has the heaviest share, 11.3 inches, though the rainy season extends from June to October. March, the driest month, has 3.7. Martinique enjoys a marked immunity from hurricanes. The low coastal districts are not very healthy for Europeans in the hotter months, but there are numerous sanatoria in the forest region at an elevation of about 1,500 feet, where the average temperature is some 10 degrees Fahrenheit lower than that already quoted. The north winds which prevail from November to February are comparatively fresh and dry. Those from the south, July to October, are damp and warm. From March to June, easterly winds are prevalent. The population increased from 162,861 in 1878 
to 175,863 in 1888 and 203,781 in 1901. In 1902, the great eruption of Mont Pelee occurred, and in 1905, the population was only 182,000, 24. The bulk of the population consists of Creole Negroes and half-castes of various grades, ranging from the Sicatra, who has retained hardly any trace of Caucasian blood, to the so-called sang Malay, with only a suspicion of Negro commixture. The capital of the island is Fort de France, on the west coast bay of the same name, with a fine harbor defended by three forts and a population of 18,000. The other principal centers of population are, on the west coast, Le Menton, on the same bay as the capital, and on the east coast, Le François and Le Robert. The colony is administered by a governor and a general council, and returns a senator and two deputies. There are elective municipal councils. The chief product is sugar, and some coffee, cocoa, tobacco, and cotton are grown. The island is served by British, French, and American steamship lines, and local communications are carried on by small coasting steamers and by subsidized mail coaches, as there are excellent roads. In 1905, the total value of the exports, consisting mainly of sugar, rum, and cocoa, was 725,460 pounds. France taking by far the greater part, while imports were valued at 596,294 pounds, of which rather more than one half by value came from France, the United States of America being the next principal importing country. In 1903, the year following the eruption of Mont Pelee, exports were valued at 604,163 pounds. Martinique, the name of which may be derived from a native form, Madiana or Mantinino, was probably discovered by Columbus on the 15th of June, 1502 although by some authorities its discovery is placed in 1493. It was at that time inhabited by Caribs who had expelled or incorporated an older stock. It was not until the 25th of June, 1635, that possession was taken of the island and the name of the French Compagnie des Îles d'Amérique. Actual settlement was carried out in the same year by Pierre Bellon, Sieur des Nambouc, Captain General of the Island of St. Christopher. In 1637, his nephew, Diel du Barquet, died 1658, became captain general of the colony, now numbering 700 men, and subsequently obtained the seigneury of the island by purchase from the company under the authority of the King of France. In 1654, a welcome was given to 300 Jews expelled from Brazil, and by 1658, there were at least 5,000 people exclusive of the Caribs, who were soon after exterminated. Purchased by the French government from Duparquet's children for 120,000 livres, Martinique was assigned to the West India Company, but in 1674 it became part of the royal domain. The habitants, French landholders, at first devoted themselves to the cultivation of cotton and tobacco, but in 1650 sugar plantations were begun, and in 1723 the coffee plant was introduced. Slave labor having been introduced at an early period of the occupation, there were 60,000 blacks in the island by 1736. This slavery was abolished in 1860. Martinique had a full share of wars. In the early days, the Caribs were not brought under subjection without severe struggles. In 1666 and 1667, the island was attacked by the British without success, and hostilities were terminated by the Treaty of Breda. The Dutch made similar attempts in 1674, and the British again attacked the island in 1693. Captured by Rodney in 1762, Martinique was next year restored to the French, but after the conquest by Sir John Jervis and Sir Charles Grey in 1793, it was retained for eight years, and seized again in 1809, it was not surrendered till 1814. The island was the birthplace of the Empress Josephine. Martinique has suffered from occasional severe storms, as in 1767, when 1,600 persons perished, and Monsieur de la Pagerie, father of the Empress Josephine, was practically ruined, and in 1839, 1891, and 1903, when much damage was done to the sugar crop. Earthquakes have also been frequent, but the most terrible natural disaster was the eruption of Mont Pelee in 1902, by which the town of St. Pierre, formerly the chief commercial center of the island, was destroyed. During the earlier months of the year, various manifestations of volcanic activity had occurred. On the 25th of April, there was a heavy fall of ashes, and on the 2nd and 3rd of May, a heavy eruption destroyed extensive sugar plantations north of St. Pierre, and caused a loss of some 150 lives. A few days later, the news that the Soufriere in St. Vincent was in eruption reassured the inhabitants of St. Pierre, as it was supposed that this outbreak might relieve the volcano of Pele. But on the 8th of May, the final catastrophe came without warning. A mass of fire compared to a flaming whirlwind swept over St. Pierre, destroying the ships in the harbor, among which, however, one, the Rodham of Scruton, escaped. A fall of molten lava and ashes followed the flames, accompanied by dense gases which asphyxiated those who had thus far escaped. The total loss of life was estimated at 40,000. Consternation was caused not only in the West Indies, but in France and throughout the world, and at first it was seriously suggested that the island should be evacuated, 
but no countenance was lent to this proposal by the French government. Relief measures were undertaken and voluntary subscriptions raised. The material losses were estimated at four million pounds, but besides St. Pierre, only one-tenth of the island had been devastated, and although during July there was further volcanic activity, causing more destruction, the economic situation recovered more rapidly than was expected. End of Martinique by Encyclopedia Britannica Read by Tatiana Cicilla My Reminiscences by Rabindranath Tagore This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 1 my reminiscences i know not who paints the pictures on memory's canvas but whoever he may be what he is painting are pictures by which i mean that he is not there with his brush simply to make a faithful copy of all that is happening he takes in and leaves out according to his taste he makes many a big thing small and small thing big he has no compunction in putting into the background that which was to the fore, or bringing to the front, that which was behind. In short, he is painting pictures, and not writing history. Thus over life's outward aspect passes the series of events, and within is being painted a set of pictures. The two correspond, but are not one. We do not get the leisure to view thoroughly the studio within us. Portions of it now and then catch our eye, but the greater part remains out of sight, in the darkness. Why the ever-busy painter is painting, when he will have done, for what gallery his pictures are destined, who can tell? Some years ago, on being questioned as to the events of my past life, I had occasion to pry into this picture chamber. I had thought to be content with selecting some few materials for my life story. I then discovered, as I opened the door, that life's memories are not life's history, but the original work of an unseen artist. The variegated colours scattered about are not reflections of outside lights, but belong to the painter himself, and come passion-tinged from his heart, thereby unfitting the record on the canvas for use as evidence in a court of law. But though the attempt to gather precise history from memory's storehouse may be fruitless, there is a fascination in looking over the pictures, a fascination which cast its spell on me. The road over which we journey, the wayside shelter in which we pause, are not pictures while yet we travel. They are too necessary, too obvious. When, however, before turning into the evening rest house, we look back upon the cities, fields, rivers and hills which we have been through in life's morning, then in the light of the passing day, are they pictures indeed. Thus when my opportunity came, did I look back, and was engrossed. Was this interest aroused within me solely by a natural affection for my own past? Some personal feelings, of course, there must have been. But the pictures had also an independent artistic value of their own. There is no event in my reminiscences worthy of being preserved for all time. But the quality of the subject is not the only justification for a record. What one has truly felt, if only it can be made sensible to others, is always of importance to one's fellow men. If pictures which have taken shape in memory can be brought out in words, they are worth a place in literature. It is as literary material that I offer my memory pictures. To take them as an attempt at autobiography would be a mistake. In such a view, these reminiscences would appear useless as well as incomplete. 2. Teaching begins. We three boys were being brought up together. Both my companions were two years older than I. When they were placed under their tutor, my teaching also began. But of what I learnt, nothing remains in my memory. What constantly recurs to me is the rain patters, the leaf quivers, I am just come to anchor, after crossing the stormy region of the Korakala series, and I am reading The Rain Patters, The Leaf Quivers. For me the first poem of the arch-poet. Whenever the joy of that day comes back to me, even now, 
I realize why rhyme is so needful in poetry. Because of it, the words come to an end, and yet end not. The utterance is over, but not its ring. And the ear and the mind can go on and on with their game of tossing the rhyme to each other. Thus did the rain patter and the leaves quiver again and again, the livelong day in my consciousness. Another episode of this period of my early boyhood is held fast in my mind. We had an old cashier, Koilash by name, who was like one of the family. He was a great wit and would be constantly cracking jokes with everybody, old and young. Recently married sons-in-law, newcomers into the family circle being his special butts. There was room for the suspicion that his humour had not deserted him even after death. Once my elders were engaged in an attempt to start a postal service with the other world by means of a planchette. At one of the sittings, the pencil scrawled out the name of Koilash. He was asked as to the sort of life one led where he was. Not a bit of it, was the reply. Why should you get so cheap what I had to die to learn? This Koilash used to rattle off for my special delectation, a doggerel ballet of his own composition. The hero was myself, and there was a glowing anticipation of the arrival of a heroine. And as I listened, my interest would wax intense at the picture of this world-charming bride illuminating the lap of the future in which she sat enthroned. The list of the jewellery with which she was bedecked from head to foot, and the unheard of splendour of the preparations for the bridal, might have turned older and wiser heads. But what moved the boy and set wonderful joy pictures flitting before his vision was the rapid jingle of the frequent rhymes and the swing of the rhythm. These two literary delights still linger in my memory. And there is the other, the infant's classic. The rain falls pitter-pat, the tide comes up the river. The next thing I remember is the beginning of my school life. One day I saw my elder brother and my sister's son Shotto, also a little older than myself, starting off to school, leaving me behind, accounted unfit. I had never before ridden in a carriage, nor even been out of the house. So when Shotto came back, full of unduly glowing accounts of his adventures on the way, I felt I simply could not stay at home. Our tutor tried to dispel my illusion with sound advice and a resounding slap. You're crying to go to school now. You'll have to cry a lot more to be let off later on. I have no recollection of the name, features, or disposition of this tutor of ours, but the impression of his weighty advice and weightier hand has not yet faded. Never in my life have I heard a truer prophecy. My crying drove me prematurely into the Oriental Seminary. What I learnt there I have no idea, but one of its methods of punishment I still bear in mind. The boy who was unable to repeat his lessons was made to stand on a bench with arms extended, and on his upturned palms were piled a number of slates. It is for psychologists to debate how far this method is likely to conduce to a better grasp of things. I thus began my schooling at an extremely tender age. My initiation into literature had its origin, at the same time, in the books which were in vogue in the servants' quarters. Chief among these were a Bengali translation of Chanakya's aphorisms and the Ramayana of Krithivasa. A picture of one day's reading of the Ramayana comes clearly back to me. The day was a cloudy one. I was playing about in the long veranda, overlooking the road. All of a sudden, Shotto, for some reason I do not remember, wanted to frighten me by shouting, Policeman! Policeman! My ideas of the duties of policemen were of an extremely vague description. One thing I was certain about, that a person charged with crime, once placed in a policeman's hand, would, as sure as the wretch caught in a crocodile's serrugated grip, go under and be seen no more. Not knowing how an innocent boy could escape this relentless penal code, I bolted towards the inner apartments, with shudders running down my back for blind fear of pursuing policemen. I broke to my mother the news of my impending doom, but it did not seem to disturb her much. However, not deeming it safe to venture out again, I sat down on the sill of my mother's door to read the dog-eared Ramayana, with a marbled paper cover 
which belonged to her old aunt. Alongside stretched the veranda, running round the four sides of the open inner quadrangle, on which had fallen the faint afternoon glow of the clouded sky. And finding me weeping over one of its sorrowful situations, my great-aunt came and took away the book from me. 3. Within and Without Luxury was a thing almost unknown in the days of my infancy. The standard of living was then, as a whole, much more simple than it is now. Apart from that, the children of our household were entirely free from the fuss of being too much looked after. The fact is that, while the process of looking after may be an occasional treat for the guardians, to the children it is always an unmitigated nuisance. We used to be under the rule of the servants. To save themselves trouble, they had almost suppressed our right of free movement. But the freedom of not being petted made up even for the harshness of this bondage, for our minds were left clear of the toils of constant coddling, pampering and dressing up. Our food had nothing to do with delicacies. A list of our articles of clothing would only invite the modern boy's scorn. On no pretext did we wear socks or shoes till we had passed our tenth year. In the cold weather a second cotton tunic over the first one sufficed. It never entered our heads to consider ourselves ill off for that reason. It was only when old Niamath the tailor would forget to put a pocket into one of our tunics that we complained, for no boy has yet been born so poor as not to have the wherewithal to stuff his pockets. Nor by a merciful dispensation of providence is there much difference between the wealth of boys of rich and of poor parentage. We used to have a pair of slippers each, but not always where we had our feet. Our habit of kicking the slippers on ahead and catching them up again made them work none the less hard, through effectually defeating at every step the reason of their being. Our elders were in every way at a great distance from us, in their dress and food, living and doing, conversation and amusement. We caught glimpses of these, but they were beyond our reach. Elders have become cheap to modern children. They are too readily accessible, and so are all objects of desire. Nothing ever came so easily to us. Many a trivial thing was for us a rarity, and we lived mostly in the hope of attaining, when we were old enough, the things which the distant future held in trust for us. The result was that what little we did get, we enjoyed to the utmost. From skin to core, nothing was thrown away. The modern child of a well-to-do family nibbles at only half the things he gets. The greater part of his world is wasted on him. Our days were spent in the servants' quarters in the southeast corner of the outer apartments. One of our servants was Sham, a dark chubby boy with curly locks, hailing from the district of Khulna, he would put me into a selected spot and, tracing a chalk line all round, warn me with solemn face and uplifted finger of the perils of transgressing this ring. Whether the threatened danger was material or spiritual, I never fully understood, but a great fear used to possess me. I had read in the Ramayana of the tribulations of Sita for having left the ring drawn by Lakshman, so it was not possible for me to be sceptical of its potency. Just below the window of this room was a tank with a flight of masonry steps leading down into the water. On its west bank, along the garden wall, an immense banyan tree. To the south, a fringe of coconut palms, ringed round as I was near this window. I would spend the whole day peering through the drawn Venetian shutters, gazing and gazing on this scene, as on a picture book. From early morning our neighbours would drop in, one by one, to have their bath. I knew the time for each one to arrive. I was familiar with the peculiarities of each one's toilet. One would stop up his ears with his fingers as he took his regulation number of dips, after which he would depart. Another would not venture on a complete immersion, but be content with only squeezing his wet towel repeatedly over his head. A third would carefully drive the surface impurities away from him with a rapid play of his arms, and then on a sudden impulse take his plunge. There was one who jumped in from the top steps without any preliminaries at all. Another would walk slowly in, step by step, muttering his morning prayers the while. 
One was always in a hurry, hastening home as soon as he was through with his dip. Another was in no sort of hurry at all, taking his bath leisurely, followed with a good rub-down and a change from wet bathing clothes into clean ones, including a careful adjustment of the folds of his waistcloth, ending with a turn or two in the outer garden and the gathering of flowers with which he would finally saunter slowly homewards, radiating the cool comfort of his refreshed body as he went. This would go on till it was past noon. Then the bathing places would be deserted and become silent. Only the ducks remained, paddling about after water snails or busy preening their feathers the livelong day. When solitude thus reigned over the water, my whole attention would be drawn to the shadows under the banyan tree. Some of its aerial roots creeping down along its trunk had formed a dark complication of coils at its base. It seemed as if, into this mysterious region, the laws of the universe had not found entrance, as if some old-world dreamland had escaped the divine vigilance and lingered on into the light of modern day. Whom I used to see there, and what those beings did, it is not possible to express in intelligible language. It was about this banyan tree that I wrote later, with tangled roots hanging down from your branches, O oh, ancient banyan tree, you stand still day and night, like an ascetic at his penances. Do you ever remember the child whose fancy played with your shadows? Alas, that banyan tree is no more, nor the piece of water which served to mirror the majestic forest lord. Many of those who used to bathe there have also followed into oblivion the shade of the banyan tree. And that boy, grown older, is counting the alternations of light and darkness which penetrate the complexities with which the roots he has thrown off on all sides have encircled him. Going out of the house was forbidden to us. In fact, we had not even the freedom of all its parts. We perforce took our peeps at nature from behind the barriers. Beyond my reach there was this limitless thing called the outside, of which flashes and sounds and scents used momentarily to come and touch me through its interstices. It seemed to want to play with me through the bars with so many gestures, but it was free, and I was bound. There was no way of meeting. So the attraction was all the stronger. The chalk line has been wiped away today, but the confining ring is still there. The distant is just as distant. The outside is still beyond me, and I am reminded of the poem I wrote when I was older. The tame bird was in a cage, the free bird was in the forest. They met when the time came. It was a decree of fate. The free bird cries, O oh, my love, let us fly to wood. The cage bird whispers, Come hither, let us both live in the cage, says the free bird. Among bars, where is there room to spread one's wings? Alas, cries the cage bird, I should not know where to sit, perched in the sky. The parapets of our terraced roofs were higher than my head. When I had grown taller, when the tyranny of the servants had relaxed, when, with the coming of a newly married bride into the house, I had achieved some recognition as a companion of her leisure, then did I sometimes come up to the terrace in the middle of the day. By that time, everybody in the house would have finished their meal. There would be an interval in the business of the household. Over the inner apartment would rest the quiet of the midday siesta. The wet bathing clothes would be hanging over the parapets to dry. The crows would be picking at the leavings thrown on the refuse heap at the corner of the yard. In the solitude of that interval, the caged bird would, through the gaps in the parapet, commune bill to bill with the free bird. I would stand and gaze. My glance first falls on the row of coconut trees on the further edge of our inner garden. Through these are seen the Singhi's garden, with its cluster of huts and tank, and on the edge of the tank, the dairy of our milkwoman, Tara. Still further on, mixed up with the treetops, the various shapes and different heights of the terraced roofs of Calcutta, flashing back the blazing whiteness of the midday sun, stretch right away into the greyish blue of the eastern horizon. And some of these far distant dwellings 
from which stand forth their roofed stairways leading up to the terrace look as if with uplifted finger and a wink they are hinting to me of the mysteries of their interiors like the beggar at the palace door who imagines impossible treasures to be held in the strong rooms closed to him i can hardly tell of the wealth of play and freedom which these unknown dwellings seem to me crowded with from the furthest depth of the sky full of burning sunshine overhead the thin shrill cry of a kite reaches my ear and from the lane adjoining singhi's garden comes up past the houses silent in their noonday slumber the sing-song of the bangle seller chai churi chai and my whole being would fly away from the work-a-day world my father hardly ever stayed at home he was constantly roaming about his rooms on the third story used to remain shut up i would pass my hands through the venetian shutters and thus opening the latch get the door open and spend the afternoon lying motionless on his sofa at the south end first of all it was a room always closed and then there was the stolen entry this gave it a deep flavor of mystery further the broad empty expanse of terrace to the south glowing in the rays of the sun would set me daydreaming there was yet another attraction the waterworks had just been started in calcutta and in the first exuberance of its triumphant entry it did not stint even the indian quarters of their supply in that golden age of pipe water it used to flow even up to my father's third story rooms and turning on the shower tap i would indulge to my heart's content in an untimely bath not so much for the comfort of it as to give rein to my desire to do just as i fancied the alternation of the joy of liberty and the fear of being caught made that shower of municipal water send arrows of delight thrilling into me it was perhaps because the possibility of contact with the outside was so remote that the joy of it came to me so much more readily when material is in profusion the mind gets lazy and leaves everything to it forgetting that for a successful feast of joy its internal equipment counts for more than the external this is the chief lesson which his infant state has to teach to man there his possessions are few and trivial yet he needs no more for his happiness the world of play is spoiled for the unfortunate youngster who is burdened with an unlimited quantity of playthings to call our inner garden a garden is to say a deal too much its properties consisted of a citron tree a couple of plum trees of different varieties and a row of coconut trees in the center was a paved circle the cracks of which various grasses and weeds had invaded and planted in them their victorious standards only those flowering plants which refused to die of neglect continued uncomplainingly to perform their respective duties without casting any aspersions on the gardener in the northern corner was a rice husking shed where the inmates of the inner apartments would occasionally foregather when household necessity demanded this last vestige of rural life has since owned defeat and slunk away ashamed and unnoticed none the less i suspect that adam's garden of eden could hardly have been better adorned than this one of ours for he and his paradise were alike naked they needed not to be furnished with material things it is only since his tasting of the fruit of the tree of knowledge until he can fully digest it that man's need for external furniture and embellishment persistently grows our inner garden was my paradise it was enough for me i well remember how in the early autumn dawn i would run there as soon as i was awake a scent of dewy grass and foliage would rush to meet me and the morning with its cool fresh sunlight would peep out at me over the top of the eastern garden wall from below the trembling tassels of the coconut palms there is another piece of vacant land to the north of the house which to this day we call the golabari barn house the name shows that in some remote past this must have been the place where the year's store of grains used to be kept in a barn then as with brother and sister in infancy the likeness between town and country was visible all over now the family resemblance can hardly be traced the golabari would be my holiday haunt if i got the chance i would hardly be correct to say that i went there to play it was the place not play which drew me why this was so difficult to tell 
Perhaps it's being a deserted bit of a wasteland, lying in an out-of-the-way corner, gave it its charm for me. It was entirely outside the living quarters, and bore no stamp of usefulness. Moreover, it was as unadorned as it was useless, for no one had ever planted anything there. It was doubtless for these reasons that this desert spot offered no resistance to the free play of the boy's imagination. Whenever I got any loophole to evade the vigilance of my warders and could contrive to reach the Golawari, I felt I had a holiday indeed. There was yet another part in our house which I have even yet not succeeded in finding out. A little girl playmate of my own age called this the King's Palace. I have just been there, she would sometimes tell me. But somehow the propitious moment never turned up when she could take me along with her. That was a wonderful place, and its playthings were as wonderful as the games that were played there. It seemed to me it must be somewhere very near, perhaps in the first or second story. The only thing was, one never seemed to be able to get there. How often have I asked my companion, only tell me, is it really inside the house or outside? And she would always reply, no, no, it's in this very house. I would sit and wonder, where then can it be? Don't I know all the rooms of the house? Who the king might be, I never cared to inquire. Where his palace is still remains undiscovered. This much was clear. The king's palace was within our house. Looking back on childhood's days, the thing that recurs most often is the mystery which used to fill both life and world. Something undreamt of was lurking everywhere, and the uppermost question every day was, when, oh when, would we come across it? It was as if nature held something in her closed hands and was smilingly asking us, What do you think I have? What was impossible for her to have was a thing we had no idea of. Well, do I remember the custard apple seed, which I had planted and kept in a corner of the south veranda and used to water every day. The thought that the seed might possibly grow up into a tree kept me in a great state of fluttering wonder. Custard apple seeds still have the habit of sprouting, but no longer to the accompaniment of that feeling of wonder. The fault is not in the custard apple, but in the mind. We had once stolen some rocks from an elder cousin's rockery and started a little rockery of our own. The plants which we sowed in its interstices were cared for so excessively that it was only because of their vegetable nature that they managed to put up with it till their untimely death. Words cannot recount the endless joy and wonder which this miniature mountain top held for us. We had no doubt that this creation of ours would be a wonderful thing to our elders also. The day that we sought to put this to the proof, however, the hillock in the corner of our room, with all its rocks and all its vegetation, vanished. The knowledge that the schoolroom floor was not a proper foundation for the erection of a mountain was imparted so rudely and with such suddenness that it gave us a considerable shock. The weight of stone, or which the floor was relieved, settled on our minds when we realized the gulf between our fancies and the will of our elders. How intimately did the life of the world throb for us in those days! Earth, water, foliage and sky, they all spoke to us and would not be disregarded. How often were we struck by the poignant regret that we could only see the upper story of the earth and knew nothing of its inner story. All our planning was as to how we could pry beneath its dust-coloured cover, if, thought we, we could drive in bamboo after bamboo one over the other, we might perhaps get into some sort of touch with its inmost depths. During the Marg festival, a series of wooden pillars used to be planted round the outer courtyard for supporting the chandeliers. Digging holes for these begin on the first of Marg. The preparations for festivity are ever interesting to young folk, but this digging had a special attraction for me. Though I had watched it done year after year, and seen the hole grow bigger and bigger, till the digger had completely disappeared inside, and yet nothing extraordinary, nothing worthy of the quest of prince or knight had ever happened, yet every time I had the feeling that the lid being lifted off a chest of mystery, I felt that a little bit more digging would do it. Year after year passed, but that bit never got done. There was a pull at the curtain, but it was not drawn. The elders, thought I, can do whatever they please. Why do they rest content with such shallow delving? 
if we young folk had the ordering of it the inmost mystery of the earth would no longer be allowed to remain smothered in its dust covering and the thought that behind every part of the vault of blue repose the mysteries of the sky would also spur our imaginings when our pandit in illustration of some lesson in our bengali science primer told us that the blue sphere was not an enclosure how thunderstruck we were put ladder upon ladder said he and go on mounting away but you will never bump your head he must be sparing of his ladders i opined and questioned with a rising inflection and what if we put more ladders and more and more when i realized that it was fruitless multiplying ladders i remained dumbfounded pondering over the matter surely i concluded such an astounding piece of news must be known only to those who are the world's schoolmasters end of part 1 my reminiscences by rabindranath tagore on the organs of the human voice by sir charles bell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org of the organs of the human voice by sir charles bell read february the 2nd 1832 the organs of the human voice are related to many interesting inquiries in science and philology and yet it is remarkable that this subject has hitherto occupied no place in the transactions of the society in a matter so open to observation as the anatomy of the throat there can indeed be no new parts discovered but it will be easy to show that their actions have been very negligently treated it will not i hope lessen the interest of the inquiry that i acknowledge having an ulterior object in it the nerves distributed to the neck and throat are the most intricate of all that they have not been unravelled and distinct uses assigned to each is owing to the complexity and the numerous associations of the organs to which they tend when we shall have seen the necessity of combination among the various parts for producing the simplest effort of the voice we shall find a reason for these numerous nerves and for their seeming irregularities in reviewing the writings of physiologists we observe defects which are obviously to be ascribed to the great complexity in the organization and the real difficulty of the subject but there are others which arise from the habit of resting contented with assigning one use for a part in the animal frame whereas there is nothing which should more excite our admiration than the variety of offices destined to be performed by the same organ it is in contemplating the extent of combination established among the parts of the human body that we become sensible of its perfection above all comparison with things artificial and this is especially true with regard to the organs of the voice they are remarkable for their union or cooperation in function they all perform more than one office and are interwoven and associated with parts which serve a double or even a treble function but we ought not to be surprised at the intricacy of structure in the human organs of voice when we find them capable of imitating every sound of bird or beast excelling all instruments of music in clearness and expression and capable of making those infinite changes on articulate sounds which form the languages of the different nations of the earth although there be one subject articulate language on which i shall principally comment as being that in which the treatises on the voice are altogether defective yet as there are lesser points in which i think authors are in fault i shall take the subjects consecutively or systematically i do this in the hope of affording at the same time a sounder foundation in anatomy to those members of the society who are more capable of pursuing this part of philosophy in all its curious and elegant subdivisions it will be convenient to divide the inquiry into three heads the trachea the larynx and the pharynx under the head of trachea and through the whole investigation it is necessary to keep the different functions of the part in mind 
or we shall be appropriating to the voice structures which have reference to other functions we read that the trachea is formed of imperfect hoops of cartilages joined by membranes and that it is flat on the back part for these reasons that it may be a rigid and free tube for respiring the air that it may accommodate itself to the motions of the head and neck and that it may yield in the act of swallowing to the distended esophagus and permit the morsel to descend this is perfectly correct but there is a grand omission whilst all admit that a copious secretion is poured into this passage it is not shown how the mucus is thrown off there is a fine and very regular layer of muscular fibres on the back part of the trachea exterior to the mucus coat and which runs from the extremities of the cartilages of one side to those of the other this transverse muscle is beautifully distinct in the horse when a portion of the trachea is taken out and everything is dissected off but this muscle the cartilages are preserved in their natural state but the moment that the muscular fibres are cut across the cartilages fly open this muscle then is opposed to the elasticity of the cartilages of the trachea by its action it diminishes the calibre of the tube and by its relaxation the canal widens without the operation of an opponent muscle the whole extent of the air passages opens or expands during inspiration and then the trachea is also more free but in expiration and especially in forcible expectoration and coughing the trachea is diminished in width the effect of this simple expedient is to free the passage of the accumulated secretion which without this would be drawn in and gravitate towards the lungs when the air is inspired the trachea is wide and the mucus is not urged downwards when the air is expelled the transverse muscle is in action the calibre of the tube is diminished the mucus occupies a larger proportion of the canal the air is sent forth with a greater impetus than that with which it was inhaled and the consequence is a gradual tendency of the sputa towards the top of the trachea in the larynx the same principle holds for as the opening of the glottis enlarges in inspiration and is straightened in expiration the sensible glottis by inducing coughing gets rid of its encumbrance without this change of the calibre of the trachea the secretions could not reach the upper end of the passage but would fall back upon the lungs experiments have been formerly made which although no such view as i now present was in contemplation prove how the action of the transverse muscle tends to expel foreign bodies the trachea of a large dog being opened it was attempted to thrust different substances into it during inspiration but these were always sent out with impetus and could not be retained why the dog could not be thus suffocated is apparent the tube is furnished with this most salutary provision to secure the ready expulsion of all bodies accidentally inhaled the air passes inwards by the side of the foreign body but in its passage outwards the circumstances are changed by the diminished calibre of the canal and the body like a pellet filling up a tube must be expelled by the breath looking on the form of muscular structure of the trachea in man as providing for expectoration of the secretions poured into the tube what shall we think of the trachea of birds which are formed by cartilages of complete circles and which have no compressing muscles does it explain the peculiarity that all the air tubes of birds are dry that their lungs are motionless and that in the air respired by them there is no moisture these are the reasons why i must reject the opinion of portal that the transverse muscle of the trachea is to give force to the breath in speaking the trachea and all that portion of the windpipe which extends from the larynx to the lungs may be considered as the port-band 
or tube which conveys the air from the bellows to the reed of the organ pipe, and it has even less influence on the quality of sound than the port vent. If this portion of the air tube were to vibrate and give out sound, it would interfere with and confuse those which proceed from the glottis. The imperfect circle formed by the cartilages of the trachea and their isolation from each other are ill-suited to convey sound. But I am now to notice a more particular provision against the propagation of sound downwards by this passage. If on inspecting a musical instrument we should find a spongy body of the consistence of firm flesh in contact with a cord or tube, and an apparatus by which this body might be pressed against the vibrating part, we would not hesitate to conclude that it damped or limited the vibration. The thyroid gland is a vascular but firm substance which, like a cushion, lies across the upper part of the trachea. Four flat muscles, like ribbons, arise from the sternum, first rib, and clavicle, and run up to the thyroid cartilage and os hyoides over the surface of this glandular body. These muscles are capable of bracing it to the trachea. If it be admitted that the vibration of the trachea would only produce a continued drone, rising over the inflections of the voice, and adding nothing to its distinctness, we may perceive, in the adjustment of the thyroid gland to the trachea, the most suitable means of suffocating or stopping the vibrations from descending along the sides of the tube. Comparative anatomy is often a test of the correctness of our inferences drawn from the human body. I reflected that if I were right in my idea of this being one of the uses of the thyroid gland, there should be no such body so placed in birds, and that, following up the inquiry, if we were not likely to discover the function of that gland, we might nevertheless learn why it is so singularly placed. In birds, the sounding apparatus is at the lower part of the trachea, the larynx being in a manner divided in its office. At the upper opening, there is the structure and action and sensibility, constituting it a guard against foreign matter. But the proper organ of sound is formed on the lower extremity of the trachea and in the chest. Hence, in birds, there is this remarkable difference that the sound must ascend along the trachea. Directed by this consideration, it is not without interest that we notice the absence of the thyroid gland in them, that the trachea itself is a firm tube with cartilages of entire circles, and that there is nothing to suffocate the rising vibrations. In no animal is a thyroid gland of the same relative magnitude as in man, but it is easy to prove that the trachea has no influence upon the voice. Both in the open pipe or flute and the pipe stopped at the bottom, as the syrinx, the length determines the note. Lengthening the tube depresses the note, and shortening it makes the sound more acute. A similar effect should result from the elongation and shortening of the trachea if the changes of the voice depended upon it. But, on the contrary, the trachea is lengthened during the high note, while it is shortened as the voice descends and the notes become graver. I have no ear to determine what harmonic sounds attend the human voice, but supposing that sounds proceed from the trachea, which is shortening, at the same time that they proceed from the upper part of the tube, which is lengthening, it is clear to demonstration that the two portions of the tube can never consent or keep any proportion in their vibrations. For these reasons I apprehend that in the structure and condition of the trachea the design manifestly is to suffocate the vibrations of sound and so to impede the motions originating in the larynx from being propagated downwards. Pursuing our inquiry into the organs of the voice independently of articulation and looking more particularly to the larynx, we shall find that the common opinion is confirmed by experiment and every analogy that the glottis is the primary seat of sound, the source of the vibrations communicated to the air as it is breathed. 
but to consider the motions of the glottis and even the modulations of the air in the larynx as the sole source of sound would be incorrect Perrine described the edge of the glottis as being like the strings of the violin and the air brushing over it like the bow but even in that supposition though the vibration of the string of the violin is necessary to the production of sound yet that sound receives modification through the form and condition of the instrument as the same chord vibrating in the same time will produce a sound the quality of which varies in different instruments so will the sound of the corda vocalis be influenced in the pharynx as a tuning fork or a movable musical instrument will have the quality and power of the tone changed by its position and the material with which it is in contact so will the vibrations of the human glottis be affected by the parts above and against which the sound is directed the breath which plays inaudibly in respiration becomes vocalized when the ligaments of the glottis or corda vocalis are braced so as to cause the edges of the glottis to vibrate in the stream of air in a wind instrument the air must be impelled with a force to make the sides of the tube vibrate so in the production of sound from the human organs there must be a certain pressure of the column of air but in the organs of the voice there is this superiority that there are not only the means of regulating the pressure of the column of air but of adjusting the vocal cords so as to suit them to the most delicate issue of the breath the metal tongue in the organ pipe is by lengthening or shortening it accommodated so as to vibrate in time with the air contained in the tube so is the edge of the glottis regulated but with an apparatus for adjustment the most perfect besides the adjustment of the vocal cords there is a very superior provision in the motions of the chest which supply the air to that of any musical instrument although the organ has allotted to each note a separate pipe whose relative dimensions are proportioned with mathematical precision yet the air propelled through the pipes can never be so regulated as it is by the combination which exists betwixt the motions of the chest and the glottis the church organ could not be made to approach the precision of adjustment in the human organs where there are many pairs of bellows as there are pipes and each adjusted by a weight or spring to accommodate the pressure of air to the dimensions of the pipes referring to the plates for the anatomy i may continue my comment on the form and uses of the parts the theroaritenoid ligaments or corda vocalis of herine are the lower ligaments of the glottis they form the chink of the true glottis these ligaments do not stand distinct from the sides of the tube but the fine lining membrane is reflected over them this membrane sinking between the inferior and superior ligaments forms there the sacculus or ventriculus larynges another reflection passes from the extreme point of the appendix of the arytenoid cartilage to the base of the epiglottis these inflections of the membrane of the glottis produce a considerable intricacy in the passage of the larynx nevertheless when this piece of anatomy is fully displayed the number of muscles inserted into the arytenoid cartilages and the effect of their motions on the lower ligaments point to these as the chief parts and to the others as subordinate in producing sound there are however circumstances which lead to the belief that the sacculus or lateral cavity of the larynx has much influence on sound we perceive that one effect of this cavity is to hold off the inferior ligament from the side of the tube and to give freedom to its vibrations but the varieties in its size and form exhibited by comparative anatomy and the influence which some of the muscles of the arytenoid cartilages must have upon it point it out as an essential part of the organ of sound and the ear-piercing cries which belong to such animals as the belzebub ape in which this cell is large confirm the notion 
The seat of the vibrations which produce the voice is so fairly indicated by the whole anatomy and confirmed by observation that there is hardly an excuse for those experiments which have exhibited the motions of the chink of the glottis in living animals. It is, on the whole, better to wait our opportunity of inspecting these parts in action in man. In consequence of wounds of the throat, I have had repeated occasions to witness the motion of the glottis in man, both during simple breathing and in speaking. On every inspiration the glottis is dilated. Upon asking the patient to speak, and encouraging him when no sound proceeded by saying that I could understand him by the motion of his lips, I have seen that in the attempt at utterance the glottis moved as well as the lips. Although these occasions be too painful to admit of protracted experiment, I could not omit observing that there is a motion of the glottis in correspondence with the efforts of the other organs of voice. We have already understood the necessity of the tongue of the organ pipe being adjusted in its length, both to the force of the wind from the bellows, and that it may vibrate in correspondence with a column of air in the tube. Granting that the analogy between this instrument and the organ of the voice is just, we must acknowledge the very superior means possessed by the living parts of drawing out the margins of the glottis to that by which the tongue of the organ pipe is adjusted. If we should adopt the fancy to compare the membrane, which is stretched over the ligament to a drum, then the arytenoid muscles would be the braces to tighten the membrane, and the ligaments would be as the snares on the reverse of the drum but all such comparisons serve to show that taking this portion only of the apparatus for the voice it surpasses every instrument in the property of accommodation of sounding in unison with the rest of the tube and with a column of air of the pharynx and of the formation of articulate sounds we come now to a division of our subject which, notwithstanding its higher interest, has been imperfectly treated by authors, and where the actions essential to articulate language have been altogether omitted. Tracing the volume of simple sound in its ascent from the glottis, we see how well the epiglottis is calculated to direct it on the passages above. Immediately over the epiglottis hangs the vellum palati. This curtain is formed by certain muscular fibres, which draw down the mucous membrane from the back part of the bony palate into a great fold, whilst other muscles, their opponents, furl it up. This vellum forms a partition which divides the mouth from the posterior cavity, arriere bush, or pharynx, and the vellum, uvula, and arches of the palate vary their condition during the production of simple sounds. When the parts are displayed so that we may look on the outside and posterior aspect of the great bag of the pharynx, we see how well it is adapted for the office which I shall assign to it in the formation of the human voice. It presents to our view a flat, expanded web of a fleshy or muscular texture, and it extends from the base of the skull to the extremities of the horns of the os hyoides and those of the thyroid cartilage between which it is stretched and held out. Behind, its connections are loose, and as it forms a principal boundary of the bag of the pharynx, the great cavity of that bag is directly in front of it. If we trace the pharynx upwards from the closed extremity of the esophagus, we perceive the glottis opening into it below, whilst above it is terminated by the posterior nostrils and anteriorly by the mouth. Considering the passage for the voice as one irregular cavity extending from the glottis to the lips and nostrils, we shall find it subject to great changes, and powerful in its influence on the voice. For although the breath is vocalized by the larynx, both the musical notes in singing and the vowels in speech are affected by the form and dimensions of this cavity. Notwithstanding the ingenuity displayed in experiments on animals to show that their cries proceed from the larynx, we have no authority to disregard the fact that when a person who has divided the pharynx and exposed the top of the windpipe attempts to speak, no sound issues from the larynx. By great effort he may produce a noise, 
but anything like the common effort of speaking is attended with no audible sounds from this we must infer that the delicate vibrations necessary to articulate language are influenced not merely by the action in the glottis but by the condition of the walls of the pharynx the cavity into which the sound is thrown in this part of the air passage we shall find an exact correspondence with the flute or pipe in as far as it is lengthened during the grave sounds and shortened in the acute even if it were proved that the note is made to rise and fall by the contractions of the glottis the great apparatus employed to move the pharynx cannot be useless we are countenanced in concluding that as the tube of the organ is adjusted to the reed so is the condition of the pharynx made to correspond with these contractions of the glottis it is impossible to see a singer running up the notes to the highest without admitting that there must be a powerful influence produced through the alternate shortening and elongation of the pharynx and mouth to allow the cavity to be shortened in the greatest degree the larynx is raised and the lips retracted on the contrary the trachea descends and the lips are protruded to lengthen the cavities and to give out the lower or graver notes of articulation in pronouncing the simple continued sounds the vowels and the diphthongs which are the combinations of open sounds the pharynx at all times irregular varies its form or dimensions without interrupting or cutting the sounds these sounds are universal and expressive what we have now to consider are more conventional and form the constituents of articulate language it has been imagined that the vocalized breath ascending into the mouth is there divided and articulated by the tongue teeth and lips and that this comprehends the whole act of speech such a description implies a very imperfect acquaintance with the actions which produce articulate language it is now my purpose to show that in articulating or forming the consonants the pharynx is a very principal agent and that this smaller cavity is substituted for the larger cavity of the chest to the great relief of the speaker and the incalculable saving of muscular exertion the late dr young made a comparison of the power employed by a glass blower in propelling the air through his tube by the force of his cheeks and in propelling it by the force of his lungs and calculating the ease with which the lesser cavity is compressed in comparison with the greater that is the cavity of the mouth compressed by the muscles of the cheeks compared with the whole extent of the chest compressed by the muscles of respiration he concluded that the weight of four pounds would produce an operation through the lesser cavity equal to seventy pounds weighing on the larger cavity the quality of fluids by which they transmit pressure equally in all directions is the cause of this and of some other results which appear paradoxical it is a property too nearly allied to mechanical power and too important to be left out of the scheme of animal structure when a forcing pump is let into a reservoir it produces surprising effects the piston of the hydraulic press being loaded with a weight of one pound the same degree of pressure will be transmitted to every part of the surface of the reservoir equal in magnitude to the base of the piston and on the contrary supposing the power to be employed on the reservoir for the purpose of raising the piston it would require the weight of a pound on every portion of the superficies of the reservoir equal in extent to the base of the piston to raise the piston with a force of one pound we cannot fail to notice the effect of this law on the cavities of the animal body in diminishing the power of muscular bags in proportion to their increased capacity elastic fluids are subject to a similar influence from the pressure extending in every direction and the resistance always being equal to the pressure a man standing on the hydraulic bellows raises himself by blowing into the tube and contrariwise the weight of his body does not produce from that tube a blast of air superior to the force of contraction of his cheeks a very slight pressure against the nozzle of the common bellows will resist the compression by the handles 
and by blowing into the nozzle we may raise a great weight placed on the boards to reconcile us to the influence of this principle as applicable to the animal economy we shall take an example before applying it to our present subject a sailor leaning his breast over a yard arm and exerting every muscle on the rigging gives a direction to the whole muscular system and applies the muscles of respiration to the motions of the trunk and arms through the influence of a small muscle that is not capable of raising a thousandth part of the weight of his body he raises himself by the powerful combination of the muscles of the abdomen chest and arms but these muscles are controlled and directed by the action of a muscle which does not weigh five grains the explanation is this a man preparing for exertion draws his breath and expands his chest but how is this dilatation to be maintained if the muscles which expand the chest are to continue in exertion to preserve it so there must be a great expenditure of vital force besides these muscles are now wanted for another office the small muscle that closes the chink of the glottis suffices it contracts on the extremity of the windpipe and here acting so as to confine the column of air it is superior to the united power of all the muscles of the chest and trunk of the body which act upon the cavity of the thorax however powerful the muscles of expiration may be in compressing the chest their influence is very small on the column of air in the windpipe the pressure there being no more than on any part of the walls of the chest which is of the same diameter as the base of the tube the closing of the glottis by this small muscle throws all those of the chest and abdomen which are otherwise muscles of respiration free to act as muscles of the trunk and arms but if any defect of the windpipe or of the muscle which closes it permit the air to escape the muscles of the chest and abdomen sink with the falling of the chest they become muscles of expiration and lose their power as muscles of volition consequently all powerful efforts cease in the instant when an unhappy suicide thinks to perpetrate self-destruction by dividing his windpipe his sensations of sudden and total failure of strength announce the accomplishment of the act but he is deceived in the moment of lunatic excitement his energies are wound up and his breath is drawn and confined but now the trachea being divided in the instant he is seized with feebleness for the compressed air is let loose the chest subsides and the whole muscles of the trunk and arms are lost to the actions of volition he feels as if struck with the sudden influence of death his actual death depends on other circumstances thus we perceive that the muscle of the glottis not weighing a thousandth part of the muscles of the trunk of the body controls them all changing them from muscles of respiration to muscles of volition and this it is enabled to do on the principle of the hydraulic press we are by these instances prepared to understand the great importance in the animal economy of power being employed on the lesser cavity in preference to the larger and how much will be saved if the appulse necessary in articulation be given by the pharynx instead of by the greater cavity of the thorax footnote the principle is as important in its application to pathology as to the natural functions it explains the weak pulse which attends the dilated heart how the contractions of the uterus become more powerful in the progress of labor and why the distended bladder acts with diminished power in the expulsion of the urine through the urethra on the same grounds we understand how a slight spasm in the canal of the urethra will resist the most powerful contractions of an enlarged and thickened bladder aided by the pressure of the abdominal muscles and a footnote in a person whom i had the pain of attending for a long time after the bones of the upper part of the face were lost and in whom i could look down behind the palate i saw the operation of the vellum palati during speech it was in continual motion and when this person pronounced the explosive letters the vellum rose convex so as to interrupt the ascent of the breath in that direction and as the lips parted or the tongue separated from the teeth or palate the vellum recoiled forcibly 
These facts lead us to the further contemplation of the pharynx. We see it to be a large cavity behind the palate, formed by a dilatable bag, and acted on by many muscles. We have seen that the volume of sound issues into it from the glottis below, and that although it opens into the nose above, yet this passage is closed whenever the volume is raised, like a valve in the manner just described. At such a time, if the mouth be also shut, the bag will be closed on all sides, and may then suffer distension by the vocalized breath ascending through the glottis. In speaking, much of the sound, as of the vowels and diphthongs, is the uninterrupted issue of the vocalized breath, modulated by the passages and differently directed, but not checked or interrupted. The consonants are the same sounds checked by the tongue, lips, or teeth. At the moment of this interruption, the pharynx, being distended, is prepared to give an pulse by its muscular action exactly in time with the parting lips. If we grasp the throat whilst speaking, so that the fingers embrace the bag of the pharynx, we shall feel that each articulate sound is attended with an action of the pharynx, and preceding each explosive letter we shall be sensible of a distension of the throat. By a close attention to the act of breathing, we shall perceive that whilst the distended chest falls gradually and uniformly, the bag of the pharynx is alternately distended and compressed in correspondence with articulated sounds. We can now conceive that if each pulse of the breath in speaking arose from the action of the chest, it would be attended with great and unnecessary exertion, since in proportion to the size of the reservoir and the smallness of the tube that gives issue would be the force required on the sides of the reservoir to produce an impulse along the tube. If each consonant and accented syllable required the action of the whole thorax, we should find that a man, instead of being able to deliver an oration of some hours in length, would be exhausted in a few sentences, like a person who bellows and gives pain by the violence and consequent ungracefulness of his action. If we enter into a more particular examination of the formation of the consonants, we shall perceive that without the action of the pharynx, those letters must have been mutes, which, through its operation, do in fact give the greatest force and distinctness to language. The circumstance which I have to notice could not altogether escape the observation of grammarians. They speak of the guttural sounds as belonging to the production of certain consonants. Bishop Wilkins expresses this by referring to that murmur in the throat before the breath is emitted in pronouncing these letters. Thus grammarians distinguish the mute letter P, which has no sound previous to the parting of the lips, from B, which has a guttural sound before the explosion of the lips. Had the cause of this sound been investigated, these ingenious men would have presented the subject to us in greater simplicity. This guttural sound, they say, is produced by a compression of the larynx or windpipe. But this has no meaning and cannot pass for an explanation. This murmur, like all other sounds, proceeds from the vibration of the glottis, but, as we have seen, the glottis cannot vibrate without the ascent of the breath through it. How, then, is this murmur to be produced when the mouth is closed and there is no aspiration? The air ascends because the bag of the pharynx, or arriere bouche, is filling. It is during the distension of the bag that the breath ascends and produces the sound which proceeds and gives the character to some of the explosive letters, and it is this preceding murmur which distinguishes these letters from others produced by the same position of the organs in the mouth, but which are mute or nasal. Thus the triad of consonants D, B, G are called semimutes because, without the assistance of any vowel, they are attended with a faint sound, which continues for a little time. The letters T, P, K are produced by the same position of the organs in the mouth, but they are preceded by no murmur, and therefore it is that they are called mutes, whereas in D, B, G the pharynx fills preceding the parting of the lips. It is this filling of the pharynx and consequent murmur in the glottis 
which gives reason for the grammarians to say that these letters d b g are accompanied with a sound though not joined to a vowel and to call them semi-mutes grammarians admit that the mouth is not the proper organ for producing sound but only the organ for modulating and articulating the specific sounds and having explained the formation of the vowels they proceed to the formation of the consonants accounting for the peculiar sounds by the position of the lips tongue and palate we perceive that their explanation must necessarily be imperfect owing to their ignorance of the anatomy and especially of the action of the pharynx for example p b and m they say are consonants formed by the application of the lips to each other but this leaves the peculiar character of each letter unexplained since all these are formed by the lips the real difference is this p gives no sound previous to the parting of the lips it is the vowel abruptly sounded by their separation b differs only in as much as the sound precedes the opening of the lips in the manner i have just explained and as the pharynx after being distended contracts and forces open the lips this letter is very properly called explosive m too is in part owing to the articulation through the lips the sound commencing in the vowel is interrupted by the shutting of the lips after which it continues in a murmur with this difference from the guttural murmur that it ascends into the cavities of the face the vellum being lifted the same difference is shown in other letters as f and v if we attempt to articulate certain letters in a whisper we shall find how much the distinctness depends on the swelling of the pharynx in a whisper it is with much difficulty that we can distinguish p from b or t from d or g from k thus we see that the consonants classed according to their formation in the mouth have varieties consequent on the actions of the pharynx first the consonants formed by the closed lips second those formed by the meeting of the lips and teeth third those formed by the tip of the tongue and palate fourth those formed by the dorsum of the tongue and palate all of these admit of variety by the operation of the pharynx and vellum viz they are mutes explosive semi-mutes and nasal liquids for example taking the position of the tip of the tongue against the teeth as forming a consonant we have t the mute d the semi-mute in which the sound precedes the explosion and n the sound which rings through the nasal cavities after the closing of the passage through the mouth from the same misconception of the actions which combine to form the voice it may be that grammarians do not give us a very clear account of emphasis and accent we perceive that there are two sources of the force with which the words are uttered the chest and the pharynx the emphatic delivery of several words or syllables must proceed from the forcible expulsion of the breath by the effort of expiration but the emphasis on the single syllable and the forcible enunciation of the letter on which the clearness and distinctness and sometimes the meaning of words depend must be produced by the effort of the pharynx proofs of the correctness of the opinions advanced drawn from the effects of accident and of disease occurring under the author's observation one a child having drawn the broken shell of an almond into its windpipe was in momentary danger of suffocation and could utter no sound until the shell was extracted by incision footnote the probe was passed several times into the windpipe and passed the broken shell without discovering it it had been caught by the action of the transverse muscle and the sharp broken edge forced into the mucous membrane which was the reason that it was not coughed out of the wound and a footnote two owing to disease of the glottis it was necessary to open the membrane between the thyroid and cricoid cartilages the voice instantly ceased and no sound could be produced while the air passed freely from the wound the harsh sawing sound of the air in the contracted glottis immediately ceased and the air played easily with a sifting sound through the wound 
three a small pebble having fallen into the glottis of a child there was a stridulous sound in drawing the breath but no voice in the expulsion of the breath four when an ulcer had destroyed the margins of the glottis and the sacculi the patient spoke in a husky whisper reedy and very feebly five thickening of the membrane of the glottis and epiglottis had a similar effect the person speaking painfully in a whisper six a man died of suffocation from a postule which formed on a margin of the false glottis whilst he breathed the sound was like the noise of a saw harsh and loud seven the epiglottis being destroyed and a deep ulcer in the sacculus the man attempted to call but with a husky sound eight when the interior of the larynx was coated with coagulable lymph except the clangor during coughing the voice was quite gone nine when the suicide has divided the larynx from the tongue and opened the pharynx no sound issues from the larynx in his attempt to speak and it requires a powerful effort to produce any sound at all when the glottis is thus exposed it is seen to move in the effort to speak ten the loss of the vellum pendulum palati was attended with a defect of articulation the sounds were run together and nasal eleven when polypus fills the cavities of the face the voice is deficient in sonorousness and clearness twelve when a communication is formed between the mouth and nose the sound is nasal and the articulation imperfect thirteen the entire removal of the bones of the face deprived the voice of all force and gave it a sound which we should have called nasal had any part belonging to the nose remained fourteen the defect of nervous influence in depriving the muscles of the vellum and pharynx of due tension as in apoplexy produces stertor or snoring that this depends in a great measure on the relaxation of the vellum appears from this that changing the position of the head so that the vellum shall not hang against the back part of the pharynx removes a distressing sound fifteen in extreme weakness as from wounds and loss of blood even to insensibility groaning proceeds from the condition of the glottis as if the call for sympathy and assistance were intended to be the last effort of life by these facts it appears first that the trachea gives out no sound of itself second that when the passage of the trachea is much encroached upon the column of air is not sufficient to move the cords of the glottis third that whatever interferes directly with the motion of the glottis reduces the voice to a whisper fourth that when the larynx is separated from the pharynx delicate sounds are not produced and therefore an influence of the pharynx upon the stream of air is necessary to the production of such sounds fifth that any permanent opening or defect of the vellum which shall prevent the distension of the pharynx and the closing of the passage to the nose renders articulation defective sixth that the removal of the cells of the face equally with their obstruction deprives the voice of its body and clearness seventh in nervous relaxation of the muscles of the throat there is sound but its nature evinces how much the proper action of the muscles is necessary to the voice recapitulation it is curious and not without its use to observe how many parts must conform and how many actions must accurately correspond to produce the simplest sound and how many additional combinations there must be for the formation of articulate voice as we may audibly breathe through a trumpet without producing a note of music so we breathe without the tremor of the glottis to produce voice properly but only the whisper to vocalize the breath there must not only be a certain strength of impulse in the column of air but there must be an adjustment of the vocal cords in the glottis the mere impulse of the breath however forcible as in sneezing does not necessarily move the cords of the glottis the cordae vocalis being strung by the action of their muscles in correspondence with the forcibly expulsion of the breath they vibrate this vibration is reverberated on the column of air and by an adjustment of the passages above there is a correspondence between the motions of the glottis and the vibrations of the column of air the breath thus vocalized 
forms the several open sounds or vowels by the change or modulation of the passages for by the more or less contraction and dilatation of the tube these sounds are modified the vibrating air being differently directed and impelled against different portions of the tube the musical notes are in the same way produced by changes in the force with which the voice is propelled the degree of tension in the corda vocalis and the modulation or change in the form of the open passages there is nothing more surprising than the precision with which the notes of the human voice are produced as when we hear it rising above the sound of the church organ the notes more liquid and distinct and descending in a suffrage of notes and half notes as if each arose from a different pipe or were struck on a distinct instrument yet these falls are consequent on muscular action which alters the diameter and form of the glottis and the length and diameter of the pharynx this minute accommodation of action does not merely evince the perfection of the organ but shows a most surprising command possessed over it and in this respect the muscular apparatus of the throat does not yield in comparison with that of the eye itself struck with the perfection of the human voice its precision expression and variety excelling the finest instruments mathematically constructed we have more to admire in the production of those conventional sounds which become the instruments of thought and the source of all we know articulation results from a still more complex action of the organs of voice in speaking the voice is much influenced by the modulation or varying forms of the open passages before it is articulated in the mouth whilst with each motion of the tongue or lips there is a correspondence in the action of the vellum and pharynx so that the compression of the thorax the adjustment of the larynx and glottis the motions of the tongue and lips and the actions of the pharynx and palate must all consent before a word be uttered there is one part of the subject which i have omitted in the body of the paper in speaking the play of the chest is not the same as in the common act of breathing the diaphragm is used less and the ribs a great deal more a man preparing to speak elevates his chest whilst the abdomen is drawn flatter the effect of which is to give more play to the elastic cartilages of the ribs and the falling of the elevated chest is easy and unembarrassed whereas to expel the breath beyond a certain degree requires the action of the muscles of expiration and makes the act of speaking still more complicated when we think of the number of parts which must combine in office to produce the simplest articulate sound we see the necessity for a corresponding intricacy of nervous connections and are less surprised to find the voice defective through derangement of the nervous system in a person who stutters the imperfection is obviously in the power of combination not in the defect of any single part whilst he cannot combine the murmur from the glottis with the action of the pharynx he can speak in a whisper that is he can articulate the faint sound of aspiration whilst he cannot at the same time vocalize the breath so he can sing his words without hesitation or impediment or spasm because in singing the adjustment of the glottis and the due propulsion of the breath by the elevated chest are accomplished and continue uninterruptedly neither does he experience any distress in pronouncing the vowels and liquid consonants for the same reason and if he study to commence his speech with a vowel sound he can generally add to the vibration already begun the proper action of the pharynx another necessary combination distresses the person who stutters i mean the actions of the expiratory muscles and those of the throat he expels the breath so much in his attempt at utterance that to produce a sound at all the ribs must be forcibly compressed to remove this necessity if he be made to fill his lungs and elevate the shoulders the elasticity of the compages of the chest will come into play so as to expel the breath without effort and he will speak with comparative facility and comfort accordingly to commence speaking with the chest fully inflated to pitch the voice properly to keep a measured time in speaking and to raise the voice on a liquid letter or vowel are some of the common means recommended for the cure of stuttering 
and they are certainly those which tend to overcome the difficulty in combining the organs of speech when the defect arises from no disorder or malformation of these organs taken separately i have only further to hope that by the interest which this subject is capable of exciting i may be indulged in a subsequent attempt to unravel the nerves of the neck and throat and off on the organs of the human voice by sir charles bell pre-visionary dream by charles dickens from the best psychic stories edited with a preface by joseph lewis french this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dale grothman this incident in the experience of charles dickens 1812 to 1870 is to be found in the standard biography by foster 3 pages 284 and 5 london 1874 pre-visionary dream by charles dickens on may 30th 1863 dickens wrote here is a curious case at first hand on thursday night in last week being at my office here i dreamed that i saw a lady in a red shawl with her back toward me whom i supposed to be e on her turning around i found that i didn't know her and she said i am miss napier all the time i was dressing next morning i thought what a preposterous thing to have so very distinct a dream about nothing and why miss napier for i never heard of any miss napier that same friday night i read after the reading came into my retiring room mary boyle and her brother and the lady in the red shawl whom they presented as miss napier these are all the circumstances exactly told i can imagine the late professor royce saying thirty years ago for i much doubt if he would have said it twenty years later in certain people under certain exciting circumstances there occur what i shall henceforth call pseudo presentments e i more or less instantaneous hallucinations of memory which make it seem to one that something which now excites or astonishes him has been prefigured in a recent dream or in the form of some other warning although this seeming is wholly unfounded and although the supposed prophecy really succeeds its own fulfillment apply this curious theory which has probably not been urged for many years to the incident just cited and see how loosely it fits what was there about three persons one a stranger coming to dickens after he had finished a reading from his own works to excite or astonish him make his brain whirl and bring about a hallucination of memory an illusion of having dreamed it all before it was the most commonplace event to him besides as in most such cases he had the distinct recollection of his thoughts about the dream after waking thoughts inexorably interwoven with the acts performed while dressing besides a pseudo presentment should tally with the event as a reflection does with the object but in the dream miss napier introduced herself while in reality she was introduced by another the end of pre-visionary dream by charles dickens russians as i know them by jerome klapka jerome this is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I ought to like Russia better than I do, if only for the sake of the many good friends I am proud to possess among the Russians. A large square photograph I keep always on my mantelpiece. It helps me to maintain my head at that degree of distension necessary for the performance of all literary work. It presents in the center a neatly written address in excellent English that I frankly confess I am never tired of reading, around which are arranged some hundreds of names I am quite unable to read, but which, in spite of their strange lettering, I know to be the names of good Russian men and women to whom a year or two ago the kindly idea occurred to send me a Christmas card, this message of encouragement. The individual Russian is one of the most charming creatures living. If he likes you, he does not hesitate to let you know it, not only by every kindly action possible, but by what perhaps is just as useful in this gray old world, by kindly speech. We Anglo-Saxons are apt to pride ourselves upon being undemonstrative. Max Adler tells a tale of a boy who was sent out by his father to fetch in some wood. The boy took the opportunity of disappearing and did not show his face again beneath the paternal roof for over twenty years. Then, one evening, a smiling, well-dressed stranger entered to the old couple and announced himself as their long-lost child. "'Well, you haven't hurried yourself,' grumbled the old man. "'And blarm me! if now you haven't forgotten the wood i was lunching with an englishman in a london restaurant one day a man entered and took his seat at a table nearby and glancing around and meeting my friend's eyes smiled and nodded oh, excuse me a minute said my friend i must just speak to my brother haven't seen him for more than five years he finished his soup and leisurely wiped his moustache before strolling across and shaking hands. They talked for a while. Then my friend returned to me. Never thought to see him again, observed my friend. He was one of the garrison at that place in Africa. Uh, what's the name of it? Uh, that the Mahdi attacked. Only three of them escaped. Always was a lucky beggar, Jim. But wouldn't you like to talk to him some more? I suggested. I can see you at any time about this little business of ours. Oh, that's all right, he answered. We have just fixed it up. Shall be dining with him tomorrow. I thought of this scene one evening while dining with some Russian friends in a St. Petersburg hotel. One of the party had not seen his second cousin, a mining engineer, for nearly eighteen months. They sat opposite to one another, and a dozen times, at least during the course of the dinner, one of them would jump up from his chair and run around to embrace the other. They would throw their arms about one another, kissing one another on both cheeks, and then sit down again with moist eyes. Their behavior among their fellow countrymen excited no astonishment whatever. The Russian anger is just as quick and vehement as his love. I was supping one evening with friends in one of the chief restaurants on the Nevsky. Two gentlemen at an adjoining table, who up till the previous moment had been engaged in amicable conversation, suddenly sprang to their feet and went for one another. 
One man secured the water bottle which he promptly broke over the other's head. His opponent chose for his weapon a heavy mahogany chair, and the leaping back for the purpose of securing a good swing lurched against my hostess. Do, please be careful, said the lady. A thousand pardons, madame, returned the stranger, from whom blood and water were streaming in equal copiousness, and taking the utmost care to avoid interfering with our comfort, he succeeded adroitly in flooring his antagonist by a well-directed blow. A policeman appeared upon the scene with marvelous promptitude. He did not attempt to interfere, but, running out into the street, communicated the glad tidings to another policeman. "'That's going to cost them a pretty penny,' observed my host, who was calmly continuing his supper. "'Why couldn't they wait?' "'It did cost them a pretty penny. Some half a dozen policemen were around about before as many minutes had elapsed.' and each one claimed his bribe. Then they wished both combatants good night and trooped out, evidently in great good humor. And the two gentlemen, with wet napkins round their heads, sat down again, and laughter and amicable conversation flowed freely as before. They strike the stranger as a childlike people, but you are possessed with a haunting scene of ugly traits beneath. The workers, slaves it would be almost more just to call them, allow themselves to be driven with the uncomplaining patience of intelligent animals. Yet every educated Russian you talk to on the subject knows that revolution is coming, but he talks to you about it with the door shut for no man in Russia can be sure that his own servants are not police spies. I was discussing the question with a Russian official one evening in his study when his old housekeeper entered the room. A soft-eyed, gray-haired woman who had been in his service more than eight years and whose position in the household was almost that of a friend. He stopped abruptly, and changed the conversation. So soon as the door was closed behind her, again he explained himself. It is better to chat upon such matters when one is quite alone. He laughed. But surely you can trust her, I said. Oh, it is safer to trust no one, he answered. And then he continued from the point where we had been interrupted. It is gathering, he said. There are times when I almost smell blood in the air. I am an old man and may escape it, but my children will have to suffer, suffer as children must do for the sins of their fathers. We have made brood beasts of the people, and as brood beasts they will come upon us cruel and undiscriminating right and wrong indifferently going down before them but it has to be it is needed the future history of russia will be the history of the french revolution over again but with this difference that the educated class the thinkers who are pushing forward the dumb masses are doing so with their eyes open there will be no Mirabeau, no Danton, to be appalled at the people's ingratitude. The men who today are working for revolution in Russia number among their ranks statesmen, soldiers, delicately nurtured women, rich landowners, prosperous tradesmen, students familiar with the lessons of history, they have no misconceptions concerning the blind Frankenstein into which they are breathing life. He will crush them. They know it. 
but with them he will crush the injustice and stupidity they have grown to hate better than they love themselves the russian peasant when he rises will prove more terrible more pitiless than were the men of 1790 he is less intelligent more brutal they sing a wild sad song these russian cattle the while they work they sing it in chorus on the quays while hauling the cargo they sing it in the factory they chant it on the weary endless steps reaping the corn they may not eat it's about the good time their masters are having of the feasting and the merrymaking but the last line of every verse is the same when you ask a russian to translate it for you he shrugs his shoulders oh it means he says that their time will come some day it is a sad pathetic haunting refrain they sing it in the drawing rooms of moscow and st petersburg and somehow the light talk and laughter die away and the hush like a chill breath enters by the closed door and passes through it is a curious song like the wailing of a tired wind and one day it will sweep over the land heralding terror a scotchman i met in russia told me that when he first came out to act as manager of a large factory just outside st petersburg belonging to his scottish employers he unwittingly made a mistake the first week when paying his work people by a miscalculation of the russian money he paid some three hundred men each one nearly a ruble short he discovered his error before the following saturday and then put the matter right the man accepted his explanation with perfect composure and without any comment whatever the thing astonished him but you must have known i was paying you short he said to one of them why didn't you tell me of it oh answered the man we thought you were putting it in your own pocket and that if we had complained it would only have meant dismissal for us no one would have taken our word against yours corruption appears to be so general throughout the whole of russia that all classes have come to accept it as part of the established order of things a friend gave me a little dog to bring away with me it was a valuable animal and i wished to keep it with me it is strictly forbidden to take dogs into railway carriages the list of the pains and penalties for doing so frightened me considerably oh that will be all right my friend assured me have a few rubles loose in your pocket i tipped the station master and i tipped the guard and started pleased with myself but i had not anticipated what was in store for me the news that an englishman with a dog in a basket and rubles in his pocket was coming must have been telegraphed all down the line at almost every stopping place some enormous official generally wearing a sword and a helmet boarded the train at first these fellows terrified me i took them for field marshals at least when they saw the dog their astonishment was boundless vision of siberia crossed my mind anxious and trembling i gave the first one a gold piece he shook me warmly by the hand i thought he was going to kiss me if i had offered him my cheek i am sure he would have done so with the next one i felt less apprehensive for a couple of rubles he blessed me so i gathered and commending me to the care of the almighty departed 
Before I had reached the German frontier, I was giving away the equivalent of English sixpences to men with the bearing and carriage of major generals, and to see their faces brighten up and to receive their heartfelt benedictions was well worth the money. It is a fascinating subject, Russia, but for a wholesome fear of my editor, I feel I could ramble on for columns. Nature has made life hard there for rich and poor alike. To the banks of the Neva, with its ague and influenza bestowing fogs and mists, one imagines that the devil himself must have guided Peter the Great. Show me in all my dominions the most hopelessly unattractive site on which to build a city. Peter must have prayed, and the devil, having discovered the site on which St. Petersburg now stands, must have returned to his master in high good feather. I think, my dear Peter, I have found you something really unique. It is a pestilent swamp to which a mighty river brings bitter blasts and marrow-chilling fogs. In the brief summer time the wind will bring you sand. In this way you will combine the disadvantages of the North Pole with those of the desert of Sahara. In the winter time, the Russians light their great stoves and doubly barricade their doors and windows. And in this atmosphere, like that of a greenhouse, many of their women will pass six months never venturing out of doors. Even the men only go out at intervals. Every office, every shop is an oven. Men of forty have white hair and parchment faces, and the women are old at thirty. The farm laborers during the few summer months work almost entirely without sleep. They leave that for the winter, when they shut themselves up like dormice in their hovels, their store of food and vodka buried underneath the floor. For days together they sleep, then wake and dig, then sleep again. So it is even with their batters. The Russian party lasts all night. In an adjoining room are beds and couches. Half a dozen guests are always sleeping. An hour contents them. Then they rejoin the company and other guests take their places. The Russian eats when he feels so disposed. The table is always spread. The guests come and go. Once a year there is a great feast in Moscow. The Russian merchant and his friends sit down early in the day, and a sort of thick sweet pancake is served up hot. The feast continues for many hours, and the ambition of the Russian merchant is to eat more than his neighbor. Fifty or sixty of these hot cakes a man will consume at a sitting, and a dozen funerals in Moscow is often the result. An uncivilized people, we call them in our lordly way, but they are young. They will see us out, I am inclined to think. Their energy, their intelligence, when this show above. The groundwork and their animalism are monstrous. I have known a Russian to learn Chinese within six months. English? They learn it while you are talking to them. The children play at chess and study the violin for their own amusement. The world will be glad of Russia when she has put her house in order. San Francisco called, September 4th, 1904. 
End of Russians as I Know Them by Jerome Klapka Jerome Read by Mark Chulsky, Massachusetts, 2021「A Scrap of Curious History」by Mark Twain, 1835-1910. to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Marion City on the Mississippi River, in the state of Missouri, a village. Time, 1845. La bourbeule les bains France. A village. Time, the end of June, 1894. I was in the one village in that early time. I am in the other now. These times and places are sufficiently wide apart, yet today I have the strange sense of being thrust back into that Missourian village, and of reliving certain stirring days that I lived there so long ago. Last Saturday night the life of the President of the French Republic was taken by an Italian assassin. Last night a mob surrounded our hotel, shouting, howling, singing the Marseillaise, and pelting our windows with sticks and stones, for we have Italian waiters and the mob demanded that they be turned out of the house instantly to be drubbed and then driven out of the village. Everyone in the hotel remained up until far into the night and experienced the several kinds of terror which one reads about in books, which tell of night attacks by Italians and by French mobs. The growing roar of the oncoming crowd, the arrival with rain of stones and a crash of glass, the withdrawal to rearrange plans, followed by a silence ominous, threatening, and harder to bear than even the active siege and the noise. The landlord and the two village policemen stood their ground, and at last the mob was persuaded to go away and leave our Italians in peace. Today four of the ringleaders have been sentenced to heavy punishment of a public sort, and are become local heroes by consequence. That is the very mistake which was at first made in the Missourian village half a century ago. The mistake was repeated and repeated, just as France is doing in these latter months. In our village we had our Ravachals, our Henrys, our Valiants, and in a humble way our Cesario. I hope I have spelled this name wrong. Fifty years ago we passed through in all essentials, what France has been passing through during the past two or three years, in the matter of periodical frights, horrors and shudderings. In several details the parallels are quaintly exact. In that day, for a man to speak out openly and proclaim himself an enemy of Negro slavery was simply to proclaim himself a madman, for he was blaspheming against the holiest thing known to a Missourian, and could not be in his right mind. For a man to proclaim himself an anarchist in France three years ago was to proclaim himself a madman. He could not be in his right mind. Now the original old first blasphemer against any institution profoundly venerated by a community is quite sure to be in earnest. His followers and imitators may be humbugs and self-seekers, but he himself is sincere. His heart is in his protest. Robert Hardy was our first abolitionist. Awful name. He was a journeyman cooper and worked in the big cooper shop belonging to the great pork-packing establishment, which was Marion City's chief pride and sole source of prosperity. He was a New Englander, a stranger, and, being a stranger, he was, of course, regarded as an inferior person for that has been human nature from adam down and of course also he was made to feel unwelcome for this is the ancient law with man and the other animals hardy was thirty years old and a bachelor pale given to reverie and reading 
he was reserved and seemed to prefer the isolation which had fallen to his lot. He was treated to many side remarks by his fellows, but as he did not resent them, it was decided that he was a coward. All of a sudden he proclaimed himself an abolitionist, straight out and publicly. He said that Negro slavery was a crime, an infamy. For a moment the town was paralysed with astonishment. Then it broke into a fury of rage and swarmed towards the cooper shop to lynch Hardy. But the Methodist minister made a powerful speech to them and stayed their hands. He proved to them that Hardy was insane and not responsible for his words, that no man could be sane and utter such words. So Hardy was saved. Being insane, he was allowed to go on talking. He was found to be good entertainment. Several nights running, he made abolition speeches in the open air, and all the town flocked to hear and laugh. He implored them to believe him sane and sincere, and have pity on the poor slaves, and take measures for the restoration of their stolen rights, or in no long time blood would flow. Blood, blood, rivers of blood. It was great fun, but all of a sudden the aspect of things changed. A slave came flying from Palmyra, the country seat, a few miles back, and was about to escape in a canoe to Illinois and freedom in the dull twilight of the approaching dawn, when the town constable seized him. Hardy happened along and tried to rescue the negro. There was a struggle, and the constable did not come out of it alive. Hardy crossed the river with the negro, and then came back to give himself up. All this took time, for the Mississippi is not a French brook, like the Seine, the Loire, and those other rivulets, but is a real river nearly a mile wide. The town was on hand in force by now, but the Methodist preacher and the sheriff had already made arrangements in the interests of order, so Hardy was surrounded by a strong guard and safely conveyed to the village calaboose, in spite of all the effort of the mob to get hold of him. The reader will have begun to perceive that this Methodist minister was a prompt man, a prompt man, with active hands and a good headpiece. Williams was his name, Damon Williams. Damon Williams in public, damnation Williams in private, because he was so powerful on that theme and so frequent. The excitement was prodigious. The constable was the first man who had ever been killed in the town. The event was by long odds the most imposing in the town's history. It lifted the humble village into sudden importance. Its name was in everybody's mouth for twenty miles around. And so was the name of Robert Hardy. Robert Hardy, the stranger, the despised. In a day he was become the person of most consequence in the region. The only person talked about. As to those other Coopers, they found their position curiously changed. They were important people, or unimportant, now, in proportion as to how large or how small had been their intercourse with the new celebrity. The two or three who had really been on a sort of familiar footing with him found themselves objects of admiring interest with the public and of envy with their shopmates. The village weekly journal had lately gone into new hands. The new man was an enterprising fellow, and he made the most of the tragedy. He issued an extra. Then he put up posters promising to devote his whole paper to the matters connected with the great event. There would be a full and intensely interesting biography of the murderer, and even a portrait of him. He was as good as his word. He carved the portrait himself on the back of a wooden type, and a terror it was to look at. It made a great commotion, for this was the first time the village paper had ever contained a picture. The village was very proud. The output of the paper was ten times as great as it had ever been before, yet every copy was sold. When the trial came on, people came from all the farms around, and from Hannibal and Quincy, and even from Kirkuk, and the courthouse could hold only a fraction of the crowd that applied for admission. 
The trial was published in the village paper, with fresh and still more trying pictures of the accused. Hardy was convicted and hanged. A mistake. People came from miles around to see the hanging. They brought cakes and cider, also the women and children, and made a picnic of the matter. It was the largest crowd the village had ever seen. The rope that hanged Hardy was eagerly brought up, in inch samples, for everybody wanted a memento of the memorable event. Martyrdom gilded with notoriety has its fascinations. Within one week afterwards, four young lightweights in the village proclaimed themselves abolitionists. In life, Hardy had not been able to make a convert. Everybody laughed at him, but nobody could laugh at his legacy. The four swaggered around with their slouch hats pulled down over their faces and hinted darkly at awful possibilities. The people were troubled and afraid and showed it. And they were stunned, too. They could not understand it. Abolitionist had always been a term of shame and horror, yet here were four young men who were not only not ashamed to bear that name, but were grimly proud of it. Respectable young men they were, too, of good families, and brought up in the church. Ed Smith, the printer's apprentice, nineteen, had been the head Sunday school boy, and had once recited three thousand Bible verses without making a break. Dick Savage, twenty, the baker's apprentice, Will Joyce, twenty-two, journeyman blacksmith, and Henry Taylor, twenty-four, tobacco stemmer, were the other three. They were all of a sentimental cast. They were all romantic readers. They all wrote poetry, such as it was. They were all vain and foolish, but they had never before been suspected of having anything bad in them. They withdrew from society and grew more and more mysterious and dreadful. They presently achieved the distinction of being denounced by names from the pulpit, which made an immense stir. This was grandeur, this was fame. They were envied by all the other young fellows now. This was natural. Their company grew, grew alarmingly. They took a name. It was a secret name and was divulged to no outsider. Publicly they were simply the abolitionists. They had passwords, grips and signs. They had secret meetings. Their initiations were conducted with gloomy pomp and ceremonies at midnight. They always spoke of Hardy as the martyr, and every little while they moved through the principal street in procession at midnight, black-robed, masked, to the measured tap of the solemn drum, on pilgrimage to the martyr's grave, where they went through with some majestic fooleries and swore vengeance upon his murderers. They gave previous notice of the pilgrimage by small posters, and warned everybody to keep indoors and darken all houses along the route and leave the road empty. These warnings were obeyed, for there was a skull and crossbones at the top of the poster. When this kind of thing had been going on about eight weeks, a quite natural thing happened. A few men of character and grit woke up out of the nightmare of fear, which had been stupefying their faculties, and began to discharge scorn and scoffings at themselves and the community for enduring this child's play, and at the same time they proposed to end it straight away. Everybody felt an uplift. Life was breathed into their dead spirits. Their courage rose and they began to feel like men again. This was on a Saturday. All day the new feeling grew and strengthened. It grew with a rush. It brought inspiration and cheer with it. Midnight saw a united community, full of zeal and pluck, and with a clearly defined and welcome piece of work in front of it. The best organiser and strongest and bitterest talker on the great Saturday was the Presbyterian clergyman who had denounced the original four from his pulpit, Reverend Hiram Fletcher, and he promised to use his pulpit in the public interest again now. On the morrow he had revelations to make, he said secrets of the dreadful society but the revelations were never made at half past two in the morning the dead silence of the village was broken by a crashing explosion 
and the town patrol saw the preacher's house spring in a wreck of whirling fragments into the sky. The preacher was killed, together with a negro woman, his only slave and servant. The town was paralysed again, and with reason. To struggle against a visible enemy is a thing worthwhile, and there is a plenty of men who stand always ready to undertake it. But to struggle against an invisible one, an invisible one who sneaks in and does his awful work in the dark and leaves no trace, that is another matter. That is a thing to make the bravest tremble and hold back. The cowed populace were afraid to go to the funeral. The man who was to have had a packed church to hear him expose and denounce the common enemy had but a handful to see him buried. The coroner's jury had brought in a verdict of death by the visitation of God, for no witness came forward. If any existed, they prudently kept out of the way. Nobody seemed sorry. Nobody wanted to see the terrible secret society provoked into the commission of further outrages. Everybody wanted the tragedy hushed up ignored forgotten if possible and so there was a bitter surprise and an unwelcome one when will joyce the blacksmith's journeyman came out and proclaimed himself the assassin plainly he was not minded to be robbed of his glory he made his proclamation and stuck to it stuck to it and insisted upon a trial here was an ominous thing here was a new and peculiarly formidable terror for a motive was revealed here which society could not hope to deal with successfully. Vanity, thirst for notoriety. If men were going to kill for notoriety's sake and to win the glory of newspaper renown, a big trial and a showy execution, what possible invention of man could discourage or deter them? The town was in a sort of panic. It did not know what to do. However, the grand jury had to take hold of the matter. It had no choice. It brought in a true bill, and presently the case went to the county court. The trial was a fine sensation. The prisoner was the principal witness for the prosecution. He gave a full account of the assassination. He furnished even the minutest particulars. How he deposited his keg of powder and laid his train from the house to such and such a spot, how George Ronald and Henry Hart came along just then, smoking, and he borrowed Hart's cigar and fired a train with it, shouting, Down with all slave tyrants! And how Hart and Ronalds made no effort to capture him, but ran away, and had never come forward to testify yet. But they had to testify now, and they did, and pitiful it was to see how reluctant they were, and how scared. The crowded house listened to Joyce's fearful tale with a profound and breathless interest, and in a deep hush, which was not broken till he broke it himself, in concluding, with a roaring repetition, of his death to all slave tyrants, which came so unexpectedly and so startlingly that it made everyone present catch his breath and gasp. The trial was put in the paper, with biography and large portrait and other slanderous and insane pictures, and the edition sold beyond imagination. The execution of Joyce was a fine and picturesque thing. It drew a vast crowd. Good places in trees and seats on rail fences sold for half a dollar piece. Lemonade and gingerbread stands had great prosperity. Joyce recited a furious and fantastic and denunciatory speech on the scaffold, which had imposing passages of schoolboy eloquence in it, and gave him a reputation on the spot as an orator, and his name later in the society's records of the martyr orator. He went to his death breathing slaughter and charging his society to avenge his murder. If he knew anything of human nature, he knew that to plenty of young fellows present in that great crowd he was a grand hero and enviably situated. He was hanged. It was a mistake. Within a month from his death, the society which he had honoured had twenty new members, some of them earnest, determined men. They did not court distinction 
in the same way, but they celebrated his martyrdom. The crime which had been obscure and despised had become lofty and glorified. Such things were happening all over the country. Wild-brained martyrdom was succeeded by uprising and organization. Then, in natural order, followed riot, insurrection, and the rack and restitutions of war. It was bound to come, and it would naturally come in that way. It has been the manner of reform since the beginning of the world. End of A Scrap of Curious History by Mark Twain Forty seven Stewed Eels from the Campers Handbook nineteen oh eight by T. H. Holding. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Forty seven Stewed Eels from the Campers Handbook nineteen oh eight by t h holding stewed eels in camp stewed eels are rather a luxury not only because they need a little cooking but they need a little catching the difficulty with an eel is that it is rather disagreeable to handle though to those who like eels this is a trifle there are two things which have to be done first is to skin the eel and the second is to carefully cleanse it note the words italicized when camping near a river recently a man who was to have saved me a quart of milk sold it and in a spirit of contrition presented me with a fine fat eel two feet nine inches long i was delighted as it was my first eel I consulted many people as to how to remove the skin. No one could tell me, and no one could do it. Now I know that it is imperative to take the skin off the eel because that skin contains that which is not good for human creatures to eat. The correct way to remove the skin is to nick it under the ear each side until you get two small corners that you can take hold of. Pull these tails back a good bit. Be careful and take time at the beginning. Hang the head fast to a nail or get the other person to hold the eel by the head. Then, having properly started, the skin is a mere matter of a moment or two. The belly must be ripped and the interior most carefully washed and scrubbed and examined so there is not the slightest suggestion of anything other than clean flesh of the eel do not let the head and tail go into the pan stew until it is cooked enough then add your parsley butter the mixture for which is flour water parsley salt and pepper pour it into the pan and continue stewing until it thickens and the parsley is cooked as a caution however i think it best to mention that after eating of three sections of my long eel it was my misfortune to be very seriously affected and for a matter of twenty-four hours i suffered sickness and all the evidence of ptomaine poisoning such a case is not infrequent with those who eat eels caught in english rivers eels from ireland are different because they come chiefly off the limestone and sandy bottom of the lakes and not from the bottoms of muddy sluggish streams or pools the end of forty seven stewed eels from the campers handbook by t h holding the study of administration by woodrow wilson this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. The Study of Administration. 
I suppose that no practical science is ever studied where there is no need to know it. The very fact, therefore, that the eminently practical science of administration is finding its way into college courses in this country would prove that this country needs to know more about administration were such proof of the fact required to make out a case. It need not be said, however, that we do not look into college programs for proof of this fact. It is a thing almost taken for granted among us that the present movement called civil service reform must, after the accomplishment of its first purpose, expand into efforts to improve, not the personnel only, but also the organization and methods of our government offices, because it is plain that their organization and methods need improvement, only less than their personnel. It is the object of administrative study to discover, first, what government can properly and successfully do, and, secondly, how it can do these proper things, with the utmost possible efficiency and at the least possible cost, either of money or of energy. On both these points there is obviously much need of light among us, and only careful study can supply that light. Before entering on that study, however, it is needful, first, to take some account of what others have done in the same line, that is to say, of the history of the study, second, to ascertain just what is its subject matter, third, to determine just what are the best methods by which to develop it, and the most clarifying political conceptions to carry with us into it. Unless we know and settle these things, we shall set out without chart or compass. The science of administration is the latest fruit of that study of the science of politics, which was begun some 2200 years ago. It is a birth of our own century, almost of our own generation. Why was it so late in coming? Why did it wait until this too busy century of ours to demand attention for itself? Administration is the most obvious part of government. It is government in action. It is the executive, the operative, the most visible side of government, and is, of course, as old as government itself. It is government in action, and one might very naturally expect to find that government in action had arrested the attention and provoked the scrutiny of writers of politics very early in the history of systematic thought. But such was not the case. No one wrote systematically of administration as a branch of the science of government until the present century had passed its first youth and had begun to put forth its characteristic flower of systematic knowledge. Up to our own day all the political writers whom we now read had thought, argued, dogmatized only about the constitution of government, about the nature of the state, the essence and seat of sovereignty, popular power and kingly prerogative, about the greatest meanings lying at the heart of government, and the high ends set before the purpose of government, by man's nature and man's aims. The central field of controversy was that great field of theory, in which monarchy rode tilt against democracy in which oligarchy would have built for itself strongholds of privilege, and in which tyranny sought opportunity to make good its claim to receive submission from all competitors. Amidst this high warfare of principles, administration could command no pause for its own consideration. The question was always, who shall make law, and what shall that law be? The other question, how law should be administered with enlightenment, with equity, with speed, and without friction, was put aside as practical detail which clerks could arrange, after doctors had agreed upon principles. That political philosophy took this direction was, of course, no accident, no chance preference or perverse whim of political philosophers. The philosophy of any time is, as Hegel says, nothing but the spirit of that time expressed in abstract thought. And political philosophy, like philosophy of every other kind, has only held up the mirror to contemporary affairs. The trouble in early times was almost altogether about the constitution of government, and consequently that was what engrossed men's thoughts. There was little or no trouble about administration, at least little that was heeded by administrators. The functions of government were simple, because life itself was simple. Government went about imperatively and compelled men, without thought of consulting their wishes. There was no complex system of public revenues and public debts to puzzle financiers. There were, consequently, 
no financiers to be puzzled. No one who possessed power was long at a loss how to use it. The great and only question was, who shall possess it? Populations were of manageable numbers, property was of simple sorts. There were plenty of farms, but no stocks and bonds, more cattle than vested interests. I have said that all this was true of early times, but it was substantially true also of comparatively late times. One does not have to look back of the last century, for the beginnings of the present complexities of trade and perplexities of commercial speculation, nor for the portentous birth of national debts. Good Queen Bess, doubtless, thought that the monopolies of the sixteenth century were hard enough to handle, without burning her hands. But they are not remembered in the presence of the giant monopolies of the nineteenth century. When Blackstone lamented that corporations had no bodies to be kicked, and no souls to be damned, he was anticipating the proper time for such regrets by a full century. The perennial discords between master and workmen, which now so often disturb industrial society began before the black death and the statute of laborers, but never before our own day did they assume such ominous proportions as they wear now. In brief, if difficulties of governmental action are to be seen gathering in other countries, they are to be seen culminating in our own. This is the reason why administrative tasks have, nowadays, to be so studiously and systematically adjusted to carefully tested standards of policy, the reason why we are having now what we never had before, a science of administration. The weightier debates of constitutional principle are even yet by no means concluded, but they are no longer of more immediate practical moment, the questions of administration. It is getting harder to run a constitution than to frame one. Here is Mr. Badgett's graphic, whimsical way of depicting the difference between the old and the new in administration. In early times, when a despot wishes to govern a distant province, he sends down a satrap on a grand horse, and other people on little horses, and very little is heard of the satrap again, unless he send back some of the little people to tell what he has been doing. No great labor of superintendence is possible. Common rumor and casual report are the sources of intelligence. If it seems certain that the province is in a bad state, say trap number one is recalled, and say trap number two sent out in his stead. In civilized countries the process is different. You erect a bureau in the province you want to govern. You make it write letters and copy letters. It sends home eight reports per diem to the head bureau in St. Petersburg. Nobody does a sum in the province without someone doing the same sum in the capital, to check him to see that he does it correctly. The consequence of this is, to throw on the heads of departments an amount of reading and labor, which can only be accomplished by the greatest natural aptitude, the most efficient training, the most firm and regular industry. Footnote. Essay on Sir William Pitt. There is scarcely a single duty of government which was once simple, which is not now complex. Government once had but a few masters, it now has scores of masters. Majorities formerly only underwent government, they now conduct government. Where government once might follow the whims of a court, it must now follow the views of a nation. And those views are steadily widening to new conceptions of state duty, so that, at the same time that the functions of government are every day becoming more complex and difficult, they are also vastly multiplying in number. Administration is everywhere putting its hands to new undertakings. The utility, cheapness, and success of the government's postal service, for instance, points towards the early establishment of governmental control of the telegraph system. Or, even if our government is not to follow the lead of the governments of Europe in buying or building both telegraph and railroad lines, no one can doubt that in some way, it must make itself master of masterful corporations. The creation of national commissioners of railroads, in addition to the older state commissions, involves a very important and delicate extension of administrative functions. Whatever hold of authority state or federal governments are to take upon corporations, there must follow cares and responsibilities which will require not a little wisdom, knowledge, and experience. Such things must be studied in order to be well done. 
and these as i have said are only a few of the doors which are being opened to offices of government the idea of the state and the consequent ideal of its duty are undergoing noteworthy change and the idea of the state is the conscience of administration seeing every day new things which the state ought to do the next thing is to see clearly how it ought to do them this is why there should be a science of administration which shall seek to straighten the paths of government to make its business less unbusinesslike to strengthen and purify its organization and to crown its duties with dutifulness this is one reason why there is such a science but where has this science grown up surely not on this side of the sea not much impartial scientific method is to be discerned in our administrative practices the poisonous atmosphere of city government the crooked secrets of state administration the confusion sinecurism and corruption ever and again discovered in the bureaus at washington forbid us to believe that any clear conceptions of what constitutes good administration are as yet very widely current in the united states no american writers have hitherto taken no very important part in the advancement of this science it has found its doctors in europe it is not of our making it is a foreign science speaking very little of the language of english or american principle it employs only foreign tongues it utters none but what are to our minds alien ideas its aims its examples its conditions are almost exclusively grounded in the histories of foreign races in the precedents of foreign systems in the lessons of foreign revolutions it has been developed by french and german professors and is consequently in all parts adapted to the needs of a compact state and made to fit highly centralized forms of government whereas to answer our purposes it must be adapted not to a simple and compact but to a complex and multiform state and made to fit highly decentralized forms of government if we would employ it we must americanize it and that not formally in language merely but radically in thought principle and aim as well it must learn our constitutions by heart must get the bureaucratic fever out of its veins must inhale much free american air if the explanation be sought why a science manifestly so susceptible of being made useful to all governments alike should have received attention first in europe where government has long been a monopoly rather than in england or the united states where government has long been a common franchise the reason will doubtless be found to be twofold first that in europe just because government was independent of popular assent there was more governing to be done and second that the desire to keep government a monopoly made the monopolists interested in discovering the least irritating means of governing they were besides few enough to adopt means promptly it will be instructive to look into this matter a little more closely in speaking of european governments i do not of course include england she has not refused to change with the times she has simply tempered the severity of the transition from a polity of aristocratic privilege to a system of democratic power by slow measures of constitutional reform which without preventing revolution has confined it to paths of peace but the countries of the continent for a long time desperately struggled against all change and would have diverted revolution by softening the asperities of absolute government they sought so to perfect their machinery as to destroy all wearing friction so to sweeten their methods with consideration for the interests of the governed as to placate all hindering hatred and so assiduously and opportunely to offer their aid to all classes of undertakings as to render themselves indispensable to the industrious they did at last give the people constitutions and the franchise but even after that they obtained leave to continue despotic by becoming paternal they made themselves too efficient to be dispensed with too smoothly operative to be noticed too enlightened to be inconsiderately questioned too benevolent to be suspected too powerful to be coped with all this has required study and they have closely studied it on this side of the sea we the while had known no great difficulties of government with a new country in which there was room and remunerative employment for everybody with liberal principles of government and unlimited skill in practical politics 
we were long exempted from the need of being anxiously careful about plans and methods of administration. We have naturally been slow to see the use or significance of those many volumes of learned research and painstaking examination into the ways and means of conducting government which the presses of Europe have been sending to our libraries. Like a lusty child, government with us has expanded in nature and grown great in stature, but has also become awkward in movement. The vigor and increase of its life has been altogether out of proportion with its skill in living. It has gained strength, but it has not acquired deportment. Great, therefore, as has been our advantage over the countries of Europe, in point of ease and health of constitutional development, now that the time for more careful administrative adjustments and larger administrative knowledge has come to us, we are at a signal disadvantage as compared with the transatlantic nations, and this for reasons which I shall try to make clear. Judging by the constitutional histories of the chief nations of the modern world, there may be said to be three periods of growth through which government has passed in all the most highly developed of existing systems, and through which it promises to pass in all the rest. The first of these periods is that of absolute rulers, and of an administrative system adapted to absolute rule. The second is that in which constitutions are framed to do away with absolute rulers, and substitute popular control, and in which administration is neglected for these higher concerns and the third is that in which the sovereign people undertake to develop administration under this new constitution which has brought them into power. Those governments are now in the lead in administrative practice, which had rulers still absolute, but also enlightened, when those modern days of political illumination came in which it was made evident, to all but the blind, that governors are properly only the servants of the governed. In such governments, Administration has been organized to subserve the general weal, with the simplicity and effectiveness vouchsafed only to the undertakings of a single will. Such was the case in Prussia, for instance, where administration has been most studied and most nearly perfected. Frederick the Great, stern and masterful as was his rule, still sincerely professed to regard himself as only the chief servant of the state, to consider his great office a public trust. And it was he who, building upon the foundations laid by his father, began to organize the public service of Prussia as in very earnest a service to the public. His no less absolute successor, Frederick William III, under the inspiration of Stein, again, in his turn, advanced the work still further, planning many of the broader structural features which give firmness and form to Prussian administration today. Almost the whole of the admirable system has been developed by kingly initiative. Of similar origin was the practice, if not the plan, of modern French administration, with its symmetrical divisions of territory and its orderly gradations of office. The days of the revolution, of the constituent assembly, were days of constitution writing, but they can hardly be called days of constitution making. The revolution heralded a period of constitutional development, the entrance of France upon the second of those periods which I have enumerated, but it did not itself inaugurate such a period. It interrupted and unsettled absolutism, but did not destroy it. Napoleon succeeded the monarchs of France to exercise a power as unrestricted as they had ever possessed. The recasting of French administration by Napoleon is, therefore, my second example of the perfecting of civil machinery by the single will of an absolute ruler before the dawn of a constitutional era. No corporate, popular will could ever have effected arrangements such as those which Napoleon commanded. Arrangements so simple at the expense of local prejudice, so logical in their indifference to popular choice, might be decreed by a constituent assembly, but could not be established only by the unlimited authority of a despot. The system of the year eight was ruthlessly thorough and heartlessly perfect. It was, besides, in large part, a return to the despotism that had been overthrown. Among those nations, on the other hand, which entered upon a season of constitution-making and popular reform, before administration had received the impress of liberal principle, administrative improvement has been tardy and half done. Once a nation has embarked in the business of manufacturing constitutions, it finds it exceedingly difficult to close out that business 
and opened for the public a bureau of skilled economical administration there seems to be no end to the tinkering of constitutions your ordinary constitution will last you hardly ten years without repair or additions and the time for administrative detail comes late here of course our examples are england and our own country in the days of the angevin kings before constitutional life had taken root in the great charter legal and administrative reforms began to proceed with sense and vigor under the impulse of henry the second's shrewd busy pushing indomitable spirit and purpose and kingly initiative seemed destined in england as elsewhere to shape governmental growth at its will but impulsive errant richard and weak despicable john were not the men to carry out such schemes as their fathers administrative development gave place in their reigns to constitutional struggles and parliament became king before any english monarch had had the practical genius or the enlightened conscience to devise just and lasting forms for the civil service of the state the english race consequently has long and successfully studied the art of curbing executive power to the constant neglect of the art of perfecting executive methods it has exercised itself much more in controlling than in energizing government it has been more concerned to render government just and moderate than to make it facile well ordered and effective english and american political history has been a history not of administrative development but of legislative oversight not of progress in governmental organization but of advance in law-making and political criticism consequently we have reached a time when administrative study and creation are imperatively necessary to the well-being of our governments saddled with the habits of a long period of constitution making that period has practically closed so far as the establishment of essential principles is concerned but we cannot shake off its atmosphere we go on criticizing when we ought to be creating we have reached the third of the periods i have mentioned the period namely when the people have to develop administration in accordance with the constitutions they won for themselves in a previous period of struggle with absolute power but we are not prepared for the tasks of the new period such an explanation seems to afford the only escape from blank astonishment at the fact that in spite of our vast advantages in point of political liberty and above all in point of practical political skill and sagacity so many nations are ahead of us in administrative organization and administrative skill why for instance have we but just begun purifying a civil service which was rotten full fifty years ago to say that slavery diverted us is but to repeat what i have said that flaws in our constitution delayed us of course all reasonable preference would declare for this english and american course of politics rather than for that of any european country we should not like to have had prussia's history for the sake of having prussia's administrative skill and prussia's particular system of administration would quite suffocate us it is better to be untrained and free than to be servile and systematic still there is no denying that it would be better yet to be both free in spirit and proficient in practice it is this even more reasonable preference which impels us to discover what there may be to hinder or delay us in naturalizing this much to be desired science of administration what then is there to prevent well principally popular sovereignty it is harder for democracy to organize administration than for monarchy the very completeness of our most cherished political successes in the past embarrasses us we have enthroned public opinion and it is forbidden for us to hope during its reign for any quick schooling of the sovereign in executive expertness or in the conditions of perfect functional balance in government the very fact that we have realized popular rule in its fullness has made the task of organizing that rule just so much the more difficult in order to make any advance at all we must instruct and persuade a multitudinous monarch called public opinion a much less feasible undertaking than to influence a single monarch called a king an individual sovereign will adopt a simple plan and carry it out directly he will have but one opinion and he will embody that one opinion in one command but this other sovereign the people will have a score of differing opinions 
they can agree upon nothing simple. Advance must be made through compromise, by a compounding of differences, by a trimming of plans and a suppression of two straightforward principles. There will be a succession of resolves running through a course of years, a dropping fire of commands running through a whole gamut of modifications. In government, as in virtue, the hardest of hard things is to make progress. Formerly, the reason for this was that the single person who was sovereign was generally either selfish, ignorant, timid, or a fool, albeit there was now and again one who was wise. Nowadays the reason is that the many, the people who are sovereign have no single ear which one can approach, and are selfish, ignorant, timid, stubborn, or foolish with the selfishnesses, the ignorances, the stubbornnesses, the timidities, or the follies of several thousand persons, albeit there are hundreds who are wise. Once the advantage of the reformer was that the sovereign's mind had a definite locality, that it was contained in one man's head, and that consequently it could be gotten at, though it was his disadvantage that that mind learned only reluctantly, or only in small quantities, or was under the influence of someone who let it learn only the wrong things. Now, on the contrary, the reformer is bewildered by the fact that the sovereign's mind has no definite locality, but is contained in a voting majority of several million heads, and embarrassed by the fact that the mind of this sovereign also is under the influence of favorites, who are none the less favorites in a good old-fashioned sense of the word, because they are not persons but preconceived opinions, that is, prejudices which are not to be reasoned with, because they are not the children of reason. Wherever regard for public opinion is a first principle of government, practical reform must be slow and all reform must be full of compromises. For wherever public opinion exists, it must rule. This is now an axiom half the world over, and will presently come to be believed even in Russia. Whoever would effect a change in a modern constitutional government must first educate his fellow citizens to want some change. That done, he must persuade them to want the particular change he wants. He must first make public opinion willing to listen, and then see to it that it listen to the right things. He must stir it up to search for an opinion, and then manage to put the right opinion in its way. The first step is not less difficult than the second. With opinions, possession is more than nine points of the law. It is next to impossible to dislodge them. Institutions which one generation regards as only a makeshift approximation to the realization of a principle, the next generation honors as the nearest possible approximation to that principle, and the next worships as the principle itself. It takes scarcely three generations for the apotheosis. The grandson accepts his grandfather's hesitating experiment as an integral part of the fixed constitution of nature. Even if we had clear insight into all the political past, and could form out of perfectly instructed heads a few steady, infallible, placidly wise maxims of government, into which all sound political doctrine would be ultimately resolvable, would the country act on them? That is the question. The bulk of mankind is rigidly unphilosophical, and nowadays the bulk of mankind votes. A truth must become not only plain but also commonplace, before it will be seen by the people who go on to their work very early in the morning and not to act upon it must involve great and pinching inconveniences before these same people will make up their minds to act upon it. And where is this unphilosophical bulk of mankind more multifarious in its composition than in the United States? To know the public mind of this country, one must know the mind, not of Americans of the older stocks only, but also of Irishmen, of Germans, of Negroes. In order to get a footing for new doctrine, one must influence minds cast in every mold of race, minds inheriting every bias of environment, warped by the histories of a score of different nations, warmed or chilled, closed or expanded by almost every climate of the globe. So much, then, for the history of the study of administration, and the peculiarly difficult conditions under which, entering upon it when we do, we must undertake it. What, now, is the subject matter of this study, and what are its characteristic objects? The field of administration is a field of business. It is removed from the hurry and strife of politics. It at most points stands apart even from the debatable ground of constitutional study. 
it is a part of political life only as the methods of the counting-house are a part of the life of society only as machinery is part of the manufactured product but it is at the same time raised very far above the dull level of mere technical detail by the fact that through its greater principles it is directly connected with the lasting maxims of political wisdom the permanent truths of political progress the object of administrative study is to rescue executive methods from the confusion and costliness of empirical experiment and set them upon foundations laid deep in stable principle it is for this reason that we must regard civil service reform in its present stages as but a prelude to a fuller administrative reform we are now rectifying methods of appointment we must go on to adjust executive functions more fitly and to prescribe better methods of executive organization and action civil service reform is thus but a moral preparation for what is to follow it is clearing the moral atmosphere of official life by establishing the sanctity of public office as a public trust and by making the service unpartisan it is opening the way for making it businesslike by sweetening its motives it is rendering it capable of improving its methods of work let me expand a little what i have said of the province of administration most important to be observed is the truth already so much and so fortunately insisted upon by our civil service reformers namely that administration lies outside the proper sphere of politics administrative questions are not political questions although politics sets the tasks for administration it should not be suffered to manipulate its offices this is distinction of high authority eminent german writers insist upon it as of course bluntly politic page forty seven for instance bids us separate administration alike from politics and from law politics he says is state activity in things great and universal while administration on the other hand is the activity of the state in individual and small things politics is thus the special province of the statesman administration of the technical official policy does nothing without the aid of administration but administration is not therefore politics but we do not require german authority for this position this discrimination between administration and politics is now happily too obvious to need further discussion there is another distinction which must be worked into all our conclusions which though but another side of that between administration and politics is not quite so easy to keep sight of i mean the distinction between constitutional and administrative questions between those governmental adjustments which are essential to constitutional principle and those which are merely instrumental to possibly changing purposes of a wisely adapting convenience one cannot easily make clear to everyone just where administration resides in the various departments of any practicable government without entering upon particulars so numerous as to confuse and distinctions so minute as to distract no lines of demarcation setting apart administrative from non-administrative functions can be run between this and that department of government without being run up hill and down dale over dizzying heights of distinction and through dense jungles of statutory enactment hither and thither around ifs and buts winds and howevers until they become altogether lost to the common eye not accustomed to this sort of surveying and consequently not acquainted with the use of the theodolite of logical discernment a great deal of administration goes about incognito to most of the world being confounded now with political management and again with constitutional principle perhaps this ease of confusion may explain such utterances as that of niebuhr's liberty he says depends incomparably more upon administration than upon constitution at first sight this appears to be largely true apparently facility in the actual exercise of liberty does depend more upon administrative arrangements than upon constitutional guarantees although constitutional guarantees alone secure the existence of liberty but upon second thought is even so much as this true liberty no more consists in easy functional movement than intelligence consists in the ease and vigor with which the limbs of a strong man move the principles that rule within the man 
or the constitution are the vital springs of liberty or servitude because dependence and subjection are without chains are lightened by every easy working device of considerate paternal government they are not thereby transformed into liberty liberty cannot live apart from constitutional principle and no administration however perfect and liberal its methods can give men more than a poor counterfeit of liberty if it rests upon illiberal principles of government a clear view of the difference between the province of constitutional law and the province of administrative function ought to leave no room for misconception and it is possible to name some roughly definite criteria upon which such a view can be built public administration is detailed and systematic execution of public law every particular application of general law is an act of administration the assessment and raising of taxes for instance the hanging of a criminal the transportation and delivery of the mails the equipment and recruiting of the army and navy etc are all obviously acts of administration but the general laws which direct these things to be done are as obviously outside of and above administration the broad plans of governmental action are not administrative the detailed execution of such plans is administrative constitutions therefore properly concern themselves only with those instrumentalities of government which are to control general law our federal constitution observes this principle in saying nothing of even the greatest of the purely executive offices and speaking only of that president of the union who was to share the legislative and policy-making functions of government only of those judges of highest jurisdiction who were to interpret and guard its principles and not of those who were merely to give utterance to them this is not quite the distinction between will and answering deed because the administrator should have and does have a will of his own in the choice of means for accomplishing his work he is not and ought not to be a mere passive instrument the distinction is between general plans and special means there is indeed one point at which administrative studies trench on constitutional ground or at least upon what seems constitutional ground the study of administration philosophically viewed is closely connected with the study of the proper distribution of constitutional authority to be efficient it must discover the simplest arrangements by which responsibility can be unmistakably fixed upon officials the best way of dividing authority without hampering it and responsibility without obscuring it and this question of the distribution of authority when taken into the sphere of the higher the originating functions of government is obviously a central constitutional question if administrative study can discover the best principles upon which to base such distribution it will have done constitutional duty an invaluable service montesquieu did not i am convinced say the last word on this head to discover the best principle for the distribution of authority is of greater importance possibly under a democratic system where officials serve many masters than under others where they serve but a few all sovereigns are suspicious of their servants and the sovereign people is no exception to the rule but how is its suspicion to be allayed by knowledge if that suspicion could be clarified into wise vigilance it would be altogether salutary if that vigilance could be aided by the unmistakable placing of responsibility it would be altogether beneficent suspicion in itself is never healthful either in the private or in the public mind trust is strength in all relations of life and as it is the office of the constitutional reformer to create conditions of trustfulness so it is in the office of the administrative organizer to fit administration with conditions of clear-cut responsibility which shall ensure trustworthiness and let me say that large powers and unhampered discretion seem to me the indispensable conditions of responsibility public attention must be easily directed in each case of good or bad administration to just the man deserving of praise or blame there is no danger in power if only it be not irresponsible if it be divided dealt out in shares to many it is obscured and if it be obscured it is made irresponsible but if it be centered in heads of the service and in heads of the branches of the service it is easily watched and brought to book 
if to keep his office a man must achieve open and honest success, and if at the same time he feels himself entrusted with large freedom of discretion, the greater his power the less likely is he to abuse it, the more is he nerved and sobered and elevated by it. The less his power, the more safely obscure and unnoticed does he feel his position to be, and the more readily does he relapse into remissness. Just here we manifestly emerge upon the field of that still larger question, the proper relations between public opinion and administration. To whom is official trustworthiness to be disclosed, and by whom is it to be rewarded? Is the official to look to the public for his need of praise and his push of promotion, or only to his superior in office? Are the people to be called in to settle administrative discipline, as they are called in to settle constitutional principles? These questions evidently find their root in what is undoubtedly the fundamental problem of this whole study. That problem is, what part shall public opinion take in the conduct of administration? The right answer seems to be, that public opinion shall play the part of authoritative critic. But the method by which its authority shall be made to tell. Our peculiar American difficulty in organizing administration is not the danger of losing liberty, but the danger of not being able or willing to separate its essentials from its accidents. Our success is made doubtful by that besetting error of ours, the error of trying to do too much by vote. Self-government does not consist in having a hand in everything, any more than housekeeping consists necessarily in cooking dinner with one's own hands. The cook must be trusted with a large discretion as to the management of the fires and the ovens. In those countries in which public opinion has yet to be instructed in its privileges, yet to be accustomed to having its own way, this question as to the province of public opinion is much more readily soluble than in this country, where public opinion is wide awake, and quite intent upon having its own way anyhow. It is pathetic to see a whole book written by a German professor of political science for the purpose of saying to his countrymen, please try to have an opinion about national affairs. But a public which is so modest may at least be expected to be very docile and acquiescent in learning what things it has not a right to think and speak about imperatively. It may be sluggish, but it will not be meddlesome. It will submit to be instructed before it tries to instruct. Its political education will come before its political activity. In trying to instruct our own public opinion, we are dealing with a pupil apt to think itself quite sufficiently instructed beforehand. The problem is to make public opinion efficient, without suffering it to be meddlesome. Directly exercised, in the oversight of the daily details and in the choice of the daily means of government, public criticism is of course a clumsy nuisance, a rustic, handling delicate machinery. But as superintending the greater forces of formative policy alike in politics and administration, public criticism is altogether safe and beneficent, altogether indispensable. Let administrative study find the best means for giving public criticism this control and for shutting it out from all other interference. But is the whole duty of administrative study done when it has taught the people what sort of administration to desire and demand and how to get what they demand? ought it not to go on to drill candidates for the public service. There is an admirable movement towards universal political education now afoot in this country. The time will soon come when no college of respectability can afford to do without a well-filled chair of political science. But the education thus imparted will go but a certain length. It will multiply the number of intelligent critics of government, but it will create no competent body of administrators. It will prepare the way for the development of a sure-footed understanding of the general principles of government, but it will not necessarily foster skill in conducting government. It is an education which will equip legislators, perhaps, but not executive officials. If we are to improve public opinion, which is the motive power of government, we must prepare better officials as the apparatus of government. If we are to put in new boilers and to mend the fires which drive our governmental machinery, we must not leave the old wheels and joints and valves and bands, 
to creak and buzz and clatter on as best they may at bidding of the new force. We must put in new running parts, wherever there is the least lack of strength or adjustment. It will be necessary to organize democracy by sending up to the competitive examinations for the civil service men definitively prepared for standing liberal tests as to technical knowledge. A technically schooled civil service will presently have become indispensable. I know that a corps of civil servants prepared by a special schooling and drilled, after appointment, into a perfected organization, with appropriate hierarchy and characteristic discipline, seems to a great many very thoughtful persons, to contain elements which might combine to make an offensive official class, a distinct, semi-corporate body with sympathies divorced from those of a progressive, free-spirited people, and with hearts narrowed to the meanness of a bigoted officialism. Certainly such a class would be altogether hateful and harmful in the United States. Any measures calculated to produce it would for us be measures of reaction and of folly. But to fear the creation of a domineering, illiberal officialism, as a result of the studies I am here proposing, is to miss altogether the principle upon which I wish most to insist. That principle is, that administration in the United States must be at all points sensitive to public opinion. A body of thoroughly trained officials serving during good behavior, we must have in any case. That is a plain business necessity. But the apprehension that such a body will be anything un-American clears away the moment it is asked, what is to constitute good behavior? For that question obviously carries its own answer on its face. Steady, hearty allegiance to the policy of the government they serve will constitute good behavior. That policy will have no taint of officialism about it. It will not be the creation of permanent officials, but of statesmen whose responsibility to public opinion will be direct and inevitable. Bureaucracy can exist only where the whole service of the state is removed from the common political life of the people, its chiefs as well as its rank and file. Its motives, its objects, its policy, its standards, must be bureaucratic. It would be difficult to point out any examples of impudent exclusiveness and arbitrariness on the part of officials doing service under a chief department who really serve the people, as all our chiefs of departments must be made to do. It would be easy, on the other hand, to adduce other instances like that of the influence of Stein in Prussia, where the leadership of one statesman imbued with true public spirit transformed arrogant and perfunctory bureaus into public-spirited instruments of just government. The ideal for us is a civil service cultured and self-sufficient enough to act with sense and vigor, and yet so intimately connected with the popular thought, by means of elections and constant public counsel, as to find arbitrariness or class spirit quite out of the question. Having thus viewed in some sort the subject matter and the objects of this study of administration, what are we to conclude as to the methods best suited to it, the points of view most advantageous for it? Government is so near us, so much a thing of our daily familiar handling, that we can with difficulty see the need of any philosophical study of it, or the exact point of such study should it be undertaken. We have been on our feet too long to study now the art of walking. We are a practical people, made so apt, so adept in self-government by centuries of experimental drill, that we are scarcely any longer capable of perceiving the awkwardness of the particular system we may be using, just because it is so easy for us to use any system. We do not study the art of governing, we govern. But mere unschooled genius for affairs will not save us from sad blunders in administration. Though Democrats by long inheritance and repeated choice, we are still rather crude Democrats. Old as democracy is, its organization on a basis of modern ideas and conditions is still an unaccomplished work. The democratic state has yet to be equipped for carrying those enormous burdens of administration which the needs of this industrial and trading age are so fast accumulating. Without comparative studies in government, we cannot rid ourselves of the misconception that administration stands upon an essentially different basis in a democratic state from that on which it stands in a non-democratic state. 
after such study we could grant democracy the sufficient honor of ultimately determining by debate all essential questions affecting the public weal of basing all structures of policy upon the major will but we would have found but one rule of good administration for all governments alike so far as administrative functions are concerned all governments have a strong structural likeness more than that if they are to be uniformly useful and efficient they must have a strong structural likeness a free man has the same bodily organs the same executive parts as the slave however different may be his motives his services his energies monarchies and democracies radically different as they are in other respects have in reality much the same business to look to it is abundantly safe nowadays to insist upon this actual likeness of all governments because these are days when abuses of power are easily exposed and arrested in countries like our own by a bold alert inquisitive detective public thought and a sturdy popular self-dependence such as never existed before we are slow to appreciate this but it is easy to appreciate it try to imagine personal government in the united states it is like trying to imagine a national worship of zeus our imaginations are too modern for the feet but besides being safe it is necessary to see that for all governments alike the legitimate ends of administration are the same in order not to be frightened at the idea of looking into foreign systems of administration for instruction and suggestion in order to get rid of the apprehension that we might perchance blindly borrow something incompatible with our principles that man is blindly astray who denounces attempts to transplant foreign systems into this country it is impossible they simply would not grow here but why should we not use such parts of foreign contrivances as we want if they be in any way serviceable we are in no danger of using them in a foreign way we borrowed rice but we do not eat it with chopsticks we borrowed our whole political language from england but we leave the words king and lords out of it what did we ever originate except the action of the federal government upon individuals and some of the functions of the federal supreme court we can borrow the science of administration with safety and profit if only we read all fundamental differences of condition into its essential tenets we have only to filter it through our constitutions only to put it over a slow fire of criticism and distill away its foreign gases i know that there is a sneaking fear in some conscientiously patriotic minds that studies of european systems might signalize some foreign methods as better than some american methods and the fear is easily to be understood but it would scarcely be avowed in just any company it is the more necessary to insist upon thus putting away all prejudices against looking anywhere in the world but at home for suggestions in this study because nowhere else in the whole field of politics it would seem can we make use of the historical comparative method more safely than in this province of administration perhaps the more novel the forms we study the better we shall sooner learn the peculiarities of our own methods we can never learn either our own weaknesses or our own virtues by comparing ourselves with ourselves we are too used to the appearance and procedure of our own system to see its true significance perhaps even the english system is too much like our own to be used to the most profit in illustration it is the best on the whole to get entirely away from our own atmosphere and to be most careful in examining such systems as those of france and germany seeing our own institutions through such media we see ourselves as foreigners might see us were they to look at us without preconceptions of ourselves so long as we know only ourselves we know nothing let it be noted that it is the distinction already drawn between administration and politics which makes the comparative methods so safe in the field of administration when we study the administrative systems of france and germany knowing that we are not in search of political principles we need not care a peppercorn for the constitutional or political reasons which frenchmen or germans give for their practices when explaining them to us if i see a murderous fellow sharpening a knife cleverly i can borrow his way of sharpening the knife 
without borrowing his probable intention to commit murder with it and so if i see a monarchist dyed in the wool managing a public bureau well i can learn his business methods without changing one of my republican spots he may serve the king i will continue to serve the people but i should like to serve my sovereign as well as he serves his by keeping this distinction in view that is by studying administration as a means of putting our own politics into convenient practice as a means of making what is democratically politic toward all administratively possible towards each we are on perfectly safe ground and can learn without error what foreign systems have to teach us we thus devise an adjusting weight for our comparative method of study we can thus scrutinize the anatomy of foreign governments without fear of getting any of their diseases into our veins dissect alien systems without apprehension of blood poisoning our own politics must be the touchstone for all theories the principles on which to base a science of administration for america must be principles which have democratic policy very much at heart and to suit american habit all general theories must as theories keep modestly in the background not in open argument only but even in our own minds lest opinions satisfactory only to the standards of the library should be dogmatically used as if they must be quite as satisfactory to the standards of practical politics as well doctrinaire devices must be postponed to tested practices arrangements not only sanctioned by conclusive experience elsewhere but also congenial to american habit must be preferred without hesitation to theoretical perfection in a word steady practical statesmanship must come first closet doctrine second the cosmopolitan what to do must always be commanded by the american how to do it our duty is to supply the best possible life to a federal organization to systems within systems to make town city county state and federal governments live with a like strength and an equally assured healthfulness keeping each unquestionably its own master and yet making all interdependent and cooperative combining independence with mutual helpfulness the task is great and important enough to attract the best minds this interlacing of local self-government with federal self-government is quite a modern conception it is not like the arrangements of imperial federation in germany there local government is not yet fully local self-government the bureaucrat is everywhere busy his efficiency springs out of esprit de corps out of care to make ingratiating obeisance to the authority of a superior or at best out of the soil of a sensitive conscience he serves not the public but an irresponsible minister the question for us is how shall our series of governments within governments be so administered that it shall always be to the interest of the public officer to serve not his superior alone but the community also with the best efforts of his talents and the soberest service of his conscience how shall such service be made to his commonest interest by contributing abundantly to his sustenance to his dearest interest by furthering his ambition and to his highest interest by advancing his honor and establishing his character and how shall this be done alike for the local part and for the national whole if we solve this problem we shall again pilot the world there is a tendency is there not a tendency as yet dim but already steadily impulsive and clearly destined to prevail towards first the confederation of parts of empires like the british and finally of great states themselves instead of centralization of power there is to be wide union with tolerated divisions of prerogative this is a tendency towards the american type of governments joined with governments for the pursuit of common purposes in honorary equality and honorable subordination like principles of civil liberty are everywhere fostering like methods of government and if comparative studies of the ways and means of government should enable us to offer suggestions which will practically combine openness and vigor in the administration of such governments with ready docility to all serious well-sustained public criticism they will have approved themselves worthy to be ranked among the highest and most fruitful of the great departments of political study that they will issue in such suggestions i confidently hope
End of The Study of Administration by Woodrow Wilson Who Thinks Abstractly by Georg Hegel, 1770-1831 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Who Thinks Abstractly from Hegel's Miscellaneous Writings Thinks? abstractly sauf que pu save himself who can i hear a traitor exclaim who bribed by the enemy would decry this essay as one that treats of metaphysics for metaphysics and abstract and i had almost said to think are words from which as from one infected with the plague every man is more or less disposed to run away i do not however intend here anything so atrocious as an explanation of what is meant by thinking and by abstract i am frightened enough myself when any one begins to explain for at a pinch i understand everything myself besides every explanation of the words to think and abstract would be quite superfluous for it is even because the polite world knows so well what is meant by abstract that it shuns the abstract as no one craves what he does not know so no one can hate what he does not know neither is it intended by cunning stratagem to attempt to reconcile the polite world to the abstract as if e g under the cover of a light conversation thinking and the abstract should be tricked out until at last without being recognized and without awakening any abhorrence they had crept into good company and even been imperceptibly drawn in by said company or as they say in swabia giesenselt in and when the author of the plot should come forward and uncover this otherwise strange guest the abstract whom the whole company had been acknowledging and treating as a good friend under a different name these scenes of recognition by which it is designed to instruct the world against its will have this unpardonable fault they mortify while they instruct and they discover in the machinist the wish to acquire a little reputation by his arts that mortification and this vanity neutralize the intended effect and dissipate again the instruction purchased at such a price besides the stratagem in this instance if any such had been designed is already defeated inasmuch as its successful execution requires that the word of the enigma should not be pronounced at the outset but that has been done in the present case in the caption if any essay had contemplated a ruse like that which has been described these words think and abstract ought not to have made their appearance in the commencement but like the minister of state in the play they should wear an overcoat through the whole piece and then in the last scene unbutton it and let the star of wisdom beam forth but the unbuttoning of the metaphysical overcoat would not have so good an effect as the unbuttoning of the ministerial it would only reveal a couple of words and the best of the joke was to consist in showing that the company had long been in possession of the thing so they would gain in the end nothing but the name whereas the ministerial star indicates something more real to wit a purse with money in it it is presumed in good company and that is the kind of company we are in now that every one present knows what thinking is what abstract is we have only to inquire who it is that thinks abstractly the design is not as i have already remarked to reconcile the company of these things to expect of them that they should employ themselves with anything difficult to speak of their consciences for heedlessly neglecting what is so worthy and befitting a rational being the object is rather to reconcile the polite world with itself in case it should feel not exactly conscientious scruples on account of said neglect 
but yet inwardly at least a certain respect for abstract thinking as for something exalted and should turn from it not because it is too mean but because it is too high not because it is too common but because it is too distinguished or contrariwise because it seems to be an espes something out of the way something whereby one is not distinguished in general society or by new finery but rather excluded from it or made ridiculous in it as by a poor dress or by a rich one where the setting of the diamonds is old-fashioned or where the embroidery though never so costly has long since come to be chinese who thinks abstractly the uncultivated man not the cultivated people who belong to good society do not think abstractly because it is too easy because it is too low low not according to outward condition they abstain from it not out of an empty hauteur which affects to look with contempt on what is above its capacity but on account of the intrinsic littleness of the thing the prepossession and respect for abstract thinking is so great that refined noses will begin to scent and anticipate satire or irony here but as my readers are readers of the morganblatt they know that a price is paid for satire and they must suppose that i would rather earn that price and concur to obtain it than give forth my matters in this way without remuneration i need but adduce in defence of my proposition certain examples which as every one will allow imply it we will suppose then a murderer is led to the place of execution to the common people he is nothing more than a murderer ladies perhaps will remark that he is a powerful handsome interesting man but the people before mentioned think that remark shocking what a murderer handsome how can any one be so evil-minded as to think a murderer handsome it is to be feared you are not much better than murderers yourselves this is a corruption of morals which reigns among the higher classes adds perhaps a priest who knows the reason of things and the hearts of men one who understands human nature investigates the course which the education of this murderer has taken he finds in his history in his upbringing bad domestic relations between his father and his mother finds a monstrous severity exercised towards him on the occasion of some light offence a severity which has embittered his feelings in relation to the civil order finds a first reaction against this order which caused his expulsion from it and made it impossible for him henceforward to maintain himself otherwise than by crime there may be some who when they hear this account of the matter will say that man wishes to apologize for this murderer i remember to have heard in my youth a burgomaster complain that writers of books were going too far they were endeavouring to extirpate christianity and justice together that some one had written a defence of suicide dreadful too dreadful on inquiry it appeared that he had in his mind the sorrows of werther this is thinking abstractly to see in a murderer nothing but the abstract fact that he is a murderer and by means of this single quality to expunge all else all that is human in him quite otherwise did a refined sentimental leipzig world they bestrewed and bewreathed the wheel and the criminal who was bound upon it with flower garlands but this again is an abstraction of an opposite kind christians may well practise rosicrucianism or rather crucerosism and wreathe the cross with roses the cross is a long since hallowed gibbet and wheel it has lost its one-sided signification as an instrument of degrading punishment and gives on the contrary the idea of the highest sorrow and the uttermost rejection combined with extreme rapture and divine honour the leipzig cross on the other hand wreathed with violets and roses represents an atonement in the manner of kotzbu a kind of maudlin agreement between sentiment and vice
it was after a very different fashion that i once heard a vulgar old crone a spidal woman slay the abstractor of a murderer and raise him again to honour the severed head was placed upon the scaffold and the sun was shining how beautifully she said god's son of grace illumines binder's head people say to a white against whom they are incensed you are not worthy that the sun should shine upon you that woman saw that the murderer's head was shone upon by the sun and consequently was still worthy of the sun's light she raised him from the punishment of the scaffold into the sun grace of god she did not bring about the atonement with violets and sentimental vanity but she saw him received with grace into a higher sun old woman your eggs are rotten says a female purchaser to the huckster woman what replies the latter my eggs rotten be like you are rotten yourself do you say that of my eggs you didn't the lice eat up your father on the public road didn't your mother run off with the french didn't your grandmother die in the spittle go get you a whole smock to go with your gauze neckerchief everybody knows where that neckerchief and where all your caps come from if there were no officers many a girl would not be so pricked up nowadays and if mistresses would look more to their housekeeping there's many a one who would sit in the stocks go patch the holes in your stockings in short she does not leave her a whole thread she thinks abstractly and concludes her together with neckerchief caps smock etc with fingers and other parts also with her father and all her relations under the single crime of having charged her the huckster with rotten eggs everything about her is coloured through and through with these rotten eggs whereas on the contrary those officers of whom the huckster spoke if what is very doubtful there is anything in the story must have seen something very different to come from the maid to servants a servant fares nowhere so badly as with men of inferior rank and small income the higher the rank of the master the better the condition of the servant here again the common man thinks more abstractly he is haughty towards his servant relates to him as a servant only to this one predicate he holds fast a servant fares best with frenchmen a man of rank is familiar with his servant the frenchman is hail fellow well met with him when they are alone the servant leads the conversation see diderot jacques sumatre the master does nothing but take snuff and look at his watch and for the rest lets the servant have his way the man of rank knows that the servant is not merely a servant that he is acquainted with the news of the city knows the girls and has good projects in his head he asks him about these things and the servant may say what he knows on the subjects on which the master questions him with a french master the servant may not only do this but may also bring his own matter on the tapis and have and maintain his own opinion and if the master wants anything he is not to command but he must first reason his own opinion into the servant and then give him a good word in order that his own opinion may retain the ascendancy in military life the same distinction is found in austria the soldier can be flogged consequently he is a vile fellow for one who has a passive right to be flogged is a vile fellow and so the common soldier passes with the officer for this abstraction a floggable subject one with whom a gentleman who has a uniform and poor dépe must have intercourse and that is to give oneself to the devil end of who thinks abstractly by george hegel seventeen seventy seven to eighteen thirty one